Livestream der Nürburgring Langstreckenserie. Präsentiert von Falkenreifen. Herzlich willkommen zur Nürburgring Langstreckenserie. Welcome to the Nürburgring for the NLF Nürburgring Langstrecken Serie. Und jetzt ist das Rennen freigegeben. The red lights are out now. Viele, viele Zuschauer unterwegs. I would think that's very, very close. Jetzt kommt er, jetzt kommt er ran, zieht sich ran. Kicking the new season of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series off in style with not one but two four hour races across this weekend. Thoroughly enjoyed yesterday's ACAS Cup and it's followed up on Sunday with the 63rd edition of the ADAC Rhinoldus Langstrecken Rennen right here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. Beautiful weather conditions yesterday. Uh, today, it is slightly more, there's much more cloud cover and a little chillier as well. Will there therefore be a bit of localized rain around this massive 25 kilometer race circuit? We will find out. Qualifying's happened already this morning, so we have the grid set. The fans fit to bursting in the pit lane, and then we'll be heading towards the grid in a moment or two as well. And you're getting the full Radio Show Limited service once more. Johnny Palmer, Bruce Jones, and a little bit of Lucas Gajewski for added measure in the pit lane with the some of the English language interviews that we get fed as well. So lots to look forward to. One or two changes in the entry list from yesterday as well. But uh, we're certainly not complaining. Uh, again, an entry list north of 100 cars, Bruce Jones. You can always get a bit, a bit flippant with the Nürburgring Langstrecken series because the numbers are always huge. But 25 kilometers, you can fit a lot of cars in. And uh, in peak season, we will have north of 150. We got north of 100 today. We had 114 start yesterday. Uh, the only difference is uh, Saturday has become Sunday. And as you pointed out, Johnny, the weather's become a little more spring like, but in a sort of less predictable spring like way. Yesterday was just phenomenal. Blue skies, the circuit looked exquisite. The leaves just starting to bud up on the trees and come out. Today, though, it's dry. It is a little bit grey, yes. but I think at the start of the season, if you told the teams, would you like to drive for our races, they'd say, yes, please, we can settle in. Next weekend, we've got the qualifying races for this summer's ADAC, Nürburgring 24 hours. If that can stay dry as well, just think how much more constructive it is. But would it be misleading? Not going in with wet weather practice ahead of the 24 hours uh, later this year. You know, maybe they need all of the weather conditions, but we, as lazy commentators, just simply want to dry race today. But a bit of rain doesn't hurt. It does add a little twist. It, it adds it. I think if it's not raining, let's say, on the Grand Prix circuit, but it is further out in the country, um, because then there, there is a decision to be made. And if it's only, say, two or three kilometres affected by wet weather, you're just going to have to grin and bear that section because the rest of it will be quick enough for slick tyres and that is the beauty of this place that's why so many different car manufacturers keep coming back to the Nürburgring Nordschleife because it is the ultimate test, you've got every single corner imaginable, you've got the elevation change, you've got the fact that we go from town to village to town to village and back again and that long long straight at the end as well so you know you're, you're testing engine power but also the aerodynamics of your car both in free air and behind a competitor where you get just a little bit of extra kilometer per hour, which can be so crucial coming, coming towards the end of a lap, of a stint, and indeed the race. So the scene is set, one or two cars being uh, heading out onto the grid right now. But earlier this morning, quite a lot happening. The VW Golf did not have good luck from Max Cruiser Racing yesterday with two separate punctures and now a fire this morning that needed to be extinguished fairly close to home. Punctures were the order of the day yesterday and we've had a fair share of those already. And tyre temperature might well be an issue. It certainly was heading into turn one yesterday for at least two of the three separate starting groups. Can you retain that tyre temperature with cooler conditions today? Excellent to have the Glickenhaus SCG 004 
back with us, although that's also been receiving work this morning in the garage. And the slightly older Lamborghini Huracan of Conrad Motorsport always tends to qualify well. It's again in the top 10, but the 786, another Huracan, stopped out on the track during qualifying. The number three car, a rapid machine yesterday for Alessio Picariello and Martin Raginger. They're back for a second day and have qualified sixth. The 27 Red Bull uh, Lamborghini will start fifth just behind the Manti Kuss sponsored 911 uh, EMA Porsche. The sister Falcon car for Joel Eriksson, Tim Heinemann and Nico Menzel named interestingly against the number four car. We'll see whether there are three drivers in that later. The number 14 car fastest though, at least on my sheet. I hope we're not going to see the six car next. So it is going to be a 1-2 for HRT and the 14 all yellow car for Daniel Junkadea and Frank Bird will start from pole position alongside the sister car from the Pro-Am category. Hubert had a bit naughty during the start yesterday and pinged for a significant jump start. Had to take a drive-through penalty. 756.2 versus a 756.2. So that's very tight. And then the all-Porsche fourth row with Falcon and Manti represented there. And a nice mixture on row three of the Red Bull livery Lamborghini Huracan from Team Apt and the second Falcon car. Then it's Lamborghini, Glickenhaus in the top 10 as well. The second, the third of the Lamborghinis is there too. And then the Porsche from Avia WNS Motorsport, uh, which won't necessarily start 10th, but it has qualified there as the best Cup 2 machine. Now, one thing that the eagle-eyed will have spotted is the fact that uh, yesterday, the two out racing team uh, Mercedes were black uh, with red of the Yokohama. But today, to make it easier, in fact, maybe the stewards have insisted on this. <laughs> Hubert Hout's car, car number uh, 14, sorry, that's a Junkadea bird car, is now in a yellow livery to make it stand out. So it's a different car from yesterday. Again, it's starting on the very front row of the grid. It started on pole yesterday, did get jumped by its own teammate and a group of others, but uh, today makes it easier for us. And don't forget, over the years, the Hout Racing team have often run one in Ravenol colours, uh, yellow and blue. So that makes it a little easier on that look down to the first corner. And certainly yesterday, Hubert's uh, jump from about, I think it was sixth or seventh on the grid into the lead, had just convinced the pole starting car had got down there, but it was four abreast down into the first corner. But today, as yesterday, Hout's car is black with the red flashes, the Yokohama livery. It's working its way to the grid today. And uh, we'll tell you just exactly how many cars are going to take the start. There are 107 on the entry list. You normally lose a couple. Let's hope that number 10 uh, bioconcept uh, class golf will get going. Mm. Uh, that's had its problems, but we may lose a couple more. But it's all set. It's fun down on the grid. Lucas Gajewski is uh, being mocked, uh, flocked, not mocked. I hope they're not mocking him, uh, by uh, characters dressed as cartoon figures here. I, I think Johnny, I don't know which cartoon they're from. It's a, a bear and uh, another bear, I think. And uh, Lucas in the middle. Is it Paw Patrol? Oh, it could be. I think it is, yeah. Paul, I didn't recognise the character I wrote to Lucas's right, our left, but uh, Paw Patrol definitely with the, the cap. I've never watched an episode, but it looks very entertaining. If they can get Lucas Gajewski as a guest character one week, I definitely would tune in. Um, can we touch on the, the horrendous accident that happened yesterday? We were obviously, uh, you know, not unsure about how much information we could actually disclose. We didn't have a great deal, in fairness, but we were shown, and I'm not sure you were shown at home, uh, the images of the Hyundai Elantra, the wrong side of the safety barrier. So it had left the track, and this is at uh, Tiergarten, obviously collided with the tyres with such force that it had flipped the car over the the debris fencing and to the concreted area outside. Robert Wickens, the driver, and uh, thankfully there were a number of tweets fairly late on yesterday suggesting that he was okay. He was conscious, he was responsive, but he had gone to a, a local hospital for checks and yeah, airlifted, in fact. Yeah, taking to, to Cobb Lentz, he, he put up a message this morning, which I found, and now it's disappeared again. I'll have to find it all over again on Twitter, basically saying, I'm fine, they're keeping me under observation, but, you know... Like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I will be back. Yes. And it was a safety precaution to keep him overnight for observation reasons and whatnot. But I, I have to say, I thought that the prognosis was going to be slightly worse than that. And maybe an extended stay in hospital. But uh, it was obviously in the best possible hands. You found the message yeah, directly from uh, Robert. This now. is from Robert Wickens on his Twitter feed, or X for the younger viewers. Appreciate everyone's messages today. So that was last night. Thank you to the medical team at the track and here at the hospital for their care. I'm feeling good. We'll get some rest here under their supervision this weekend. I'm eager to get back to the track and get back to work with BHA, which is Brian Herter Autosport. We're very excited to have Rob over here thinking, um, you know, he's raced here in the past.
past about five years in the DTM and clearly with a, a view to having a crack probably mm. next year at the Nürburgring 25s. They still can't work out why the Hyundai Elantra went over the tyre wall there. It must have gone in fairly side on, I would suggest, to take the roll to go over the top. But just yes. to explain, it's at the final corner, you've come up the rise, you're going through tear garden, you snap, go right, and then it's left onto the start, finish straight. And in fact, this where a couple of cars had an accident, a couple of the, t the cu two challengers on the final lap of the race. But uh, it was that moment where you see a shot, and you think, I can't work out where that car is, because it had uh, gone up over the safety fencing and gone down the bank beyond and come to rest, fortunately, sort of four square on the ground, albeit on, on a slope. But obviously, uh, for the majority of the rest of the race, that, that corner was uh, neutralised under, under double yellows. And only, only for about the final lap or so was it, was it clear for the, the drivers to proceed again. So Robert uh, was, at that point, moving on out to uh, Cobb Lentz. But good to have that uh, posting from him. And we'll keep you updated if any others uh, come up through the morning. But I'm sure he'll be feeling a little bit ropey yes. after, after that uh, incident yesterday. Because, uh, you know, when you get the sort of secondary, well, secondary shockwaves, the bruising starting to set in from uh, that degree of uh, going over and coming down hard. But uh, good to have that news, um, Rob, this morning. You can't help but think that there's going to be some unfinished business, though, in Robert's mind, oh. and indeed Mark Wilkins. So, so uh, wanting to come back uh, as soon as possible, but clearly, you know, needs to recover for sufficient time. Plenty of support on X from all sorts of fellow drivers, including Scotty McLaughlin. I spotted a, a post from him wishing him well, and a number of people from the IMSA paddock, because he's a champion in the... Uh, the um, Mission Challenge, challenge. Well, the Mission yeah. Pilot Challenge, indeed. He's had yeah. a remarkable handful of years in that, hasn't he? Second, third, mm. first. You know, it's it's been very, very strong. And, and also, as I said during yesterday's broadcast, he's just such a personal person as well. Add to the which, you know, the incredible story of after his uh, neck injury to come back to get the fitness to go racing, build up that core fitness, get your limb limbs to work, and, and using using all treadmills. I mean, he he absolutely as soon as he possibly could, he started putting up pictures in the gym, and you could almost feel this sort of odyssey. Of pain but the determination just came roaring through and uh, that's the mark of the man he's done a fair bit of racing with mark wilkins as well mark's done considerable amounts of racing in particularly in the states in imsa series um, but again a long-term runner in the imsa michelin pilot challenge so uh, i'm sure they'll be back and uh, i'm sure mark wilkins will have a, a good race season this year and it's a question of uh, you know w will this incident actually delay uh, Rob, or will he be quickly back in the cockpit? Yeah, you can't tell. We can't. We can't predict that. So no, and uh, want to. probably not in a position uh, himself to do that just yet either. But uh, recovery, the first job on the list, and then see what uh, opportunity he may have in the future to come back. But uh, I'm sure he was thoroughly enjoying his time behind the, the wheel of that Hyundai before yesterday's incident. Um, we talk about the refreshed grid in a moment or two and what went on in qualifying. It is an all Mercedes front row. The one car we don't have compared to yesterday yesterday is the share of sport phx audi which will be a big miss because that was a very quick car and seemed to be the main one to be able to trouble the porsches yesterday well it, it really was i mean it, it, we, we had lamborghinis up at the front but largely it became three porsches that's the two falcon motorsport porsches and the grello porsche from Man Manta emr ema uh and yet, didn't matter who was on board. Was it Marcus Finkelhock? Was it Frank Stippler? They were there harrying, chasing a few bits of rubbing here and there. Certainly some contact and side by side. A couple of blows against the side of the number three Falker Motorsport uh, Porsche. Now, in these Nürburgring Langstrecken and Siri races, you can choose your tactics according to your ambition and uh, or just the way you want to split it. But we had the Manti Porsche and the number three Falcon Porsche did their first pit stop a lap after their rivals. I thought that gave them an advantage at the second time of asking. The Manti car came in a lap earlier than expected because they were trying to get the jump uh, or to get past the Audi. The yeah. Shira Sport Audi was in their path. That then lost them the advantage, and then it all looked as though they had fallen into the lap of uh, the number three uh, Porsche crew, Alessio uh, Picariello and uh, Martin Ragginger. And then on the final lap, it stopped. I wonder whether you can dial into this interview with Ralph Aron, because being Estonian... Well, respect for the yeah, we, in English. we have to run the two cars as, as separate entities, and this is what we're doing. So there is a Team Yokohama and Team Michelin. So I know the same team, but in the end, we run two separate programs. Right, thank you very much. Best of luck for the race. Thank you. As it's So the, I think the, the end of that was suggesting that, yes, they occupy the front row, and they were in very similar livery yesterday, but that's changed, and they are completely separate. 
separate program. So we'll see them racing each other by the sounds of things. It's the same driver lineup so in the yellow Mercedes that we didn't have yesterday, uh, Daniel Junkadea and Frank Bird. And clearly that's a very fast car on single lap pace. Can they sustain that through four separate stints is the big question. And then the Hubert Hauk, Dennis Fetzer, and the guy we've just heard from from Estonia, Ralph Aron, will be starting the number six car on Yokohama's. Now, I don't know with the livery change whether the other Mercedes has switched tyre manufacturer. It has. Hubert it has. has a very clever boy. The other car will be running on Michelin. So yesterday they had both of their cars on Yokohama Advan uh, racing tyres. And today, well, they've made it easier for us. They've uh, put another one out there, brought the car yellow and blue. It's on pole for the second race running. Hopefully today they can get down in the lead. But uh, one of the glories of the NLS, Johnny, is the fact that you have these tyre wars going on. And uh, not just between the manufacturers, but uh, right the way down the grid. And it just adds something. Four hours of racing is the standard NLS race length. And we were looking yesterday. We reckon the Falcon Motorsport car seemed a bit sweeter on their tyres towards the end of a stint. But all it takes is a, a few degrees shift in temperature. And, you know, your tyre behaviour is going to be entirely different. So we'll have to see how today unfolds. But certainly it gave life to the, the entirety of a stint. And the way yeah. you suddenly think, has someone just been delayed? No, no, their tyres are just coming good. As the fuel load goes down, they've got the right rubber for the right day. The access that the fans get here at the Nürburgring always astounds me. Kevin Estra is standing about half a metre from his car and he's absolutely surrounded by fans, but he's happy to sign whatever's being thrust towards him. Caps, programmes, uh, T-shirts, and that's how Grello and other cars on the grid have built such a following, though. I mean, particularly Grello, which, you know, has become a marketable uh, part of, of Manti's initiative. And, uh, you know, there are kids of sort of seven, eight, nine years old with all the merchandise on. Yeah, and we, we as a public service broadcast, we better point out what we did yesterday. The, the petrol station on the, just outside the circuit is the most fantastic book and model shop. And within the circuit confines in the main hall on the outside of the circuit on the start-finish line, again, and stalls selling books and models. And Manti are very, very clever. Each year, their Grello livery is slightly different. Okay. Oh, we've got the 2018 model and the 2020. So, you know, it's good, it's bright, it stands out. And you know what also stands out in terms of performance? And the number 911, Lawrence Van Tour and Kevin Estra, you know, they're always going to be up at the front, unless, just unless the tyres they're on that day are not the ones that really seem to suit the weather conditions. But the history of uh, Olaf Manti's team, he's now sort of handed it over, is phenomenal on the Nordschleife. And actually, they posted their best lap fairly late on in the qualifying session because well, the pole time was taken on the 10th lap and Manti did likewise. So it took them 10 goes at it before they found the 758.696. And earlier on in the session for the Falcon Motorsport car of Joel Eriksson, Tim Heinemann, rather, and uh, Nico Menzel. Not sure whether it was Nico or Joel who did the time because you scribbled that down. Um, of course, Tim Heinemann, by the look oh, of things. Oh, do we think? Okay. Well, he, but I think the trouble is that whoever was in the car last. At the end, so yeah. I was going to say, because if they've if they've cycled through various drivers, then you can easily note down who was in there at the end of the session. But uh, the time may well have been set a little earlier on. We, we often comment that uh, qualifying is only vaguely important. As long as you're in the first few rows for an NLS round, you should be there or thereabouts. Of course, if you're on the front row, you're more likely to have a chance of getting clear at the front. But uh, it, it's worth noting yesterday's qualifying was not close at all. It's two and a half seconds between the number 14 HRT Mercedes and the best of the rest. Today, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six cars within three seconds, so much closer. Six cars believed, you know, that magical mark, eight minutes. It was yeah. like when Formula One raced here for the last time in 1976, the, the event that Nicky Lauda had his fiery crash getting around in seven minutes was a magic mark. The equivalent of running a four-minute mile and uh, in athletics and so on and so forth. But I think, you know, anyone who does a lap under eight minutes, yeah, full marks. And the yeah. fact we had six today, lots of full marks. Indeed. And y you very rarely get uh, anywhere close to that. Of course, during the Nürburgring 24-hour race, because there's a, an extended circuit, uh, the Haug hook actually takes a little bit out of the Grand Prix circuit. That You don't do the full Mercedes arena during the qualifying weekend next week, for instance, and the main race at the end of May this year and the first weekend of June. But there's a much longer run down towards the Goodyear Care, as it's called these days. It used to be the Dunlop Curve at the very bottom of the hill, or the hairpin rather, and um, yeah, so 
there's more scope to be able to get underneath that eight minute marker but uh, some some drivers will desperately try and get close to it uh, even when we're racing for the 24 hours of the Nürburgring more hope of doing that during the two shot showdown for the qualifying on the Friday night which is terrific entertainment during that weekend of course we will have both the qualifying weekend and the N24 covered right here on the radio show limited network of channels it promises to be a very busy sequence of three weekends in fact because you've got the 1st and 2nd of June, which is N24 race weekend, followed by the 9th, the following Sunday, being Le Mans Test Day. And we'll have all of that covered, two lots of three-hour sessions in the lead-up to the 101st anniversary race of the 24 hours of Le Mans over the 15th and 16th of June but of course build up for that all the opening days will be the 12th the 13th and the 14th of June into the main weekend itself so yeah end of May start of June going to be incredibly busy right here on the RSL network um, we had a crazy scrap for Cup 2 yesterday, which went right down to the final lap, right down to the final corner, and unfortunately, contact between David Yarn and I'm trying, Nico, Otto. Nico Otto. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Nico Otto. I remember, I remember them the other way around. I remembered Otto's name yesterday and completely well, forgot David Yarn. Yeah. However, there was a penalty that we should say, but let's describe the incident first, Bruce. Right, what happened? We had David Yarn making the classic Nürburgring move uh, along the dotting her, get the slipstream, get the slipstream, moved in front. Looked as though the job was done. Going up the slope into Tiergarten, had it all covered, but unfortunately, Nico Otto got a little bit uh, hot under the collar and attacked effectively across the grass. Thibaut did, spun him round, put him into the tyre wall on the outside, got himself going, continued, took victory, um, and then eventually David Young got going and he crossed the line in third place, but he was about 27 seconds, I think, down. Uh, after that, and the whole order changed because then a 30-second penalty applied to Snicker Otto. And, you know, frankly, he'd have to put his hands up and go, yeah, I got him, you've got me. Fair enough. That dropped him back down to third. Uh, so suddenly a car that was just running third, minding his own business, came through to take uh, victory in the class. But uh, certainly I expect further battles through the course of the season, season between the number number 120, Avia w &S motorsport car of Daniel Blickle, Tim Shearbart, who led early on, and David Yarn. They were very strong yesterday, but uh, I think Nico Otto and Benjamin Leuchter for number 100, the Max Cruz racing car, this is a battle I think will go on all season. It's up to the others to see if they can get close, but everyone loves a scrap, and Cup 2 never disappoints. The fact it kept its uh, powder fairly dry until uh, 3 hours and 59 minutes into the race was quite surprising, but it did, you know, it bubbled to the top and just unfortunately bubbled over. Yeah, uh, so it's a real shame to see the car or the battle there, which was race long, ended like that, but you can also, I mean, once an overtake is initiated down the Dottinger Hill, you can sort of understand the need to fight back as quickly as possible. But sometimes you have to realise the game was up on that occasion. The Arvia car will be started by Tim Shearbart, who Lucas has just had a quick word with. Uh, these are very swift uh, Carrera Cup based machines, but a lot of the time quicker down the Dottinger Hill than the SP9 cars because they don't carry as much aero on them, so they're not as quick through the bends, but they're phenomenally rapid down the straight. So that promises to be much to be really interesting as well. Now, the Glickenhaus, during qualifying this morning, uh, obviously had to sit out quite a bit of the session with lots of work taking part on it. Um, Combe Ladegar has been confirmed for the N24 race, and that is a strong lineup that we have today. So uh, all three drivers that are racing today will be part of the N24, is my understanding. So that's Thomas Much, Frank Meyer, and Lance David Arnold, and joined by Combe Ladegar once we get to June. Yeah, and the good thing is between yesterday and today, you could see, despite uh, the, the um, SCG 004 being in the garage to some of that uh, qualifying session, just one wind it back. Remember I said I don't think qualifying is that important, mm. but they're finding pace over yesterday, so that's all you can ask. They're not running in the top class, they're running in <laughs> SPX yes. rather than SP9, but uh, through the course of yesterday's race, you could just find them getting pace. And Lance David Arnold is the sort of latest addition to the team, and he's a driver with considerable experience uh, and success at the Nürburgring. So I think he's bringing something to the package, and certainly whenever seeing him in, being interviewed, he's looking very happy with life indeed. So it's good. He's back.
The other thing that we touched on yesterday, but if you're just joining us for Sunday, then a significant stretch of the racetrack has been resurfaced over the winter period, and that's down into the foxhole. So coming out of the right-hander at Arenberg, the asphalt very dark indeed, showing how new it is and therefore how grippy it can be, and presumably quite a lot of the bumps that always used to be there. Um, you know, it, it, it's a plunge down into the unknown. Darkness often, especially on a day with a bit of cloud cover like today because the trees are so close to the edge of the, of the road, but also it became very, very bumpy. That should have smoothed everything out. And it, the entrance now into Adenauer Force looks quicker than ever. It really does. And the, the big query, we, we something we're looking forward to, and it will come at some point this season, is what's the new time out like in the rain? Will it mm. be the same equivalent grip to the, the tarmac that precedes it, the tarmac that follows it. So, you know, it, it's peculiar. Drivers have this sort of sixth, possibly seven cents if they're really busy, um, for about changes of grip. Well, the good ones do. It's something you, you find. And they, they'll be the ones that will report back. But so far, yesterday morning, it was quite cool and slightly greasy. But that, that it, it was such a beautiful morning. That soon uh, dried up. And before the start of the race, it was, it was bone dry. But they will have noticed the difference between then and going through the course of the race, it was a, you know, it was a lovely, lovely spring day. And I must say, in the half hour since uh, the cameras have started looking down on the track, it's got much, much brighter. Looks like we're set again for another lovely day at the Nurburgring. Slightly concerned by the cloud this morning, only that it doesn't make the pictures as pretty. But now it's looking picture postcard perfect. Three different start groups, remember. One, two, three, or if you prefer, red, yellow and green. And they're started two minutes apart. So, And that is to ensure that each chunk... Of, of the grid can see the lights going out. And once you wriggle your way free of Hohenrein, you should have a, a relatively free gaze at the gantry above, although Hubert Hout would argue that he didn't quite see when the lights were going out. Maybe you just anticipated that. Uh, and obviously, regardless of which start group you're in, with the one minute board now being shown, uh, the starts can be looked back on by the race direction crew with potential penalties incoming because there was uh, a TCR car that got pinged for a jump start, the 801, I think that was Audi. Yeah, just to explain, the drivers, when they come out of that final corner, that very tight right-left combination, they get onto the start finish straight, they start accelerating, but they're waiting for the lights to go from red to green on the gantry. And yesterday's pole start, ironically, in the sister car to uh, Hubert Hout, was uh, Frank Bird. And he suddenly just backed off a little bit because the lights were still red. And then the rows behind that hadn't quite anticipated, so they backed off. Certainly the person who got caught out was Jordan Pepper, tucked in behind in the abs Lamborghini. At that point, the momentum was with rows two and three, and through came the team chief himself, Hubert House. And afterwards, you know, all he could do was grin, go, yeah, unfortunate, got caught out, but I'm competitive. So yes. I'm trying to find an advantage. Nothing wrong with that. He just was the wrong side of the equation. Yeah, almost if you... I mean, the instruction in the driver's briefing is that as soon as the pace car peels off to the right, then who's ever on pole should dictate the pace. But the problem is that there can be a speed and then the, the pole man can start to go and then realise, oh, hang on a minute, we haven't quite had the signal that the race will start. And then those on row four and five don't have the time to react. It's like a motorway accident, isn't it? You know, the ones immediately behind, they can slow down sufficiently, but the others uh, that are unsighted just don't have a chance. And I, a lot of race drivers have said to me over the years, if you realise you've jumped the start, just go for it, because there's no point then hanging back. You know, you're going to get a penalty anyway, so why not take as much of an advantage as possible? No, and I tell you what, if people are going to jump the start, they do it. For, if you're further back on the order, you know the front few rows being looked at, and you made the mistake and you're starting on row eight, you definitely go for it. You, yeah. you may get away with it. No, not so much now, but 20, 30 years ago, you may get away with it. But it's, yes. it's a good long run down to the first corner, of course. At the Nürburgring, the turn one is a lovely, lovely broad corner. That's why we had four, nearly five abreast in the SP9 front running class yesterday. There is space, but of course, it then doubles back through about 140 degrees turning to the right. Also, until you go there for the first time and walk down into the first corner, yes, down, it really does drop. So you get the sort of cupping yesterday. Yeah. But as you pointed out, in two of the three start groups, tyres, they weren't vicious spins. It was just, oh, the tail is now coming round. And, but there's space to do that. Nobody ended up in the gravel, which is good. But uh, 
again and again and again watching endurance races, sometimes you think, that was just the first corner. What were you thinking? But hey, you know, when you're in there, there's a chance to get a couple of positions. And when you're competing on the Nordschleife, you know your best opportunity for the entire lap is the little part of the Grand Prix loop that starts the lap. Once you get onto the Nordschleife, overtaking maneuvers are rather harder to come by. The track's narrower, the barriers are closer, the tire walls are closer, the trees are closer. Um, but certainly, your best chance is down into the first corner, but it's a four hour race, or but it's a longer race. Now, we had some very interesting faces in interesting places yesterday. Jack Aitken, yes, he, Cadillac uh, World Endurance Championship, an IMSA racer, was here yesterday. He's not today, he wasn't driving his normal mount. He was uh, in a little, uh, what was it, uh, a Hyundai, um, I, I just put my I-30N. Away. I-30N. Yes. Well done. We also had, um, you know, um, oh, only the team principal of Toyota Gazoo Racing and That's right. WBC racer, Kamui Kobayashi. He was out in one of a, a pair of uh, GT4 class Toyota Supras. Uh, with, and uh, is today again. And he is today, exactly. He doesn't want to go home. Enjoying himself simply too much. So Kazuto Kotaka are joining him, who is a Super GT star. Now, does Kazuto mainly drive GT300? Yes, he Super has GT. been, but this year he's entered in uh, Super Formula as well. So he's, oh, okay. he, he's, he's Super Formula Light champion in 2022, which is what they renamed the Japanese Formula 3 series. This year and last year, he's been doing Super Formula, so the very top one, sort of yep. the old money, what we'd call effectively Formula 3000, but a little bit more special in some ways, but obviously then Formula 2, GP2, etc., etc. But he, he's rising up the, cha the charts, so he'll definitely, with Tom's backing, Toyota backing, be someone to look for. The sister car, number one, that's 172. 173, Seita Nonaka, who races in the GT World Challenge Asia, and he's also been doing GT300 class of Super GT. And Hibiki Taira sharing the other car. Someone also moving up uh, from Formula Super Lights last year and a bit of GT300. So, but what they do, like a lot of Japanese drivers, they love the Nurburgring 24 hours. They're coming here to get track experience because, you know, outside Japan, what are probably the two most legendary tracks for Japanese motorsport fans, the Nürburgring Nordschleife and Le Mans. Yeah. And they want to crack at both of those. So it's great to have. It adds some spice. And, you know, there have been rounds of the NLS where we have to play count the nationality. We, we don't always have time to do so because, you know, it's prodigious. And you, when you look down the entry list, you know, sometimes you've got 140 cars and there are people you missed. You know, they're right at the end. You've got down to, you know, the cars in the Cup 3 class. That's the Porsche Caymans. And I suddenly noticed we had the South African racer uh, Michael Pitamba in it yesterday, racing with Thierry Vermoulin, who's um, whose father manages uh, Max Verstappen, and Antares Al over from Hong Kong as well. You know, they're just tucked away a little Porsche Cayman at the back of the field. Yeah. Well, what are they doing? A lot of them are getting their experience to step up. We did talk yesterday, and we've got time. It is the formation lap, but it's a very long formation lap, about what drivers need to do to get their ring permit, which is what they, they are required if they're going to compete in the in the 24 hours in And particular. this has changed for 2024. Yes, it's it has. become more simple. Yeah, what it used to, you had to come to several rounds of the NLS and behave accordingly. A bit like the rookie runs at Indianapolis. You've got to build up your speed, prove you can do it. Now you ramp it up a bit more. But this time, effectively, you can do it at one race meeting, which will be next weekend. You can come along and you, because it's two days, it's three sessions over two days in the Nürburgring qualif qualifying uh, weekend for the 24 hours, you can get the track time. They'll be watching and then you can come in. So you can imagine for the international clientele who haven't got time and sometimes they've got clashing events, if they just come for one weekend, it's just much simpler. So very, very sensible. And it, again, it's just reacting to the rising popularity of the 24 hours. And this year it's around, it's around the Intercontinental GT Challenge as well to promote it. Nothing to do with the NLS. This is the Nürburgring Lang Langstrecken series on the Nordschleife. But when it comes to 24 hours, uh, ADAC will be the name on the badge at the front of that, like it is this year. It's the ADAC Nürburgring Langstrecken series to give its full title. Starting with this double header. Yesterday was a cracker. Let's see what today will bring us. The 60, 63rd edition of the ADAC, Ryan Aldous, Langstreck and Renan. All three groups are now working their way around the racetrack, although Startgruppe Dry is only on the Grand Prix strecker right now. So it'll take, a, obviously, a fairly long time to work its way through Hats and back and Flugplatz down through Schwedenkreuz and Arenberg and then the resurfaced session of the Foxhole. And I'm early, probably... <laughs> two-tenths two of the way around the lap in describing some of those corners, 170-odd of them, although there's always an argument as to exactly how many corners there are around this place. The start for 
Uh, the middle group yesterday was rather entertaining, for the neutral at least. For fans of 962, it did not go well. It looked to be an absolutely killer getaway. Now, forget who was the starting driver, either Joshua Bednarski, Lucas Dalgard, or Moritz Oberheim. I don't know whether we ever got to the bottom of that, but... No, we saw Moritz later in the race yeah. when he, he got caught right in front of, I think it was the number three Falker Motorsport Porsche and couldn't get out of the way on the exit of Hatzenbach. But uh, yeah, basically, to paraphrase, led comfortably by two or three car lengths. Job well done. Oh, oh, can't go round the corner. Just too deep into the corner. Was with the tyres cold? Yeah, possibly a little mm. bit. Was it just ambitious? Was he looking in his mirrors going, I can't believe I'm this far clear? Rejoin, but, you know, all that good work in qualifying was but, but the problem was, as the rejoin happened, he then got crashed into, basically, from behind, which knocked him into a spin, and then he lost even more time, and the 962 from pole position rejoined at the very back of the second start group. Okay, so, one of the new season did not start particularly well, no, and this the is not too good. the other car was far good. more damaged. The other car pulled off and was out yes. of the race. They at least continued. Now, number 520 Toyos, Supra, fabulous looking car, Toyo tyres right with uh, ring racing, Miles Attack, Manfred Ross, Matthias Ross, going nowhere. It's sitting just on the exit of the Vidal chicane, just trying to see if the lights are on. Actually, because it's so sunny, it's quite hard to see if they're flickering on and off. I, th I sense they are, but the car is going nowhere. Oh, how galling. Oh, it is moving now. Going now. Now, is it going to need to return the back way into the pits, which will be coming out very shortly, or are they confident that uh, that big fat hand just hit that big fat switch and turned it off? Can't quite tell. Well, now unsure as to whether it should allow the medical car by or not, and oh. has stopped again. Now, is that because of the mechanical gremlins creeping back in? I wondered if he wanted to get across to the opposite side of the track to go in the rear entrance of the pits where you could come and then you just have to start after the entirety of the field had got away on their three rolling starts, the three different groups. But it's going again. It's going. Let's, let's hope this lap doesn't go. He's going again. He's not. Well, he's turning left into the first part of the Sabine Schmitz curve, so... Hopefully, you just want an answer. You don't go, want it to go, it's going again, but we don't know why. And they also, the question is now, how many places will he be able to make up? Uh, I, I suspect not, as per the regulations, because it has dropped right to the back of the field. So that is where it may have to stay. No, I just want to pick up on something. I'm sorry. Nurburgring no, 24 hours, brilliant event, but the best thing is the fact you can practice for it in advance with the Nurburgring no, Langstrecken series. But not everybody gets things right. Just another penalty I wanted to pick up on. Car number 100, the car we were talking about that was uh, duking it out for the lead in Cup 2 with Nico Otto and Benjamin Leuchter. Nico was the one that picked up the 30 second penalty that dropped them. And this morning, in the interest of fairness, it's Benjamin, his teammate, Benjamin Leuchter, who has been pinged and got double yellows, uh, ignored double yellows and um, has been punished accordingly, disrespecting double yellow flags, therefore speeding in a code 120 area, gets 90 seconds in time race penalty. And disqualification, it says here, so I thought you'd get one or the other, but we'll, I'll try and work that one out for you. Yeah. Well, some messages we are being fed from race control on one of our timing screens. Well, disqualification dot 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 is the post. I don't know whether that leads into a next, whether it goes into a next message, but uh, it may be a, dis a suspended disqualification, perhaps. We'll find out. But there might be a slight emptying of the wallet in the quarter of five, but. By my reading at the moment, it's 90 second in race time penalty. So, what's not clear is that 90 seconds penalty time is being added, or do they come in and serve 90 seconds? I presume the latter. There is a penalty box in pit road, so you could do it at the same time as a pit stop and therefore take your 90 seconds uh, before then heading down to your team area. And remember, there are so many teams and cars in this race that garages are being shared. Um, sometimes in the past at the N24 event, there have been as many as seven different cars and teams operating from the same garage. You can barely squeeze seven cars in there. Uh, it's become slightly easier into, uh, when you're into the race itself, I suppose. There's more space to work around the garages.
Fans. Besucht unsere Social-Media-Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. This is the typical NLS configuration of the racetrack and with two Mercedes on the front row, but a new paint scheme, a new wrap to get our minds around for the number 14 Mercedes. We have a, a yellow and blue Ravenel sponsored car for Daniel Junkader and Frank Bird. I would assume Frank's again doing the opening stint as he did yesterday, starting alongside the more familiar from yesterday, Yokohama Advan. Uh, sponsored car again though from the HRT awning and the number six car for Hubert Haupt, Dennis Fetzer uh, and Ralph Aron and Hubert Haupt did the starting stint yesterday but uh, the first one of the first duties he had to carry out was a drive through penalty so he'll be rather cautious I would imagine at the restart or at the start of the race I should say today one uh, car that looked to be doing incredibly well yesterday and it's amazing how quickly what looked like a good run can spiral out of your control is the number three Falcon Motorsports car of Alessia Picariello, who did three of the four stints and Martin Raginger. They had a slow puncture, which kicked the bad luck off. And then there was also some contact actually prior to the puncture, did one cause the other maybe, that seemed to be being looked at for the best part of an hour. And then finally a decision was made and it was a drive through penalty right after them having to come in for that extra pit stop. You know, it's not often in an NLS race that you get someone who, who's just got an advantage. That, that it worked for them. They, as I said, they took longer early stints than their rivals, and therefore they begin to lose a bit of ground, but they'd gain it by having a shorter final pit stop, man yeah. as mandated by how close to the end of the four hours you make that final pit stop. They'd done the hard yards. Manti could have stayed on the same tactic. They blinked to try and get past the Phoenix Alley. So they were the only people who were going to pit really late in the race in the top class. And then, and then that moment we look at the screen and go. Is that car going? No, it isn't, is it? It's not going at full speed. And uh, so, Renesio Picariello already had the problem with the drive-through, had to cop that on the chin, but they were still heading for third place. They came out in fourth, moved up to third, and then didn't make it home. But in terms of when the car was on the track with the tactics that they used for Falcon Motorsport, that was, a, that was a win in the bag. And, you know, it was so late in the race that it all started to unravel. So can they do it again? Weather conditions actually right now look very similar to yesterday. Yes. An hour ago, they, they did not. It was certainly much grayer. But the car's now running along the dotting her, obviously weaving around, trying to get the heat in their tyres. Sunshine glinting off their windscreen. So a fabulous, in fact, off the rear flanks of the car. Uh, but a fabulous, fabulous morning. We have been very, very lucky indeed in the way we can kick off this year's ADAC Nürburgring Langstrecker Series. Let's see how good the racing will be, though. That's the question. You may be wondering uh, where all of these bright yellow, highlighted yellow cars have come from. Well, as I say, there's been a livery change for the number 14 Mercedes of Danny Junkadea and Frank Burr. That's now in Ravenol colours. Manti, we know all about. They ran like that yesterday. The other car that uh, didn't wasn't able to stay in the top eight as it is going to start today is the Lamborghini Huracan Evo 2 of Renazzo Motorsport team and that's Sagnana, Christoph Breuer and Dieter Schmidtmann with a terrific qualifying uh, this morning. 7.86 then starting on seventh place alongside the Glickenhaus car number 706 in eighth. Question is how long can they stay there? Yeah, I'm, yesterday Kiki Sagnana had a, a little bit of rotation, was losing a bit of ground. Dieter Schmidt should go well, Christoph Borges should go very well indeed. But yeah, how can they go? But uh, it's, it's a crew, and Kiki, coming over from Thailand, really enjoys racing in Germany. He actually did his first Nürburgring 24 hours back in 2013. But, you know, stepping up to an Evo 2 Lamborghini, you know, it's a big, big ask. But right now the car's getting into their 2x2 two two formation. Yeah, the, the point there, the Renato Motorsport team, new to this top level of the championship, their, car, their Lamborghini is yellow with a basically a black middle so look out for that one it's starting just ahead of the Glickenhaus which is running in uh, what we like to call Nürburgring blue sky blue 
And if you brought a Lamborghini or a can this weekend, it looks like you'll have to be on the right-hand side of the grid, but not quite on the front two rows, because there is the Red Bull liveried machine in fifth place, seventh place for Renato, ninth place for Conrad Motorsport, Danny Sufi, who had no luck whatsoever yesterday, and Torsten Kratz is his co-driver. And we'll keep you up to date, of course, with what's going on in Cup 2. The cars that qualified 10th and 11th overall are the Arvia WNS Motorsport Cup 2 machine and the Black Falcon Team 48 Losh sponsored 148 car. But it's two Mercedes Benz powered by the 6.2 litre V8s in the noses of these cars that are about to head out of Hohenrein back onto the Grand Prix Strecker. And at exactly midday, the, the red lights do turn to green and we're racing for the second day in a row this time for the 63rd edition of the adac ryan alders langstreck and renan and it is a much better start for the two mercedes this time despite porsche's best efforts although one of the falcon cars the number three trying to gain places and will pick off at least one as it heads into the first of the right handers of the mercedes arena and now trying to spread either side of the number six mercedes so falcon run third and fifth just about although here comes the Red Bull at Lamborghini Huracan around the outside to try and snatch fifth place away. The race leader is still the 14 car then, a Frank Bird, we assume. Manti up to second place, and Falcon run third and fifth. Yeah, just not 100% convinced it is, Frank, but it might be teammate Danny Yunkadea waiting for confirmation when they come through. But that was so much cleaner than the first uh, the start yesterday because there wasn't the hesitation as the lead car came onto the start finish straight. And instead of getting that bunching and going four by four down into the first corner, we had them two by two, really, really clean. But Manti EMA just got the job done down the inside and somehow had the traction to accelerate out of the corner and depose one of the two out racing Mercedes. That's uh, car number six, which is back in fourth place now because uh, certainly the Falcon Motorsport Porsches are looking very very handy indeed and one of them is up into that uh, third position neat and tidy through the Vidal chicane nose to tail but now through the Sabine Schmitz curves through the second one they're going out onto the Nordschleifer first three cars I sense tiny little bit of a gap and then fourth place is that is the uh, second of the Hout Racing Team Mercedes but a beautiful morning for racing on the most stunning of circuits. Yeah, the names have started to populate much earlier than they did on my timing screen than yesterday. And certainly it does say Daniel Juncadea for the 14 Mercedes. Ralph Aron, who was chatting to Lucas on the grid in the number six Mercedes, which has lost places. Briefly, there were yellow flags at the Vidal chicane there. Maybe a quick spin and continue because the greens are clear. Sorry, the greens are out again now as the yellow's withdrawn. And start group two now about to get underway then with at the front of this field, the 962 of Arvia. WNS Motorsport alongside should be the 184 car from uh, sorry the 759 Porsche from Team Zorg Rensport as they now get underway and heading down towards the first corner it is 962 on the inside that's the Bednarski Daugard and Oberheim combination with the 959 that's the Eichenberg and Grosser car but it's very nearly four abreast as they hit the brakes. 962, much better attack into the first corner compared to yesterday, but there is a spin for a VW Golf. Now, that's not the number 10 car. It's the other Golf in the field, which is briefly rotated and looking to rejoin. Car 800, quite possibly, from the TCR category with driver Utch at the wheel. Yes, Max Cruiser, not shown on our timing screen at all. And, of course, that suffered uh, from a what looked like a serious fire in qualifying this morning with a lot of extinguishment surrounding the car in order to temper the flames. And I bet that Max Cruiser haven't been able to fix that in time because the turnaround between qualifying this morning and the race start is very slim indeed. Yesterday, we lost a few cars on, uh, on the opening lap didn't even get to see what happened to them and one of them was the door most sports Aston Martin from the top group car number 69 they're just doubling down the order to try and find if that got going today I fear it has not but if I do find it I will let you know but up front though it's a uh, different tune of course yesterday was uh, we ended up with Porsche 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 with an Audi in the mix as well but today at the moment it's uh, definitely Mercedes much better balance in this field and up at the sharp end obviously with two of them starting in the front row for the out racing team uh, then they have much more of a chance today and as we pointed out qualifying was a whole lot closer with six cars getting under the eight minute mark so more competitive times as they settle into this second round 
neat and tidy for the majority of cars in the, the second gaggle, of course, uh, waiting for the third start to make uh, their run down the start finish straight. They're just coming into view uh, shortly to get there. But uh, meanwhile, Danny Junkerday appears to be uh, leading with the Grello Porsche from Anti EMA, Kevin Estra giving chase. The yellows are coming up and disappearing again because uh, they often get put out and pulled back very, very quickly. But then sometimes they notice a bit of um, fluid and they have to put them out again. So we, we will keep an eye on those. But up the front, no problem at all. But the first two cars escaping and now change of the lead because uh, Kevin Estra has moved past into the leader's race. And uh, behind him, then therefore, is Danny Junkerdea in the yellow and pale blue Mercedes from the Hout Racing Team. And the best of the rest, not quite in shot at the moment. So the first two making a break, Johnny. And now we get the third start coming onto the start finish straight, waiting for them to check their lights go green. Three sets of starts, three groups of cars, and off they go. This looks like a nice, tidy one. So it'll be the V6 uh, Porsche Cayman S, the 981 in the white and purple colours that starts from pole position. But the much better start of the two front row, front row cars is from 461, the BMW M2, which will swoop around the nose of the Porsche Cayman S and take the lead. In behind, the 491 Hyundai i30N and also involved should have been the 520 Toyota Supra. But that's the car that had the drama on the roller lap, you might remember. 520, we think, getting going properly. Well, it certainly ran onto the hats and back, and then we lost sight of it. But uh, let's hope that uh, Ross in that car has managed at least to keep the pace with the third starting group. As I mentioned, wouldn't have been able to retake. Well, having said that, is that a Supra that is roughly in the right position? Let's just have a little look. That is 520, isn't it? Turning right. So maybe it has safely been able to make its way back up to what should have been fourth position in the grid. Yeah, I think your eyes don't deceive you. That looks like the car we're looking for. Neat and tidy at the front, though. But uh, now, actually, having said the first two cars are starting to escape, uh, the two Falcon Motorsport cars, third and fifth, starting to close in. And between them, the car that started on the outside the front row, Ralph Aron, down into fourth place. But we're looking at the top three cars covered by just about two and a half seconds. Uh, top five cars, sorry. So it's certainly very competitive, settling into their form. You know what? The race leader, Kevin Estra, is going... Sorry, uh, Kevin Estra is uh, going, hey, clear track. No one to lap yet, but they will catch them soon because at the moment, as they're two-thirds of the way around the lap, the third group of cars are ju just only now coming out of the Vidal chicane and turning left, left again, and down the hill on the exit of the Sabine Smiths curve. I <laughs> just say that two cars have a little clash side by side, scraping door handles as they run between Sabine Schmitz in and Sabine Schmitz out. Very narrow piece of track, it must be said just there. Yellow flags again on the Grand Prix track at the Yokohama S and uh, now at the Vidal Chicane as well. So uh, possibly, although the first few cars got away well in the third starting group, there has been a coming together for Hyundai number 496. I reckon that is with the... Let's just see whether we've got a 496 to start with, but it's... We have now. We certainly have now, yeah. Erpenbach in the Mertens Motorsport i30N, the fastback version of the i30N, has had a drama uh, even before the race has properly begun. So what are we, six, seven minutes in, but a lot fewer minutes than that for the third starting group. And it looks already to be a retirement for Hyundai, uh, uh, Hyundai uh, 496. Uh, which was running 91st at the time. Back to the race lead, and as Bruce has mentioned, Kevin Estra now is in front of both of the Mercedes. Mercedes running second and fourth, and each of the big Mercs under pressure from their own Falcon Motorsport Porsche. Lovely synchronicity in, in, in so many ways uh, and at the moment. So let's have a look at the, investigate the gaps between first and second. Uh, Danny Juncker, they are giving chase, but as they cross the start-finish line to start their first... Well, they're second racing that. Still waiting for the timing interval to come up. I'd say it's under a second, but certainly the car that's tucked in behind the, the lead Falcon car is getting very, very much closer. And as he does that, the sister car is trying to make a move on Ralph Aron. So it's number four in third place and number three up from sixth to fifth. And then behind them, looking for a bit of a gap. And then it's uh, Kelvin van der Linde in the sixth place Lamborghini. That's from the Red Bull team app. But... Uh, trying to hang on to their tail and in fact running pretty much on his own because the best of the rest after that is Thomas Much in the uh, Glickenhaus uh, so and he's dropping him I mean the Glickenhaus is not going to be as quick as the cars in SP9 so really the top six runners should be getting clear of all the others but at the moment it's the top five that are breaking away with Kel 
Van der Linde trying his best to hang on in the Red Bull. Liveried a Lamborghini running sick. That's car number 27. So the gap at the line, 0 0.776 between Kevin Estra and Danny Junkadea with a further, well, it's barely four tenths back to Joel Eriksson in the number four Falcon Motorsports car. So we have Porsche, Mercedes, Porsche, and then a bit of a gap back to Ralph Aron, who's in the leading SP9 Pro-Am car. So remember that driving combination shouldn't be as quick as the three ahead of it. And indeed, the duo behind, started by Alessio Picariello, that number three, and the second of the two, Falcon Motorsport Porsches, and will be joined uh, in due course by Martin Rackinger. It remains to be seen who's going to be doing which stint, because Picariello did stints one, uh, three, and four yesterday, with Rackinger only required for the, 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 the second stint, which was barely just over an hour. Um, let's see whether it's going to be more of a 50-50 split between that Belgian and Austrian combination today. Kelvin van der Linde in the chasing Red Bull team at Lamborghini Huracan running in sixth place. And then the SPX, the only runner, but it's right in there in terms of SP9 pace. That Glickenhaus started by Thomas Much running in seventh spot. But in the background, you can hear the flat six of the Porsche 911 GT3R of Alessio Picariello. They're heading through Schwedenkreutz now. And the track undulating, in fact, Schwedenkreutz, the left-hander, which they're just approaching. And then you've got to get the car over to the left-hand side of the circuit to take the optimum line into the right-hander at Arenberg, which is a tad more than a 90-degree right underneath the road bridge there, and then plunge your way down into the foxhole newly resurfaced. No real gains at the front for race leader Kevin Estra. 0.776 of a second clear at the end of the opening lap. He might have squeaked out a tenth of a second, but the good news is uh, the top five will soon be the top six. Kelvin Van Linder is starting to catch the car in fifth, which is Alessio Picariello's uh, Falcon Motorsport car. But of course, what they really want is a fabulous exit from Galgenkopf and then use the tow all along the dotting of her. In fact, it's a little bit dust. Someone's been off on that on the, the opening lap of the race, and uh, the cars from the third batch have started kicking the dust up as they they are on the black stuff but uh, certainly that will help remove a little bit of slipperiness but I can't wait for the field led by Kevin Estra to have a second run down there at full racing speed and see if Danny Junkadea can close in on him or Joel Eriksson uh, make progress for Falcon Motorsport in third place but they've got Ralph Aron, Alessio Picariello and now Kelvin van der Linde trying to get line astern behind them Fascinated by the BMW 240i battle, which is now heading back onto the Grand Prix circuit at the end of their first lap. 651 leads it then after one lap of probably 26 or 27 for these BMWs. I might be slightly fewer than that actually, but uh, the silver adrenaline motorsport driven BMW 240i racing cup car leading Mayatovic, who took pole position. And then the Deisler driven 952 car. They are all adrenaline entered machines. There's Mayatovic in the blue and black car. So actually, there's a gap of 3.4 seconds to Silver that now leads the class. So that's the 650 is not the race leader, it's the gold and red car that is out front. Number 651 just heading into the cut through now on the Grand Prix track. So the, unusually for the BMW 240i class, already quite a lead. I'm not sure how that has uh, wound itself up unless there's been a, some, some sort of incident or a yellow flag which has driven this gap. It's only 3.4 seconds, so certainly retrievable from here, but uh, more of a gap than we're used to after one lap of racing. Yeah, you grab it with both hands. If there's a little bit of a loss of momentum behind and it blocks two or three rivals, that's the opportunity. Then you've got to absolutely grasp it with both hands and uh, pull clear, which is exactly what the gold livery BMW is doing through the Vidal chicane. And then, of course, if you're leading your class when you turn onto the Nordschleife, barring disasters, particularly as these uh, M240 I BMWs are so uh, just so close in terms of performance, you should still be ahead at the end of the lap. But don't forget, within not a lot of time, both the second and third group of cars will start to be lapped by the front runners, and that does definitely uh, tend to break up their battles. They can rejoin when the whole group have gone through, but uh, certainly it makes it uh, interesting for a handful of laps. So that's Nico Silva who drives the leading 240i, Brazilian racer, 
uh, having uh, done a, a number of years in in Homeland Brazil in Formula 3, but now regularly racing on the Nordschleife. Back to the SP9 leaders, and it's still Kevin Estra then on lap two, who has this lead. Oh, oh he's slightly off there as well. Did so, so well to control that. Rear left wheel dropped into the dirt, and it slowed him down, no doubt about it, on the approach to Flansgarten and Brunchen. He wouldn't have even thought about that, Johnny. <laughs> What you, what you do. But, you know, it just goes to prove at this point, when they haven't got traffic in front of them, they are pushing as hard as they possibly can. Tyres certainly up to temperature. And in fact, some of the shots just show these cars are right on the edge of adhesion because, of course, there's almost nothing that's straight at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. But what people forget is also the, the vertical climb and fall of this circuit. So cars are constantly being unsettled. But for Kevin, it was simply he just was trying to carry as much momentum out of the corner and just didn't want to jerk it too quickly back onto the track. But it, it cost him, I'd say, a couple of tenths. So I'd say only half a second down. Now is uh, Danny Junkadea giving chase, and uh, there's a course vehicle or a very slow moving back marker. But someone's it looks like it's got a light bar on the top, yeah, so. it's got a light bar. I was waiting for it to come into full sunshine, but that stayed to uh, uh, driver's right. And this quintet, sorry, sextet, I keep forgetting about uh, the Lamborghini just about hanging on the back of that pack. Kelvin van der Linde in sixth place, fifth place is Alessio Picariello in the second half. The two Falcon Motorsport Porsche, the definitely is a car going very slowly along the dotting hair as the leaders come out of. Galkenkopf, they can see it in the bright sunlight. That should stay up uh, a bit closer to the right-hand side of the circuit, please. They get to try and use a little bit of the toe as they go past, but they're doing about 100 kilometres faster minimum. In fact, the other ones are hardly moving. Top six go through. Still Kevin Estra leading. I suggest that one little mistake has given a little bit of sucker to Danny Juncker there, but he's not being able to use a slipstream. But the driver who is using a slipstream is Alessio Picariello. He moves us al alongside the black and red Yokohama livery out racing team Mercedes. And as the track kinks to the left, he gets in front, but uh, he had to slow a little bit. Oh, oh my word, that is really tight. Ralph Aaron's going, oh, I'm not backing out. No. I was concerned that there may have been wheel arch to wheel arch contact there as well. I thought the Porsche moved very slightly and squirmed in the braking area. But amazingly, Picariello got away with that. The last thing you want, because these cars run with a slight bit of camber as well on uh, most of the wheels, certainly on the front tyres and wheels, then a little bit of that protrudes underneath the wheel arch and you can very easily get tyres of each of the cars combining and it can jump a car up into the air. Picariello again with a long look up the inside of the second element of the Mercedes arena. So make no mistake about it, Ralph Aron is under stern pressure, but he's attacking and defending at the same time, stuck in this Falcon sandwich. And Kevin Estra would have wished to have had slightly more of a lead by the end of the, the previous lap, 0.3 of a second, and that very slight mistake. But I take what you were saying, if he tightened his turning angle even more to stay off the gravel, he could have actually pitched the car into a full spin. So sometimes you've got to take your medicine and say, I'll just allow the car to wash out onto the dirt. It looks more of an incident, but actually that's really good car control. Kept it very smooth. Fastest lap of the race set by, not the driver in first, second, third, fourth or fifth, but the driver in sixth place. OK, he's not battling with the group. He's just trying to catch it. But that's uh, Kelvin van der Linde, seven minutes, 58.4. So we're very quickly onto the quick laps. And at uh, the end of uh, two flying laps the race. Yeah, Kelvin's just under two seconds. He's 1.8 seconds down on Alessio Picariello. They're picking their way through traffic. There will be winners, there will be losers. And right now, in fact, Kelvin Van Linden has gone from 1.8 seconds down as they go through the Sabine Schmitz curves. They've got a gaggle of cars up in front of him. He's now right on the tail of fifth place. So there we were a short while ago, Alessio Picariello trying to get past Ralph Aron to get fourth. He didn't manage to do it. Now he's got to look out because the, the Lamborghini from the, the Red Bull Abt team is right on his tail. It's almost nose to tail. Tiny margin at the front between the first two. Kevin Estra just, what was it, 3.38 of a second ahead of Danny Junkader. It's possibly slightly more than that. He's had a good entry to hats and back. And right now, the reason that uh, Danny Junkader is falling back a tiny bit, I think it's because Joel Eriksson is all over his tail. You get through hats and back, and then the track opens out all over again. They're heading towards... Uh, 
very, very quick run where you just carry all of your momentum as you head out towards Flugplatz. But there are cars dotted around in front of them. And this first time they pass them, again, it's always a bit of a question, do they know I'm there? But then suddenly for the drivers of the tail end cars, you get boom, 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 six cars coming past at uh, sort of seeming warp speed. But so the driver behavior yesterday was very good. And today, so far, so good as well. But really, I think we're looking at two seconds now covering the top six cars. They're almost nose to tail. They are. And now heading out of Arenberg and back down into the Fuchsrohrer with Adenauer forced to come in a moment or two. Marshall's uh, mere inches away from the edge of the racetrack, keeping a watchful eye on this new uh, re resurfaced section of track, which is even more quick. And it was always a daunting part of the circuit anyway. Then the, uh, open, the whole area opens up as the trees clear, and you do get that rare thing of some runoff around the, the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Thankfully, none of these six cars need that, as again, there's a briefest of looks from Ralph Aron up the inside of Joel Eriksson for third position. They have to adjust their lines very slightly at Metzgersfeld because they weren't able to run out wide. And now the first of the Porsches from Falcon, Ericsson having to go to the middle lane because there are slower BMWs and there's also Sirocco there on the apex, the ideal line that he was uh, aiming for. But a lot of these corners are blind on the entry. So you can sort of go, you can fully commit and think, I've got the, the outside line to go at as you leave the corner and then you suddenly realize there's a car doing maybe half your speed right where you want to be yeah and that separated the first two kevin estra danny yunkadea the two yellow cars at the front of the field from the rest no sooner have they suddenly been gifted a second a second and a half that they too were obstructed because they just had the group of them had to pass about 10 cars Still that small gap between first and second and those behind with uh, Joel Eriksson doing another good job as he works his way through around one side, around the other. But the first two made their break. Will they be hauled back in by the next two? But they're, they're looking good. They're suddenly, instead of being a few tenths ahead, they're about a second and a half. And, uh, you know, at that time, this point in the race, you'll take any advantage you can. It's still Kevin Estra leading in the Manti EMA Porsche. That's car number 911. But Danny Junkadea, as you'd expect for a driver of his calibre, car number 14 for the Hout Racing Team, just with him about two tenths of a second down. Yeah, so the confusing bit there down towards through the traffic was in Callenhard and Versaifen. Those t twists and turns, there's a sequence of track there that's almost replicated twice on the approach to Brightside. And when I play this track on the sim, I always have to remind myself, now this is the final sequence of right-hander and then a slightly tighter left-hander, and then you get to the lowest part of the circuit over the road bridge, and you can be begin the climb back up again through Bergwerk, and then approach the really fast stuff through Kesselshen and Klostertal. They're into Steel Strecker, which is the base of the carousel now. And if anything, actually, that gap's come down very slightly between second and third. So Estra and Junkadea desperately trying to make the break and just collect their thoughts a bit more because the problem is if you're, well, if you're Estra, for instance, and being pursued by five different cars, you've just got so much going on in your mind. Of course, Estra's more than capable of dealing with that and sort of almost ignoring it and focusing on the road in front. Inside line wasn't there for the right-hander that Estra was going through for a second or two, but he has to anticipate that the gap will open up as the traffic slowly moves to his left. And that's precisely what happened at Hoa Act as they now head on towards Flansgarten in a moment or two. And the track, well, briefly was blocked there because of uh, some slower traffic from Group 3. Again, just hold your breath, wait for it to clear, but it's all enabled Joel Eriksson to join up with the top two once again. What an extraordinary lap. It opens out, it closes up again. And uh, one, one driver who's had prodigious success in recent years, three titles, uh, Philip Lyson, his car is not going so well. It's the number one, last year's champion. They get to carry that. It's Adrenaline Motorsport, uh, BMW 330i from VT2 R plus four wheel drive class. And that's in the garage. Taking a look at it, it looks like it's been a little bit scraped down its left hand flank. And I, I, I quite soon expect some of the cars in the top group to have some scratches uh, from their rivals. It's very, very close indeed. The top six, just as soon as the first two, that's Kevin Estra and Danny Junker there, make their escape, then they're hauled back in. I'll say, I've been really, really impressed with Joel Erickson this weekend. Nothing new, but he's just worked the traffic very well, having been separated from the front. But the good thing from him in third place, he's just got a little bit of breathing space back to Ralph Aron. And Ralph is having to look in his mirrors, Alessio Picariello getting really close all over again, and Kelvin Van and Linda in the app. Um, 
Lamborghini starting to catch that uh, group from the back, but certainly they, it was like someone had just scattered a dozen cars in front of the race leaders and they just had to pick their way through, but it ebbed and it flowed. And, uh, now it looks as though the first two just started to pull away again from Ericsson, despite there not having been any more cars to overtake, but they'll get towards the dotting of her and I, I, I would reckon it would close up, certainly coming their way right now. Nearly three laps completed, 23 minutes or so on the clock. It's the second race of two this weekend on the Nürburgring Nordschleife for the first two rounds of the 2024 Nürburgring Langstrecken Series. And this is the ADAC Ryan Alders Langstrecken Rennen live on the Radio Show Limited network of channels, RS1, as Estra has to breathe in there and dart up the inside of a Toyota Supra. In fact, he's managed to clear three cars in one go there, and I don't think Junker Day is going to be able to get through the traffic quite as efficiently. So that's Estra's big opportunity now of opening up this big gap. And because Junker Day couldn't get through, and it was purely because of the track aesthetics, if you like, they hit the chicane at Tiergarten and Hohenrein, and there just wasn't the racing line through there. And that's enabled the Falcon Motorsport Porsches to pounce and potentially take second place away from Junker Dea. Late on the brakes will go Joel Eriksson into the first corner. He has to anticipate where the Mercedes is, and it's still just ahead of him. Second through to sixth, covered by a second, but that was an absolute gift to our race leader, Kevin Estra. He was sitting on advantage of half a second. The traffic came and blocked Danny Junker Day. He had to really, really back off. Now we've got the two Falker Motorsport cars uh, really challenging and a bit of a mistake there from Alessio Picariello and bam, Kelvin van der Linde up to fifth place. So he got a bit pushed wide. Picariello, and by the time he came back, well, Lamborghini was there, so we've had a little change, but really, the timing of the traffic, and Kevin Estra probably had to go beyond his braking point to make sure as he approached Tiergarten that he could uh, get through, get through he did, and the delay for Danny Yonkadeo would have been very, very frustrating indeed, but he's not that sort of multiple world champion in GTs for nothing, he'll, he'll see what he can do to close in again. Not uh, a good phase of the race for Philip Lyson in his number one BMW 330i, just heading into the pit. This is the car that he shares with Daniel Zills and uh, Moran Gott. They run the number one because they were champions in 2023. Uh, and so often a championship car can come from uh, one of the lower uh, subcategories, if you like. But at the end of lap three, unfortunately, that BMW might even be only lap two for that BMW because Lapry has uh, long been taking, play, taking place well, and Philip Lyson's come in for the second pit stop. It just oh, went really? back out and has done the short loop and uh, cut straight back in through the cut through. So, uh, you know, in a, in a championship when you normally have to just keep accruing points and they do it very well in their particular class, this is a big set setback, uh, particularly yeah. for Philip Lyson, who's had such enormous success over the years in the NLS. However, They'll, they'll move their focus el elsewhere. You never know, but they always run in a very large class. Mm. You get your points. If you win a class and it's, let's say, 15 cars, you take the 15 points. If your class has only got 10 cars, you only get 10 points. So they have been successful in large classes. That's why you get the large um, points tally at the end of the season. But uh, the fact is, whatever class they're in, they tend to be at the very top of it. So they're absolutely fantastic. Adrenaline most sport run absolutely brilliant cars, but this one has clearly got a little bit of a problem. It's a BMW 330i. The reason that that sliding scale is put into the regulations, of course, is that it's arguably more difficult to win a class with 15 cars in it than it is to win a class with any three or four cars in it. So you get more points. And there's a very clever table dictating number of entries versus number of points potentially available for a race win. Kevin Estra's lead after that brilliant bit of dealing with the traffic, there was some luck involved certainly as well. Then Picariello made a mistake or did he actually have contact with the number six Mercedes of Ralph Aron? Either way, that spat him out well over to the left coming out of the Mercedes arena and the Lamborghini of Kelvin van der Linde was in the right position to nab fifth place. Well, he was because what happened into the third corner of the Mercedes arena, not the tight first one, the, the more open second one, but the third one where it really tightens up. He dived down the inside of Ralph Aron. They were side by side on the exit, but unfortunately for Alessio Picariano, he was then on the outside, then with a little bit of hello, and here's my shoulder. He had to go over the white lines, and uh, thank you very much, Kelvin van der, Linde, van der Linde, grabbed it with both hands, moved up the position. So there'd be a, a degree of extra temperature in the helmet of the Belgian racer, Alessio Picariano. He's now got to do it all over again, but he's got, so maybe he can use Kelvin van der Linde in the Lamborghini 
to get onto the tail and upset Ralph Aron. But actually, looking at their progress around the circuit, the Falcon Motorsport Porsche at this point, maybe because the Super Cariello is super focused, is looking a little bit quicker. Actually, he needs to get that Lamborghini out of the way. Yeah. Bear in mind, in fact, Kelvin van der Linde, even though he's set the fastest lap, was largely seemed to be gaining when the others were being held up in traffic but now I think in clear running again he's going to be slightly obstructive to Alessio Picario but he's not going to make it easy oh dear and now Bridge they're tiptoeing around there the tail skeetering left and right on the Lamborghini but uh, Picario is maybe just going to have to go you know what don't take risks wait till you get a good exit if you can out of Galkenkopf and see what you can do along the Dottinger Hoa right now to take a move around the Nordschleife well that would be brave through the right-hander at Bergwerk go Kelvin van der Linde and Alessio Picardiello. And it's all about well, that right-hander at Bergwerk, so crucial to then your top-end speed through Kesselschen and Klostertal up the hill. So you need good power from the engine, whether that be rear engine for the Porsche, mid-engine for the Lamborghini, front engine for the Mercedes. And that's the beauty of mixing and matching the so many different uh, ways of designing a car and courtesy of the balance of performance, all four of these different manufacturers appear to be very evenly matched indeed. Uh, so it was three manufacturers today, isn't it? With Porsche, Mercedes and the Lamborghini. We had the Audi yesterday. As now, Kevin Estra heads into the concreted section, the Caracciola Carousel. And no sooner that he arrives in that scene does he leave it. And Daniel Juncadea has separated himself from those chasing quartet behind, but he doesn't have an answer to Kevin Estra's pace at the moment. That gap's opened up to probably about three seconds now. Yeah, to give you a good visual on that, the concrete strip that runs at the lower section of the track around the inside of the, uh, the carousel, Danny Uncoder was just hitting the concrete strip as Kevin Estra was departing it, having exited the corners. So that's effectively the scale of a three and a bit second lead. But certainly Danny Uncoder will be quite pleased on this lap because having dropped Joel Eriksson, who remember at the start of that was trying to overtake him when they came out of the final corner. The number one Philip Lyson car is back onto the circuit. Two pit stops so far, two pit stops way ahead of schedule, but hopefully whatever has been afflicting uh, that car, it has been sorted. And uh, car number one, actually, yes, it's Philip Lyson, but uh, at this point in the race, you don't want to have uh, a number of pit stops. In cup two, Tobias Muller has got to the front of that incredibly competitive pack into the 11th spot overall as well. So it's Muller in the 103 Black Falcon car ahead of Tim Shearbart, who started the Avia WNS Motorsport version, number 120. And then Moritz Krantz in 124 for Mulner. Steve Yads in another, another Black Falcon car, the Team 48 machine, number 148. And one of the Halders, either Mike or Michelle, drives the 117 car and they are 11th well you can track up to all the way down to 20th position overall in fact so that's the top 10 or within the top 20 overall as the number one bmw has rejoined and we're about to call kevin estra and danny uncadea through the fourth of five sectors but that will take the longest of the five north of three minutes and I wonder if it's any quieter through there. Probably not. Probably getting busier as far as the traffic's concerned. To, to be honest, the way they've hit the traffic, you know, for the first time today has been much harder for the drivers than it was yesterday. Just want to take you back 24 hours. Often when you've got drivers of the same name with the same initial, yesterday we had the two M Halders. We still had the same. Johnny was just debating us. It, was, I, I, it made, me, made me chuckle. Uh, which M Halders in the car? And then, as luck would have it, we suddenly looked up and on the screen there was Michelle Halder being interviewed in the pit. So we narrowed it down to a choice of just one of her brothers. We'll take Michael. Yeah. <laughs> it was that gift. If only it could have come 20 seconds earlier. But uh... Makes it a lot simpler for us. But uh, that, is, that means that Lucas is going to have to interview a lot of people a lot of the time in order for us to narrow it down. As now, Picariello having more than a look around the outside of Kelvin van der Linde as they all hit the brakes into Tiergarten and Hohenrein. Not quite close enough and would be a brave overtake anyway. You need to do it quite early into Tiergarten as the cars stream across the line for the fourth time. Now, I wonder in a lap's time, will we get any pit callers? Because actually nobody pitted after five laps yesterday. Now Picariello will pounce into the first corner and pick off Kelvin van der Linde with a smart overtake into turn one. All down to a very, very neat exit from Hohenrein. Right, was the gap at the start of the field, at the top of the field extended? Yes, 3.8 seconds has become 4.6 seconds. But the interesting one, which Johnny just picked up on, it was a fortunate second half of that for Danny Juncker because he dropped Joel Eriksson. Joel is now nearly two and a half seconds behind 
in third place. But we're still looking at the situation after four racing laps, eight, point, eight and a half seconds between Kevin Estra leading the Manti EMA Porsche and um, Alessio Picariello in sixth, except he's now up to fifth, having just demoted uh, the Red Bull liveried uh, Abt team Lamborghini of Kelvin van der Linde. Best of the rest, seventh overall, SPX, the only car in the class, Thomas Much, and it's going just so much better for Glickenhaus today, down to an eight minute, three second lap. Yesterday, quite late in the race, they hadn't got below eight minutes, 10. Yeah. That is notable progress. But then there was a huge tranche in the sort of third, second, third, and fourth quarters of yesterday's race where we had slow zones at various points on the circuit. As it happens, there's just suddenly a slow zone, a valvoline, which is very, very early on in the uh, Grand Prix loop or the part that we use. But uh, yes, you know, a lot of this race, you might get 90%, that's clear. But if you've got to back it off by 20 seconds because of a, a slow zone, your lap time clearly isn't going to be very good. Uh, and again, uh, Christoph Breuer is uh, Renato Motorsport. We talked about the third of the Lamborghinis, the bright yellow and black one. That's uh, going well in Christoph's hands. That's running eighth though. We're all completing the top 10. We've got car number seven also in the SP9 class. That's in a Pro-Am category. That's Torsten Kratz sharing the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini, which is the older Evo. It's Evo 1. That does seem to be running here for a very large number of years. That's going well in ninth, 10th place. It's uh, car number eight, also in the top class, which is Juta Racing, running uh, their Audi. So we do have an Audi in the top mix. It's a sort of silver livery car with the uh, Russian racer, Alexei Veramenko, and then a driver, we often get pseudonyms, Selv, in yes. capital letters, S-E-L-V. Yes, uh, not his real name, but uh, that uh, is might entirely be. down to the, might be, I suppose, but uh, entirely down to driver preference as to whether you reveal your real name or not. Uh, yeah, I, I looked at when the Evo 1 Lamborghini Huracan was first eligible for GT3 competition, start of 2015. So we're actually into the 10th season when you could sport an Evo 1. And I think actually for the top line GT3 championships, you probably can't run an Evo 1 anymore because as far as I can see, uh, it officially ended its homologation period in December 2023. There'll be some loopholes, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, here in the NLS to still allow you to compete. I don't know what's going to happen at N24, whether Conrad Motorsport will be allowed to, to run that car. It may, it may be that it's just not eligible for points uh, for you know the bigger championship that uh, I mean it doesn't affect the regulations the fact that it's going to be part of another championship this year no, so it, maybe maybe again you know they'll be fine to run it uh, at the end of May yes and I, I think you look you look at the history of the Nürburgring Langstrecken series and its predecessor the VLN you know that Op Opal Manta ran forever and a day you could imagine its original homologation had gone west but you know true why not you know when with the advent of GT3 and its expansion, which has just been truly phenomenal. I mean, that the whole journey towards that started 30 years ago with the, the BPR series. In fact, that's being celebrated today, that 30th anniversary down at uh, Circuit Pori Cars. And um, you know, it's been a phenomenal tale led by Stefan Rattel. So GT3 grew, GT4 grew and grew. I mean, you can get, there was an amazing picture taken down there. They had, I think it was 99 cars lined up on the Mistral straight. And that was with a quarter of the field missing with the GT3s, the GT2s and the GT4s all together. But this is, to me, the natural hunting ground. So if the car's slightly out of date, why not? Mm. Think back, you know, the Lamborghini Huracan came on to take over from the Lamborghini Gallardo, which was stable for a very long time. But these cars are still quick. And as long as they're still safe, why not race them? As you talk about safe and racing, the one of the Toyo, Toyo racing, uh, Toyota Supras is really being hustled through the v came chicane. When I say through, I do mean three, I, through. I don't mean round, but somehow managed to get it back on the track, just in front of the one the door motorsport Aston Martin. So, uh, you know, all the classes pushing very, very hard indeed. And that, I think, is the SP10 current race it leader. Is. And no, it's second Gordon. in class. Jimmy oh, Broadbent is leading class. So he's in uh, Team Bilstein. BMW M4. Second place is uh, Fabian Volvend, and then Andreas Goulden was the driver who went to hop in, in that uh, dark blue metallic uh, Toyota. And just in behind was uh, Wustenhagen, the door motorsport Aston Martin. So good mix of cars there. BMW, BMW, Toyota, Supra, Aston Martin, and then for good measure, another BMW. Yeah. But uh, it, there's a choice to be made about where you enter your GT4 because the traditional uh, home is SP10. Clearly, Jimmy Broadbent's car and the Volvend version of the M4 not eligible for SP10 action yeah, for sorry. whatever reason, or they've just chosen to go into the turbocharged category. But, yeah, sorry, I should I mean, specify. They're minor differences. They're SP80. They are minor, but you know, maybe, maybe it's the way you want to work your point. So, yes, leading 
The, to the Toyota, is, uh, Toyota I just talked about is the one leading the class, you know, kind of a 170 yeah. in SP10. When but I say leading the class, I just specified that I wasn't naming the class, and now I just didn't do it then either. But I wonder whether some of the SP10 runners will be keen to try and uh, beat the SP8Ts as well. Now, hang on a minute. We've got a drama at the Arenberg gravel trap. That looked like one of the Arvia cars stuck in the gravel and potentially quite badly damaged as well. It's, it'll be Tim Shearbart because Shearbart's not reached the end of Sector 3. So that's the 120 Porsche, I reckon, stranded in the gravel, that was, was the running second at the time. Yeah, well, I mean, yesterday Tim Shearbart was leading the class. This is the car that was given a, a push into the final corner of the last lap yesterday. Span out, having just taken the lead of Cup 2, eventually got promoted to second after the assault from Car 100 with Nico Otto, and today maybe there was another assault. I'm just trying to look at message on the screen to see if anybody else was uh, in and among, but no messages coming through just as yet, but I think some messages should come up soon. So, unfortunate weekend for them. Plenty of pace in Cup 2, but uh, results not quite landing on their toes as yet. Hopefully, I didn't see Im that image at all. Hopefully the damage isn't as bad as uh, it may have been. Yeah, it was. I just caught sight of it from another car's onboard camera as it went through the scene. But there is currently a Code 60 in place at Arenberg, which is Marshall Post 88, and that's now stretching back a couple more Marshall Posts to the exit of Schwedenkreuz. And it was the livery of Arvia WNS Motorsport that caught my eye. Definitely a Porsche and. The fact that we don't have a time now for Tim Shearbart rather suggests that's the car stranded. And as I say, it looked like maybe one of its wheels was no longer on that left side. But uh, I'm happy to sort of describe that again at a second viewing. Kevin Estra, however, will have been through that scene. Uh, in fact, he won't have uh, encountered the, the Code 60 because he got through before the incident and is almost now about to complete lap five. But the long shot along Dossinger Her has proved that uh, the advantage is definitely in the court of Kevin Estra because he was 4.6 seconds clear at the start of the lap. At the end, of that, I would suggest, has, has pretty much doubled. So he's sitting on really a very tidy advantage. The next yellow car comes into view in the background, and we've got the cars from third and fourth diving into the pits. I'll leave my notepad out for that. That's uh, five laps on the board. Yesterday, we met, you mentioned actually earlier today that uh, nobody of the front runners uh, pitted without reason or penalty as early as the end of lap five. But into the pits came Joel Erickson from third and Ralph Aron from fourth. So uh, the others go on further. Gap between first and second. Well, actually, I thought it was more than it proves to be. 5.6 seconds. So my eyes clearly slightly squint this morning. But Kevin Estra, he's gained another second. Good for him. Yeah, it all adds up, and uh, it will be to his delight as he peers into the rearview mirror that as he hits the brakes for the right-hand horseshoe on the Grand Prix track, there was nobody anywhere close to him visually. The Mercedes does now turn through that section of the circuit, and the time at the start of this lap, the difference between first and second, 5.6 with a further 3.2 seconds back to Alessio Picariello, not pitting at the end of lap five, but Joel Eriksson, his teammate, did, and Ralph Aron also. And that might not be a bad idea as far as the fact that it's relatively calm in the pit lane right now. So you can get to your pit uh, area. The team can service the car as quickly as possible, well, as quickly as the time dictates, because, of course, you can't breach the uh, pit stop minimum reference time, which is a sliding scale, depending on how many laps you've just completed at this stage of the race. If you've only done five laps, as opposed to some of these runners that will do as many as seven, it can be a quicker pit stop than if you'd chosen to do a longer stint at the start of the race. Yeah, just again, I reached the trusty A4 sheet of pit stop times, and if you come in after five laps, your pit stop has to be a minimum of 306 seconds, so six seconds over the five minutes. If you come in the following lap, your pit stop will be 22 seconds longer. That will really swing you around. And if you come in after seven laps, another few laps, you're 45 seconds in hand. So the drivers coming in later get penalised, but then at the end of the race, they'll make their final pit stop later in the race if all goes to plan and they'll get the, that time back again. So you get this element of seesawing. So just remember, two cars came in at the end of five racing laps. Car number four from third place, that's Joel Erickson and Ralph Aron. Car number six, BMW, uh, the Mercedes from HRT. That's the black and red one on Yokohama tires. They blink first, that nailed their colours to that particular mast. 
heading into the Code 60 again, the race leader, Kevin Estra, and it's all about how quickly you can get into that part of the circuit, obeying the yellow flags, of course, uh, with the speed limits there deliberately. Race leader is still Manti, EMA, with their Porsche. Shop für Simracing Hardware und Zubehör. www.simraceshop.de Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. Schaden bekommen und dann mussten wir halt äh, mit dem kaputten Reifen bis in die Box zurückrumpeln. Äh, ja, und das war halt jetzt so der Anfang von dem ganzen Misere jetzt. Ja. Ihr habt dann das Auto relativ lange in der Box gehabt, seid wieder rausgerollt, dann doch nicht, dann ging es nochmal zurück. Was ja. war da die Ursache nach dem eigentlichen Wechsel des äh, kaputten Reifens? Also anscheinend äh, ist ein Fehler abgelegt worden im System, was äh, dafür geführt hat, dass äh, beim Rausfahren äh, kein Gas angenommen hat. Wir hatten eigentlich gedacht, dass das äh, durch Resetten äh, der Fehlerspeicher gelöscht ist. Das war nicht der Fall. Und am Ende äh, wollten wir den äh, Speicher löschen. Ist ja nicht reingekommen. Und äh, das hat nochmal zur Verzögerung äh, geführt. So, jetzt sind wir auch draußen. Das Auto grundsätzlich fährt. Jetzt haben wir haben gerade gehört, das ABS ist ausgefallen. Vermutlich durch den Reifenschaden ist äh, die Leitung vom ABS beschädigt worden. Vom Sensor. This is where Cup 2 can begin to shine, though, because they should be able to do eight laps, should they choose to, for this opening stint, and nine laps then when we get into real strides of the race. Yeah, we often get just past the hour, so all the top runners from SB9 would have come in, and then for the next laps, very occasionally, almost two, you can have the very best of the Cup 2 cars hit the top. But from SP9, from the SP9 Pro class, where we've had the six cars fighting for the lead of the race, the two cars that came to make that initial pit stop ahead of their rivals, that's number four from Falcon Motorsport and the number six, Hout Racing Team Mercedes, they will be leading this group when they've all made their first pit stops. They've made theirs early on, those pit stops are shorter 
a lot of seconds shorter, 24, potentially 40 something seconds shorter than if cars come in a lap or two laps afterwards, but they will pay the price for that at early advantage later on. But expect four and six go to the top of the pile once all the front runners are coming. Extra safety onto the Dottinger Hoor for the sixth time. And there's a little bit of traffic here and there, but nothing too much to worry about. Again, he's taken a full second away from Danny Junkadea through the long fourth sector. And he continues to increase the lead on Alessio Picariello and Kelvin van der Linde as well. So Estra's uh, sector speed is absolutely mighty at this point in time. And you almost wonder why they would want to pit because they've got a fair bit of clearer air in front. Just go as far as you can into this stint. Yes, you then have to take a longer pit stop. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to stay out for a seventh lap before making their stop, which is what they did yesterday as well. It means you've got to take a longer period of time within the pit lane for the first stop, but that will treat you to a to a benefit towards the end because it means you have to you can go deeper into the end of the race, closer to the chequered flag, and that final pit stop can be quicker. Now we had concerns. We we're just mentioning it a short while ago about the number one BMW too many times in the pits. That's the Adrenaline Motorsports uh, 330i run for Philip Lyson and uh, Matthias Unger of. Uh, chief of adrenaline motorsport explained it, it was nothing mechanically problematic it was simply a puncture but they wanted to check the car over uh, in in the confines of the garage and uh, the fact it went out and came back around again uh, you can do that little shortcut in doesn't count as an extra pit stop but you're just in the pit so they've lost a considerable amount of time they're down in 92nd of the 94 cars uh, that went out in this race first to second though it's grown by um on the last lap it was the best part of Two seconds, almost precisely two seconds. So Kevin Estra, seven points, nearly 7.7 seconds clear in the lead of the race in his Manti Porsche. Second place, Danny Junkadea falling back very slightly. And Alessio Picariello was fifth, became third, because, of course, two of the cars in front, including the sister car from Falco Motorsport, made a pit stop. And, of course, the other one that came in was the number six Mercedes from Hout Motorsport team. But actually, suddenly... Uh, Unless he's able to match the pace of those in front. In fact, he took a bit of a chunk out of the advantage of Junkadea in second place. So that's down to under two seconds. So don't forget, Picariello tried to make a place gain early in the race, got shoveled wide, bit of contact with uh, Ralph Aron on turn four of the Mercedes Arena. Then he got to take, you know, passed in that incident by the Lamborghini from the Red Bull apt team. But he's made his way forward, got deposed the Lamborghini. In fact, Kelvin van der Linde has fallen nearly three seconds behind him. We did feel that once Picariello was on the tail of the Lamborghini, he was a little bit quicker. He's found his way past. And now, clearly, his his sights are set on the tail end of Danny Junkadea. They didn't really race close together, because yesterday that number 14 uh, Mercedes, of course, uh, fell down the order somewhat in the early parts of the race, had started on pole, but it's a different car today, not just in terms yeah. of colour, it's got different rubber underneath it. So um, Danny Junkadea getting used to a Michelin tyres today in place of Yokohama, since was running yesterday. They may be round and black, but they do things in different ways, that's what I'm told. And speak, well, you're right. Uh, speaking of tyres, Matthias uh, Unger was chatting to Lucas a couple of moments ago about the number one. That was only a puncture, apparently, but after some contact. So they were able to fix the number one car fairly quickly. I, I wasn't entirely sure why it needed to go into the garage, therefore. Well, but you know, I, I looked at some footage of that, and you could see scraping down the left-hand flank of the number one BMW, but I think they were also just checking that nothing had been bent in terms of the steering, because I, it looked so like it was a full side-on-side -side contact. If your yeah. wheel is obviously anything other than dead straight, you can it can twist and tweak and, and damage. So I think the driver bringing it in, Philip Lyson, was uh, fairly convinced that they needed to look at it because otherwise he wouldn't have wanted it put in the pit carriage. But they were, did it as quickly as they could. But a uh, little setback, but important that Matthias Unger settled. And I was going to say, at that point, if you're actually convinced it was only a puncture, it's only a puncture. If it comes in with a mechanical problem other than that, then, you know, you're looking at a far longer repair. So good news for them in some ways. True to Hyundai's battling with one another. Although, oh no, having said that, I think the second one is a, it may be a Hyundai. I, 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 I am struggling to tell from the, from yeah, it is, as it now turns left through Schwab and Schwanz. One is the fastback version, the bright orange with the blue central body stripe, and then the hatchback tucked in behind. So it is the Mertens Motorsport car that leads the VT2 front-wheel drive class. And if that is 491, then that is Hislop 
heading on to the Dottinger Hoor. Yeah, but I, I'm not entirely sure it's a Hyundai behind. It's very okay. hard. It's got a metallic livery. It could be a Cupra. A Cupra uh, well, that was my other thought. And if that's the case, that would be number 469, perhaps. But again, it, it, when, you, when you have a very high shot, and sometimes with a me metallic livery on a bright day, it actually sort of makes it quite hard to see the angle of the cars. I'm not entirely sure. I think you're right road. that it is a Cooper. It looked like a Cooper from behind, and I was about to say that. And then as it turned left through Schwabenschwanz, it looked very much like a Hyundai from the front. So I got properly confused. But I think you're right that that is the battle for VT2 honours for the front-wheel drive cars. So 491 leading in 56th position from the four, sorry, four, four, 491 and 469, yes. And <laughs> it could be about to change. It's got a Cupra badge on the roof, for goodness sake. Come on, That Palmer. was the bit where the sun was shining. Yeah. They're almost side by side, but actually a slightly better exit, as was his prerogative, uh, for the car that was leading the class, and that's the, the Hislop. Uh, driven car, that's Josh Hislop keeps his orange and blue Hyundai tidily into the first corner, doesn't leave the door open but yeah, now definite confirmation it's Cooper all over it, good girl, what were we thinking? I have Four. to say the headlights on the Cooper look very Hyundai though, they do, for don't that, they? Uh, that particular model of Cooper we're trying to cover up the guys I'm girls. desperately trying to do so, but anyway as it turns left and now we're at ground level, as far as the cameras are concerned I can make out the shape of a Cupra a little more. Uh, that is not the full bespoke sort of TCR version of Cupra though, with the giant rear wing on it. These are slightly more standard VT2 front wheel drive cars. So Hislop versus Young, very close battle indeed. And uh, this is potentially gonna run and run with Tobias Young looking for a way by at every possible opportunity. It uh, tends to be the Grand Prix track where you've got the, the most opportunities in quick succession of an overtake because hats and back and fluke plats, that's, your, that's the scope for a, a pass gone, really. Yeah, it's always interesting when you look at the, the production classes, the drivers look as though they're having to work so much harder when they're, 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 they're pushing around the Grand Prix loop because of course they don't have the aero that's pushing them down even the TCR cars with their, their giant wings have, but certainly in comparison to the SP9 class cars at the top of the field, but they're slower, the drivers have to move around, they're working really hard, but in just as hard as Tobias Young was working in that 469, the Coupe, the Cooper Leon, he had to lose a bit of track space to let a quicker car come past and put a, put a lap on him, but he's able to close right up, but unfortunately for him, they've just gone through the two Sabine Schmitz curves, they're going down the drop, and the track then starts to move from left to right in front of them through, through hats and back, and uh, he's got to do it all over again but I would think at this this order unless they're interrupted by traffic his next chance is when they exit Galgenkopf and he's going to see if he can get a really good move along the Dossinger Herb but that's an awful long way it's about another 18 kilometres from where they are now time to think about it and also time to look in his mirrors and think is anyone else going to come up and separate me as they overtake and I'm trying to have my class battle for V2 for, uh, forward, uh, front wheel drive and, uh, still, we're still there but thereabouts actually on the start finish line they were covered by just under 50 uh, 15 hundredths of a second, so it's super close. But in a straight line, the Hyundai maybe he made a better exit, better exit from her and Ryan, but uh, it looks a little bit sleeker. Did we mention that the Renato Motorsport team Lamborghini Huracan pitted at the end of that lap? So 786 was running in seventh position at the time and has now come into pit lane. Christoph Breuer handing over to... Now, you see, on one screen, I still have a continuation of Breuer, but I, I think it is... Saknana, who has taken charge Correct. of that car. it is. Yeah. Confirmation the tie driver has taken over. So what we know, we know nothing, is the fact that all the front runners should be coming in this time around because you won't go a formation lap and any more than seven racing laps. But we've had a change for second place because Alessio Picariello was hunting down Danny Juncadea and he's moved his Falcon Motorsport Porsche up into second on the road. He's going to be about eight seconds or so behind Kevin Estra, maybe slightly more, because he would have lost uh, a bit of time making his way past uh, Danny Junker there. But Danny's wise enough. He's got enough titles to realise there are times you have to fight and impede someone and times when you don't. But uh, into the pit lane, they both go. And already from the lead of the race, 9-11, into the pits, Kevin Estra coming in. They could go no further. And according to the script that we're writing as we speak, <laughs> they've done exactly that job. And in comes the Lamborghini as well. It really is a case of et al into the pit lane. Yeah, so top four in, expecting Thomas Much probably to pit as well, but he's further down the road in the baby blue um, Glickenhaus SCG004. 
right, already. A... Have we had a pit stop for Torsten Kratz in the Conrad car? No, he should be in as well at the end of this as the so race just, leader in Pro Am. Yeah, just to reiterate, the cars that pitted, get this, two laps ago, will have a considerable advantage at this point. I went through the, the magic chart and worked out it was about 48 seconds uh, they should gain by making that first pit stop early. Commensurate, they will lose it later on. Oh, gosh, I really do exaggerate. It's 40, 40, 45 seconds. There we go. That's 45 seconds, yeah. But so bear in mind, they were right in the mix. They came in from third and fourth. That means it should be pretty much 45 seconds in terms of, you know, they, they, should, they should be in the lead for that. They were right in the mix of this group of cars. And we'll wait for Cup 2 to come through in a moment or two to see what they do. As expected, the Conrad car well, has completed seven laps and isn't being shown in the pits, I notice. Um, surely Torsten Kratz not able to stay out for an eighth lap, but uh, we'll confirm that in a moment or two. Very Menko comes in in the Utah Racing Audi. And Kiki Satnana, as I mentioned, has already come in for a stop. I think Torsten Kratz is going to roll the dice here, and perhaps more to the point, Conrad Motorsport. Now, whether being an Evo 1 car, they've been able to scrimp and save on the fuel a little bit here and there. But I'm not misreading that. Kratz over the line at the end of the seventh lap and remains on the racetrack with Tobias Muller for Black Falcon leading Cup 2. Well, we knew that the Cup 2 cars should be able to push the envelope to a, an eighth lap in this opening stint. Although I noticed that uh, Moritz Krantz comes in for Mulner Motorsport from second in the Cup 2 division. Steve Jantz may well do the same as well. We'll have to wait a few more seconds to confirm that. But it is a Lamborghini now that leaves the race for Torsten Kratz with the Evo 1. I'm worried. I'm very worried. <laughs> Has he smelt something nice on a barbecue about half an hour? You can get half a lap out of uh, this tank, but uh, maybe there is something different. Might be good dive into the rule book and see if by being a much older car they, they're allowed a little bit more fuel but I think that's a very very bold mix but Conrad Motorsport they've done more than a few laps here but uh, have they remembered it's 25 kilometers around the lap that seems a really bold bold row of the dice maybe it was misunderstanding maybe they know something that we don't but anyhow it's bold Kevin Estra came in from the lead he was about well 6.6 .6 seconds was his advantage over Alessio Picariello Picariello is out his teammate Martin Racking has taken over that number three uh, Porsche from Falcon Motorsport. But it looks so like that's no real game for either of those cars during the pit stop, as you'd expect. It also remains to be seen whether, if they can get round for an eighth lap um, uh, for this first stint, then potentially they can keep that up, do eight all the way through to the finish, and then they'll be coming in very late on compared to other runners in SP9. We know that the Conrad Motorsport car can be very quick, but it's also tough in terms of reliability at times, and the car in previous 24-hour races has been right in the mix for the first, let's say, three or four hours, and then unfortunately falls away. But uh, I'm fascinated now to see how long Conrad Motorsport can stay in the race and potentially challenge the other SP9s. Let's uh, catch up with Alessio Picariello now in the pits. We were all together for quite a while, so uh, it was hard to make a pass because everybody was getting slipstream. Um, and I was behind the Mercedes, which was giving a lot of dirty air, so it was really difficult for me. My tires were a bit overheating. Uh, I tried to make a pass, but then I lost the position. That's the game, you know. Uh, but yeah, I think when I was alone, the, the car felt good. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was fun. Wenn Rennfahrer von Dirty Air sprechen, dann hat es in diesem Fall eines Mercedes-AMG GC3 zu tun. Und es hat nicht so richtig viel Spaß gemacht. Aber er sagte, das ist part of the game. Das ist halt so im Motorsport, insbesondere bei der Langstrecke. And you are smiling. That means you are okay and you enjoy the day and the weekend. Every time you are in Nürburgring, you are smiling. Uh, it's the best place in the world. This is the only track that gives you so much adrenaline. And uh, I just love to come here. And uh, yeah, for me, it's always a pleasure. So, TV crew, uh, we cross the fingers and hope to see you and your team on the podium again. Thank you very much. Danke. Alessio Picariello, he knows the word for thank you, at least, and uh, good to catch up with the Belgian, who is 
there or thereabouts in the mix again and having to come back from some really bad luck yesterday. And also, in fairness, some driving that was questionable because there was some contact and that was just to be the number three's fault and they had to serve a drive through penalty quite rightly for it. Yeah, but it was super, super close. It's super, super close in the top class all over again. You know, sometimes we, we have a much larger field of SP9s at the front of the field, but what it's shown today and yesterday, 10 good SP9 class, you might get six going away, but it's always close, and that is fabulous. But just going back to the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini, if I could, it's played these little cameo roles in recent years, but they've become less frequent because the other cars have become more competitive. But I'm still yeah. very, very concerned about uh, Dawson Kratz going around onto a formation lap followed by eight racing laps around here. Just looking at the best pace of that car, it's about eight seconds down on the fastest laps of the front runners. So it's been running at a sort of slightly reduced pace. Is that down to the the, uh, the pace of Torsten Kratz, or is he just been told if you back it off and run, you may be able to squeak another lap? They might have inserted that word "may" and underlined it <laughs> on the on the race notes. But it's a bold bid. But as Johnny was pointing out, it by backing off and running at a lower pace, you may gain an extra 20 seconds. But I would suggest they've backed off by more than 20 seconds uh, over the course of the opening seven laps of the race. However, they could come round in the lead of the race, but really I'm expecting the two cars that pitted after five racing laps, that's the number four, Falcon Motorsport Porsche, and the number six, uh, HRT, Hout Racing Team Mercedes, to be the cars out front. They had the short first stop, but they will uh, then have the much, much longer final stop. We should have three pit stops being a, a four hour race. You could do them all on the top of the hour. That's effectively what some of the front runners will be doing if they're running the long stint, which is a traditional eight lap stint. The first lap is, first stint is always shorter because you've already done the formation lap, but extra 25 kilometers tacked on. But uh, if you have a standard race, it should be, and conditions are dry, you don't have any too many slow zones, it should be seven laps on the opening stint, eight laps, eight laps, and then what's ever left at the end of the race and we got through did we do 27 or 28 laps quickly look 27 i think 27 yesterday yeah just found it on uh, one of my mini bits of paper well done uh by the way the repair work at arenberg continues the unimog is in situ with its trailer because new bits of armco required and i noticed that tim shearbart's avia WNS Motorsport Cup 2 car was on a flatbed, so clearly unable to drive away from the scene. I thought it would have been damaged, and unfortunately for those associated with that car that was right up there at the time, uh, it can go no further. It's the 120 911 GT3 Cup car, so it'll mean that Daniel Blickel and David Yarn will take uh, no part in this year's ADAC Ryan Alders, Langstreck and Renan. So that's running in Cup 2, but obviously we've got Cup 3, which is uh, also a Porsche Cup class, but that's for the 718 Cayman. But I did think, hold on, I just wanted to double check. It's not the, the, the Cayman they run in that class, which is car number 962. No, it isn't. In fact, that's running second in Cup 3. But so many of the teams and sponsors run cars across the various classes, traditionally, particularly teams like Avia, W and S Motorsport, with one race livery. So True. sometimes you get a little flash, it's a red and white car, what is it? And that's what you're trying to work out, and quickly. So onto the Dottinger Hur will go the race leader now, who is Torsten Kratz, bronze rated, but most mainly considered to be one of the one of the quickest bronze drivers that you can get your hands on if you're, for instance, an ATO rules racing crew. And many teams have used his services over the last few years. The man from München Gladbach and Kratz soon to be finishing lap eight. Surely at this point he'll make it his way into the pit lane. Pit lane if indeed he gets to the end of the dotting of whore because fuel margins will be very short indeed he must be driving on fumes at this point of an eight lap stint after that full rolling lap of just north of 24 kilometers but to go through the timing loop at the end of lap eight should be that lambo first of all and he'll dive straight into the pits Whoa. so does does make it does lead lap eight and then we'll wait to see who will be next through. But you think it'll be the early stoppers, which does make sense because they be could four spend and six. And yeah. They're running at the moment in that order. Tim Heinemann in the number four Falcon Motorsport uh, Porsche, seven and a half seconds clear of Hubert Hout, who's in the number six Mercedes. That was started by Ralph Aron. Hubert was one of the few drivers who was changed to 
uh, in the opening stint. A lot of the drivers doing a double stint to start this race, but uh, just taking a look, you know what, that uh, Conrad Lamborghini gained about 20 seconds in sector three, the longest, uh, the second longest of the sectors, but it, I think it got lucky with the slow zone as well, because why would it suddenly be 20 seconds faster when he's nursing the car, but he probably can't press the throttle the whole way, so if someone comes bearing a gift, you don't... Uh, say no thank you very much I'm busy you grab it and that could be a massive swing in their favor but uh, Torsten Kratz interesting to see if I think will he do a double stint will he go straight back out again or will he hand over to uh, to his teammate Danny Sufi young American racer who's uh, really enjoying his visits to the Nürburgring the other thing of course is I'm trying to remember its road position as Tim Shearbart made the gravel trap surely Shearbart wasn't ahead of the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini on, on the road at the time my only thought there is that, of course, then if, if it was behind the affected area, it would have had to have gone through that code 60 maybe three times, and then you buy back so much fuel mileage because a significant chunk of the racetrack, even now, is slowed to this 60 kilometers per hour. And maybe some clever bods on the wall have worked out at Conrad that, that that's going to buy you back enough fuel. Exactly my, my thought, and they did, and uh, certainly... So we don't get a cut to Porsche leading no. the race because traditionally they would come in on this lap having led it because everybody else would have pitted after in the, SP, in the front running SP9 class would have pitted after a maximum of seven laps. But uh, by dint of getting all the way around the pits with eight racing laps, Torsten Kratz, Conrad Motorsport, they wanted another cameo role. They've got it. Now, what will this, how will this unfold for them? Of course, coming in after eight laps, it means their first pit stop is going to be very long indeed. That will drop them right True. down. But yes. come the end, of course, the advantage will come their way. But what uh, the two drivers will have to do that is uh, drive out of their skins. Danny Sufi and Torsten Kratz. Torsten has done most of his racing in the P3 class, hasn't he? In the sort of Michelin Le Mans Cup and uh, across the winter. And in fact, Danny Sufi, there was a, a prototype winter series that, down in Spain and Portugal, and he was the champion in that for Conrad Motorsport. Okay. And there was a, a, a winter GT series and a winter GT4 series. So for a lot of crews, no rest. Uh, not the worst place to spend uh, weekends in the winter down in Spain and Portugal. No, that's true. And then further afield, as you and I have covered, races like the Dubai 24 hours, the Abu Dhabi 6 hours, and the Qatar 18, 12 kilometers. Uh, it, it's the perfect place to go racing in the Middle East because temperatures are somewhat cooler in the months of December, January, February and March and uh, more difficult to race in that part of the world when we get to the heat of the summer where it can be easily 40 degrees, sometimes just into the 50s, amazingly enough. So uh, not a place to be motor racing in the Northern Hemisphere summer, but there's scope certainly to, to continue your racing all year round these days, certainly getting a race uh, in every month of the year, which was never the case 30 odd years ago. So the new driver into the Conrad Motorsport Huracan is Danny Sufi, no longer, of course, the race leader, having been in that, the pits for a significant amount of time. The same goes for many of the Cup 2 runners as well and there's been a driver change in the 103 Cup 2 car, for instance, because uh, Mustafa Mehmet Kaya takes charge of the 103 entry from Black Falcon. So Tobias Muller did the opening stint, Mike Sturzberg still to come, but Kaya will be in for this second of probably four stints in that category as the 127 car now darts into pit road and car 127 running eighth in cup two. So that is Thiago Montero, who shares with Tom Coronel and Yap, Yap, Jan Yap Van Roon. So some uh, touring car legends, certainly within that car, number 127 from Max Cruiser Racing. And a very brief splash in Formula One for Thiago Montero as well. What, <laughs> what are the joys? about having an enormous field of cars. In fact, we've not got one, we've got two enormous fields of cars, one for Saturday's race and a fairly similar but not identical field for day. Today, you start, you print out the entry list or scroll down on the screen and scroll down and scroll down and some names you miss, you go, how did I miss that? Then you look back and find a lot of drivers really don't go onto the entry list until race morning. There's a lot of uh, sort of bartering. So I'm wondering if Tiago is about to try and build up his uh, GT racing career as well and running the Porsche Cup 2 class in a bad place to do it but sharing with uh, Tom Coronel and uh, another Dutch racer Jan Jaap van Roon but Tom will keep them all on their toes one of the most entertaining oh, yeah. people Tom and Tim Coronel just so so 
It's always have a smile on their face, always a joke to be had, but very, very quick across a large number of decades. They've had fantastic racing careers. Of course, their father used to, used to compete long before them and used to run a Mazda, a rotary engine Mazda. And it was the car when you, I was a, used to be a journalist. Sitting in the press room at Spa Francorchamps, he thought, I don't want to wish bad luck on anyone, but could that car retire? The head splitting sound it would make as it went up <laughs> to La Source and then turned around and came the other side of the press room. You think, I'm trying to get some sleep for 10 minutes or at least lie down with my eyes closed. But you could tell where it was on the circuit from any point on the circuit. And then, of course, we know full well you know, that the famous Mazda Rotary sounds around the mall that uh, still, I think, in their own way, haunt both Toyota and Nissan. They spent so many years and so many yen trying to win the Le Mans 24 hours. And in comes plucky Mazda, has a good crack at one, and then suddenly, oh my gosh, they've only gone and done it. 1991, famous year for them with that phenomenal win. It really was. And uh, it's nice that on the various anniversaries of years ending in one, often the Mazda comes back and you're reminded of quite how noisy the rotary engine is once again. It's uh, another worldly sound. You know, you get accustomed to the sort of the range of engine sounds, and that's just from somewhere else entirely. Just caught sight of the Click Versicherungs team, and there's been a driver change there with Robin Chers Cherzanovsky, who did the opening stint out, and Kirsten Yodexnis now in, the Hanover based driver. So 119 uh, is again in the mix within Cup 2, but that will drop it back. So we have a timing screen at the moment, which is topped by the number seven Lamborghini Huracan and the 103 Cup 2 car in second. But that's all now changed, remember, because of the latest pit stops and the cars that are on their ninth lap and are safely through at the end of sector three. Tim Heinemann, who now leads the race for Falcon Motorsports in the number four Porsche. So that's the two tone Falcon Blue with the red door mirrors 911 ahead of Hubert Haupt in his Mercedes, which has not had the refresh of the wrap overnight, if you like, it's a different car for the 14, but the six car has kept the same Yokohama uh, advertising on the side of it. And car number six, driven by Hubert Haupt, running in second position on the road. Then it should be Kevin Estra pitting a couple of laps later in the 9-1-1. And after that, Martin Raginger, who was installed in the number three Falcon Motorsports Porsche during their first stop. Yeah, I, th I think the, the, the crux there is obviously Heinemann and Haug made that early pit stop after five laps. They're nearly 10 seconds apart. But the interesting thing for me, only eight seconds behind Hubert Haug is Kevin Estra. So he's not only he took time out of them as he pulled clear in the opening stint. Now he's catching certainly Hubert Haug in the second one. And for him, he's got an advantage of over 10 seconds back to the, sorry, I've missed out Martin Ragging at nine seconds back to the next car in the line. Fourth in uh, SP9 class members is the second second of the Falcon Motorsports uh, Porsches and in behind, very close behind him, two and a bit seconds further back, Danny Junkadea. So the Hout Racing team, this stint is not quite shaping up as well as it is for the Falcon crew. So they're, they're, they're first and potentially up into third, I would suggest, which is the sister car. Yeah. Uh, but we'll have to keep our eye on the, the battle between Estra, Ragginger, Junkadea and Van der Linde. Uh, but particularly those cars that pitted after seven laps, yes, and then this little gaggle separately. But as you say, maybe Hubert Haupt hasn't, it hasn't quite worked out quite as well for the number six Mercedes as it has for the number four Porsche. But we'll wait and see. I would think Tim Heinemann will, should be able to hold on to that roughly 10 second lead. Let's just have a look at the second splits. Actually, Hubert took a bit of time out of Tim Heinemann through sector two. They were very even through sector three. And now back onto the Dottinger Hoare will go Tim Heinemann in the number four Porsche. And it's now maybe as much as 12 or 13 seconds, the gap back to Hubert Haupt in second position. Estra goes through for the Manti EMA Porsche at 303.7 through sector four. So that's very similar speed to Tim Heinemann. And in fourth place is Martin Ragginger, followed closely followed by Daniel Junkadea and Vel Van der Linde, actually. So those three cars, Ragginger, Junkadea and Van der Linde, Porsche, Mercedes, Lamborghini, will be pretty much nose to tail. 
Yes, at no point, if, you, if you're looking at a timing screen, can you draw the full picture. You're thinking, Hubert Howard, oh, he's, he's actually closing in again. But, uh, OK, right, across the start-finish line comes Tim Heineman to get nine racing laps on the board, waiting to see how far behind Hubert Howard will be. He ought to be the next the front runners coming through. He will be quite shortly, but 10.7, uh, so it was going out. It looked as though Hubert Howard was calling, hauling it back. But what, unless you're looking at the cars on screen, you have no idea where they're meeting the traffic. And, of course, we are having these fluster uh, over little slow zones. And in fact, th th that lap for them was uh, just under nine minutes. Bear in mind the fastest lap of the race is uh, seven minutes, 58, low 58. So uh, certainly with a few zo slow zones, it obscures the picture, but nothing can obscure the fact that it looks so. Tim Heineman, who didn't compete yesterday, he's moved into the number four crew. There's still a question about whether Nico Mensel will be back on board that car because he was okay. due to stand down. Uh, to make way for Tim Heineman. And for Falcon Motorsports, they often have a cluster of drivers. They'll have eight drivers competing in the Nürburgring 24 hours. They have four in each of their cars, each of their Porsche 911 GT3 hours. But uh, they do like to shuffle them through the season. Don't, don't let anyone get comfortable with the drive. No, uh, mm. Coming next weekend, why bother? You know, we've got other people, you know, <laughs> move along, care and share. But um, I'll wait to see on this lap uh, what the pace is between them. But Tim Heineman putting a really, really good stint. The last few years, uh, his, his career has really, really picked up the young German and um, you'd expect you know and certainly Hubert Haupt has rather more candles on his birthday cake born in 1969 <laughs> yes but the other thing is you know there's a full season of potentially for Falcon Motorsports to be competing in the NLS they've also got qualifying weekend in less than six days time um, to look forward to and then the N24 as well and you're going to be looking at probably a four driver lineup for each of the cars for N24 oh, so it's important to cycle through you know as many drivers as possible this weekend uh, in order to get some practice in not not least just the qualifying of drivers is important but you know track time and in these very pleasant conditions is so valuable when we get to the big events at the end of May. 100% and if you're new to this form of racing, long distance racing on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, and we try and do it in every single weather format you could possibly have through the course of a 12 month period, but uh, we do know up in the mountains it can get cool, it can get wet, you are up high here in, in southwestern Germany, but uh, for the manufacturers, it's hugely important. This is a fabulous shop window, but for the tire manufacturers who can produce the rubber that hopefully works in as many of these weather and track conditions as possible, that is why it's such a draw. That is why Falcon Tires have spent a considerable amount of money over the past decade running teams, various different makes of cars. A couple of years ago, they ran a BMW and a Porsche just to keep things different this is a phenomenal testing environment for them and you can be sure their race rubber which a lot of series run uniquely yep. or entirely um, you know they, they gain the benefit from this but Falcon is the only manufacturer who put their name on the team we have lots of other teams with full liveries like the Hout Racing team with the full Yokohama Advan livery on, on at least one of their cars uh, today, both of them yesterday, but Falcon Motorsport, they really have nailed their, their colours to, to this particular mast. And uh, actually, on, on yesterday's evidence, when they won with one of their cars, could have won with the other one as well. And today, we could have a couple of them up on the podium. But what we learnt or were reminded of was the fact you, you can't count your chickens until they've, uh, until they've uh, come home to roost. And certainly for the number three car, side-by-side -side contact, looked as though the race was in bag, drive through penalty, and then it didn't make it to the finish. So uh, a flurry that went the wrong way for them. But uh, you'd have to say they've had a good meeting so far. Can they make it for two from two? Yeah, I suppose the great thing about Falcon bringing two cars, they were in the top two when disaster struck for one of them. So, you know, uh, it, as one drops away, the other was able to inherit the lead. And it looked at one point maybe that, that Falcon would rescue the situation and finish 1-3, and then Picariello had his contact with the Frank Stripler driven Phoenix Audi. And we assume, as a result of that contact, that uh, just around the next few corners, standard, uh, it was Breitscheid mm. where the car sto slowed to a stop, and Picariello, quick thinking, thought, well, there's a gap here for me to stop safely and for the marshals to push it uh, into a safe location. And that's where it stopped and went no further. Martin Raginger doing a good job in the number three car today, though in his traditional slot of being second driver. It remains to be seen whether Picariello will take it over at the end of this stint and then all the way to the finish. So again, doing stints one, three and four, which makes it uh, a busy couple of days for Alessio Picariello. 
how is Danny Sufi doing, I hear you ask, in the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini? Well, he came through at the end of lap nine in seventh position. Remember, that was a 12 and a half minute race lap because it incorporated the three or so minutes he spent in pit lane. But they are definitely still there or thereabouts and roughly about halfway around this 10th lap of the race. We're at just after 20 past one in the afternoon. So that means two hours and 37 minutes remain of the 63rd edition of the ADAC Reinaldus Langstreck and Renan. It's round two of the NLS for season 2024, live right here on RS1. Yeah, and just to give you a little bit of perspective, uh, of course, the later you make your first pit stop, the longer it has to be. And the gap between Danny Sufi and the next car up the line, Danny Sufi and the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini is in seventh. He's uh, at the last time he split, uh, getting close to 100 seconds, nearly one minute, 40 seconds behind Kelvin van der Linde. In a Lamborghini run by Red Bull Team Ad, but that's an Evo 2. The Conrad Motorsport car is an Evo 1. It's an older car, but they would, had a much, much longer first pit stop and commensurate by doing eight racing laps, which is really quite extraordinary for the opening stint, because that has to include the formation lap. You know, they've managed to do that. Their final pit stop is going to be super, super short they just lost too much time. I don't think there is actually the, the full pace in their car. And, no. uh, well, as I said beforehand, their fastest lap is an 8 minute 7.2. Fastest lap of the race is uh, best part of 9 seconds faster. 8.5 seconds faster. So they're not sort of running on the ultimate pace, but they've rolled the dice. I was quite... I was, uh, and I think they really worked out, as you pointed out, Johnny, it was the fact that they worked out they've been enough slow zone for them to have not been running at full throttle and just bought themselves an extra lap. Could have gone horribly wrong. Who knows if they were in on fumes as they came out of the final corner and drifted into the pit lane, but uh, it was both. It may nip them further up the order, but I still think there's too much of a gap between the top six cars in terms of their lap by lap performance and the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. Well, However, they're running in the SP9 Pro-Am class, the second true, in that class, so true, that's yes. maybe where they're looking for. I think, unfortunately, the thing that's cost them on this lap is that they've hit a yellow flag area at Kloster Tal. There's also something happening at Hoek Eichen as well. So if you look at the sector three times, all of a sudden it's gone from 156 for Van der Linde to 2 minutes and 13 seconds for Danny Sufi. There was a big gap between the, set, the sixth and seventh placed cars, and that's unfortunately where this yellow zone, this drama, whatever it is, has hit. And it all of a sudden takes 20 seconds away from your sector time. Um, and that's so often what can happen. You know, a yellow a yellow zone, a code 60 can play in your favor hugely. And then on the very next lap, it is slowing you down significantly as the number four race leading Tim Heinemann driven Falcon Porsche heads into Hohenrein for the 10th time. A little bit further down the Dottinger Hoare comes the sister car of Martin Ragginger trying to chase down the Manti machine of Kevin Estra. Danny Junkadea tucked in behind. Oh, there's been a change there because van der Linde's now ahead of Danny Junkadea. Lamborghini overtaking Mercedes. Yeah, used the slipstream very, very nicely. And in fact, for, for the drivers, as we've got uh, yellow flags at various points, they weren't confronted with them because uh, race leader Tim Heinemann, eight minute, three second lap. That's what we call a quick bot without uh, uh, any slow zones for him. Eight minutes, 4.9 for the driver in second place, which is, of course, uh, Hubert Howe. Kevin Estra, though, <clears throat> eight minutes, 1.4. 8 minutes 1.3 for Kelvin van der Linde. That's why they're gaining ground. But certainly Kelvin, we mentioned that Kevin Estra was starting to take chunks out of Hubert House. He's uh, 5.7 seconds down. He's really closed that margin down. Bear in mind that the, the, the opening pit stop for the first two cars, for the number four, Falcon Motorsport Porsche, and the number six, uh, Hout Racing Team Mercedes. What did I say? They were 45 seconds they gained by coming in early. And for Kevin Estra, he's having none of that. He's within 17 seconds of the race leader. So he's done done the hard yards now, pushing very, very hard indeed. But uh, I must say, be very impressed with uh, the team Abt Lamborghini. Didn't have the mm. ultimate pace. It sort of was trying to hang on to the, the five car pack at the front of the field. It was running sick, getting in close when they got slightly obstructed when it was in clean running. It didn't seem to have the ultimate pace, but actually it settled down very, very well in the hands, running fourth at the moment in the hands of actually fifth, I beg your pardon, 
in the hands of Kelvin van der Linde, but the South African, well, he's done many things, uh, great things, particularly since he moved up to compete in Germany, but that car's sort of coming coming on more and more, but Team Amps haven't been running this car for years. A lot of their rival uh, teams here have been running their particular mounts for quite a few seasons, and as I say, yeah. if you're competing here through pretty much every weather form as well, so they, they should be on top of them. Well, there's lots happening out on the racetrack now, and this is serving to slow down the lap times significantly. First of all, Hoch Eichen is now the scene of a Code 60, which is precisely where Tim Heinemann is now. Hoch Eichen is the latter part of Hatzenbach, and before you get to Kittelbacher Hoor, which runs on to, well, around the Flugplatz area, but also the exit of Carousel, and the run-up to Hoa Act now have slow zones in place as well. Heinemann darting his way out of this latest Code 60 then at Hoheiken. He was already through that scene. In fact, the track behind him is now clear. So those behind, now how close is Hubert Haupt? And more to the point, 12, Kevin Estra. Yeah, he was 12, Haupt was 12 seconds down and being caught hand over fist by Kevin Estra. They would have been given a big helping hand to get second and third much closer to race leader Heinemann. Because it really, in green flag conditions, that second sector should be taking you about 65 seconds to go through. Now Estra's done it in a, a minute and 27 as well. So the winners begin to be Danny Junkadea, and potentially Frank Meyer, who will be next through in the Glickenhaus for SPX. Danny Sufi might benefit from this as well by buying back about 10 seconds. In fact, it'll be 20 odd seconds uh, compared to Heinemann, to Haupt, and to Estra as well. So. Yeah, Fraginger in fourth place was uh, gained about six seconds in that time. Yes. Split, so the ones behind gained another five seconds on him. We're not complaining, compress the front of the field. Remember, at the start of the lap, it was a 12 second advantage for Tim Heinemann in the number four Falcon Motorsport Porsche. Let's see what it's going to be when they get to the end. They're only halfway around the slap, so you might have another another yellow flag. Espash? Oh, yes, just in front of them. So that's coming up. That has uh, been cleared. A lot of the flag get put out. They check it and all play and bring it in very, very quickly. As fast as race control can get the messages on the screen. Indeed. Uh, but I think the whole of the racetrack is now green, amazingly. There's something still maybe bleeding into the Espash area that they're perhaps dealing with at Marshall Post 162. And as I say, that Brunchen now becomes affected by yellows too, which isn't a million miles away from Espash, so it may all be the same incident but the road immediately in front of Tim Heinemann and Hubert Haupt and Kevin Estra is at least clear until they get into the longer sector four section. Mulner Motorsport running the number 124 car for Moritz Krantz and they are now the leaders in cut two so plenty of been, has been switching around within the Carrera Cup category the one make division for these Porsche GT3 Cup cars. Krantz leads by a significant chunk of nearly 13 and a half seconds over Noah Nagelsdijk in the Black Falcon Team 48 Losch car. And then it is uh, Mustafa Mehmet Kaya in the 103 running in third, ahead of Alex Brundle, up to fourth now in the Sister Mulner car. So 124 leading and 122 in fourth place. Yeah, and looking at the pace, Alex Brundle's catching uh, Mehmet Kaya quite handily again. How many helping hands do you get in terms of uh, slow zones? One may catch the other, but uh, Brundle's settling down very well. And uh, one of the things I absolutely love is, obviously with a father like Martin, Alex has been imbued in motorsport from day one. But what I love is his love of historic racing. Mm. You know, he'd have looked at cars his father raced, but also he's competing next weekend in several cars at the Goodwood members meeting, including one that was, you know, before Martin even hit the tracks. It's a special race, a fantastic race uh, coming up. The Ken Miles Cup for 19, sort of Ford Mustangs from about 1966, 30 of those. And, and Alex just gets right in among the thick of it. He's getting better and better in historic racing, but it's, it's not just the taking part, it's the absolute love of cars. Yes. It's not always absolutely clear for all drivers. They like racing them, but he appears to be one of the ones that have the full enjoyment, who enjoy the cars for what they are as well. So uh, good to have. But he's got to put a different chip in his brain. Very quick circuit at Goodwood. This is a very quick circuit too, but they could not be more different. 
Well, you have to, like you say, different chip, recalibrate the brain to, um, to to hustle a car like that around a racetrack and extract the lap time. And it's it's almost about getting the tail out as much as possible, often in the older cars, rather than these that have to be on rails, the, 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 the racing cars of the modern day. Well, well, in many ways, it's the fact the tail comes out. It's trying to control the tail and keep, keep it in. But when you look at the tyre technology that were in the 50s, the 60s, and even earlier cars, if you watch a car from behind, they've got much more depth in the tyre you can see the movement of the tyre on the rims around the corners. It's a magical thing. If people are accustomed to super stiff suspension, super stiff, sticky modern rubber, you don't get that sort of excitement. But you can really see how people are pushing it. Yeah. And so Alex and others who, who cross over. And in fact, Frank Stippler racing here yesterday. He races pretty much everything. He's become a huge star in historic racing. But, it, you know, it's a much richer environment for you. To, you Too right, You've yeah. got other things to do, but the fact they can race ancient and modern, wow, lucky, lucky individuals. Uh, but they also need the talent to back it up as well as the opportunity. Now, uh, Danny Sufi, in the number seven Conrad Motorsport car, uh, did get through that second sector of the lap far quicker than the three leaders, and I mean 21 seconds quicker. The problem is he's got about two minutes to find and 20 seconds. So he's he's back to about two minutes behind Tim Heinemann now. But of course, we're expecting this Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini to go a little further into its, well, not further into its stint, but beyond the point where the Falcon car needs to pit, for instance, and the Hubert Haupt Mercedes as well. So I still think you're right that in that Conrad won't be able to win this race necessarily, but there's got a potential for doing very well as far as the results are concerned overall. Heinemann pitting, remember, uh, early on after five laps, and Ralph Aron did the same in the four and the six Porsche and Mercedes respectively, and they are now five laps into their current stint. And this will be the sixth lap about to be completed by Tim Heinemann. So we're expecting two more after this for the number four Falcon Motorsports Porsche, and two more after this for Hubert Howard's Mercedes as well. As through goes Kelvin van der Linde, now ahead of Martin Raginger, I noticed. So one place picked up a lap ago, was it? Or two laps ago on Daniel Junkadea, and now Kelvin van der Linde should be up to fourth place, getting ahead of Martin Raginger. Yeah, as I was saying, that just seems to be, it took a while and they're finding the sweet spot. Definitely in the opening stint, it, it wasn't there for Kelvin Van der Linde. It didn't quite match the cars up in front of him, but, you know, it was getting close. Now, just going back to the fact that number four, Falker Motorsport Porsche, the number six, Hubert Hout driven uh, Hout racing team, Mercedes, will, will have to blink next and have to come in in a handful of laps. But what we see is that their show of the hand by making that early first pit stop puts them in the lead of the race. That's great. But what we forget, the one that always gets masked is the one that has uh, taken a very late pit stop. It's a much longer pit stop, drops them further back. So they seem a million miles out of it. Of course, I'm talking about the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. I don't think it's got the pace come what may, but their final pit stop will suddenly propel them back into the mix. So you get the sort of like the hair and they're the tortoise, but then yes. it will be swapped around. You know, you can, could you change roles, you two? You're now the tortoise. And, um, but oh, unfortunately, in, on the in-between bits, they don't have the ultimate pace. But, you know, it, it just keeps it interesting, keeps moving the order up and down. But certainly for the number four Porsche, the number six Mercedes, uh, for Falcon Motorsport and uh, Hout Racing Team, it's their moment in, in, in the sun, but they will be paying the price later on. Now, this is an interesting dynamic because the number six Mercedes that pitted after only five laps is battling with the Porsche of Kevin Estra, which pitted after seven. So that big advantage that Mercedes will have had for a shorter stint at the start of the race appears to have completely gone. And this may be as a result of the various incidents around the racetrack, which has enabled Estra to catch the time up again. But I do think also it's down to Kevin Estra's raw speed. It is. I mean, he was chipping away lap after lap he was going to catch him as i said he should have been by coming to that first pit stop uh, two laps after the first two cars made theirs he had about 45 seconds to gain he had an advantage before so let's call it 40 seconds between friends but he's uh, trimmed it right down he's only 14 seconds down on the race leading car so so Estra's done another phenomenal job. That will just be keeping uh, Lawrence Van Tour on his tiptoes in the pit lane. Because he'll take over to do stints three and four, but uh, certainly it's another really strong sprint. The stint around the Nordschleife for Mantai EMA with their Porsche and especially for Kevin Estra. This second stint has been mighty. He's, his advantage over the best of the rest, that's Kelvin van der Linde now, who's been gaining those two positions, as Johnny mentioned. He's in the uh, number 27 Lamborghini, entered by Red Bull Team Abt. 
his lap times, in fact, he took a great chunk last time, took eight and a half seconds out of Kevin Estra, but that's with the assist of where the yellow uh, slower zones have been. But uh, lap after lap, I'd suggest Kevin just has a little bit in hand. But for the first two, they're paying the price for that early pit stop. Their next pit stop again will be two laps ahead of their rivals. Uh, by and large, but uh, certainly this is a really strong stint. So Mansi Irme, second yesterday behind the number four Porsche, have every chance of uh, taking the lead in this race sometime soon, but certainly he'll have picked off Hubert Howard for second on the road. Yeah. Well, two tenths a second. Two tenths was the gap as they began this lap, but uh, five or so seconds picked up by Kevin Estra as the Mulder car now about to cross the line. So that is still Moritz Krantz leading cut two in car number 124. And what will the gap be back to Noah Nadelsteek? I didn't see Noah Wasn't it leaving Hohenrein, no. So it'll be a fair while yet. He is on the dotting of Hoare, but he lost three seconds alone through the penultimate sector. 14, Just across the line now. 14 seconds, the gap between first and second in Cup 2. That is very tidy for Mulder Motorsport. Black Falcon team cars second and third, and Mulder Motorsport in fourth. So they're right there. Now, new slow zone upgraded to code 60 at uh, Marshall Post. 180, that's Schwabenschwanz. You're pretty much towards the end of the lap before the cars get to Galvin Kopp from coming off the dotting of Hurt. So I don't know who has made it a slow zone, but uh, down to code 60. That means code 60 kilometers an hour, maximum speed through there. So hit the speed limiters, and for everyone there, your lap time is going to go north at that particular point. And elsewhere in Cup 2, after Nagelsteek crossed the line, it's Alex Brundle up to third now, and that's because Mehmet Kaya pitted in the number 103 Black Falcon car. Then it's the Renatso Motorsport machine of Kiki Saknana in the 786 Lamborghini Huracan, and then the Halder driven and indeed run Cup 2 car number 117 still just about hanging on to fifth, although yet to complete lap 11 of the race. M. Halder's going well today. M. Halder, yes. Uh, that's a convenient way of putting it because uh, unfortunately our screen doesn't tell us any more about uh, which of the siblings is currently driving it. Tim Heinemann in the long sector once again. There are still yellow flags uh, arriving at various points around the circuit every time we a short sentences about them and they're not it seems like they clear almost as soon as they've arrived the so Schwabenschwanz entry and indeed exit is now clear now at the start of this lap there's just two tenths of a second between Kevin Estra in third place and Hubert Hout in second just noticing the fastest of the middle sector of anybody on this last lap would be Kevin Estra in which he took um, nearly 15 seconds he's obviously got past uh, Hubert Hout but Hubert must have had a problem. We've got to look out. Where is that number six Mercedes? Because uh, he went through that sector three out of the five sectors in two minutes 12. Whereas giving chase and having passed him, Kevin Estra went through in one minute 56. And so all the other cars in the top six were under two minutes through there, but two minutes 12 for Hubert Howard. So just looking for any messages left, right, up and down, see why. Uh, the German was so much slower in the number six Mercedes for his own team, for Hout Racing Team. Unless that's, that. unless that's a problem, of course, I can't see any yellow flags necessarily in that third sector. That no, I'm, fearing, slowed I'm him down. fearing it's a problem. Yeah. So Heinemann still should be out front. But remember, you know, that's only a 13 second gap between Heinemann and Hout at the start of the lap. So consider that Heinemann to Estra being very similar and Estra looking to close the gap on a a car that will be running at a similar speed, you would think, to his. It's the same balance of performance as Martin Raginger now heading towards Flansgarten on this 12th lap and can't head into the throttle quite as early as he would have liked to because there was a slower BMW right on the racing line there. Manuel Metzger, who leads SB8T in the team Bill Stein, Black Falcon, BMW M4, GT4 has just put in the best lap within 8T in the number 150 car, and he's right in the mix of actually Cup 2 as well. Would, would he be, he'd be eighth place in, in Cup 2 if he was running a Porsche, but they're looking to try and win the SP8T class and uh, potentially outpace all the SP10s in, this, in today's race as well. There's Tim Heinemann onto the Dottinger Hoare. And how far away is Kevin Estra? I would wager he is in second place, by the way, Estra, to confirm that. 
and I would wager it's less than 13, 14 seconds now, the gap from first to second. Yeah, and no sign at all of, uh, we've got the top five cars, or five cars have completed sector four on this lap, which is lap number 12, but unfortunately the car number six, we said Hubert Howard has a slow third sector, has not made it to the end of sector four, so has he pulled off again looking for screen messages, but this was a car that was running second by Dinton, making an early pit stop, really good opening stint by Ralph Aron, but whatever, as Tim Heinemann goes on to another lap, his advantage, we'll see how big it is over Kevin Estra, there is no sign, it looks so stopped at the side of the track, Hubert Howe, car number six, one of the two Mercedes from his team, that was the one on the Yokohama tyres, and uh, the sister car number 14 swapped overnight, and they went from Yokohama to uh, running Michelin tyres on the yellow and blue Mercedes, but the black and red one, we've got one running slowly, no, oh, okay, maybe it's got going again, but just looking, waiting to see the number six Mercedes, still hasn't come to complete. It's got through sector four, but lost a, it lost 12, 15 seconds in sector three, best part of uh, 25 seconds in sector four, but the Yokohama car is coming home down the Dottinger Herb, but one feels that might just be popping into the pits. Yeah, certainly something up with that, but it's not a puncture. I expected it to, uh, to be arriving on the scene with one of its Yokohama tires down, but that is not the issue. So whether it's drivetrain or engine related, it's going to turn right and into pit road. So this at the end of lap 12, and that will make it only a six lap stint. Seven lap stint. Seven lap stint, yes, for Hubert House. So they, if they can cure the issue during the pit stop, they can weave this in too easily within their strategy, but lots of time lost on that lap, and that will be the biggest concern. It's a minute lost to everybody else on a single racing lap. So five laps at the start for starting driver Ralph Aron, and then a seven lap stint for Hubert Haupt. Everybody else though, of the key runners, staying out on the racetrack for lap 13. And actually the gap first to second was bigger than I had anticipated. It was about 13 seconds around the lap. It's 18 and a half seconds between Tim Heinemann and Kevin Estra, helped by the fact that Heinemann has just done the fastest time of that number four car. So a personal best for car four, 7.58.6. And Frank Myers doing a decent lap time as well in the Glickenhaus. Its fastest lap of the race so far is at 8.03.2 in seventh position. Yeah, shaving a, a few tenths off the previous lap. This was a car that was struggling to get at below eight minutes 10 yesterday. So a couple of eight minutes threes, that is a very good news in, indeed for the Glickenhaus crew running seventh overall. But uh, we've got to see is it going to be a quick pit stop for Hubert Howes or is it going to be pushed back into the pit garage? We've got to keep an eye out, but as Johnny pointed out, slowed by the best part of a minute over the course of lap number 12. Ordinarily could have run an extra lap to come in after 13, but clearly something wrong with that number six out racing team Mercedes. Uh, we'll try and wait and let you, and find out and let you know what it is because that was the car running second by dint of having a very early f first pit stop. And now with the front runners, it's the first of them to come in for the second time around. Nearly quarter to two in the afternoon. It's day two of a fabulous festival here at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer, the second NLS race of the season. The 63rd edition of the ADAC, Ryan Aldous, Langstrick and Rennen, and it's Porsche that lead for Falcon Motorsports.
Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social-Media-Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. seconds they'll gain quite about half of that back but the laps in between not quite the same beautiful weather conditions at the Nürburgring Nordschleife for the second of a couple of NLS races to kick off the 2024 season and we have a real dice on at the moment between two Porsche key teams Falcon Motorsports on their own rubber Manta EMA on the Michelins for Kevin Estra and Estra's not very far away from handing the car over to Laurence Van Torre. He'll do that, I would have thought, in the next 15 minutes or so. Kelvin van der Linde's been a real star, though, during these opening couple of stints as well, with the 27 Lamborghini Huracan from Red Bull Team at steadily picking his way through the order. He overtook Danny Junkadea on one lap, and then within a couple of laps out after that, Martin Raginger was in his draft. So the Lambo up to third, five seconds away from Kevin Estra and actually last time through was marginally quicker than the Frenchman by half a second. Very, very slim margins, of course, around an eight minute lap. But tricky to tell who's going to be in the best spots towards the half distance marker. Falcon Motorsports, I'm sure if you'd given them a 20 odd second lead, though, at half distance would have snapped your hand off before this uh, this event today. One thing we learn over the years covering the Nürburgring Langstrack and Siri is the fact you can never think it's going to be a clean run to the finish. I mean, that last lap was an example. Kevin Estra, lap after lap through this second stint, had been catching Tim Heinemann, and then suddenly, one sector a whole lot slower just got the wrong side of a slow zone or whatever and uh, he, five harder seconds were ejected and suddenly he's not 13 seconds behind he's 18 seconds behind around the first part of this lap he he lost eight tenths of a second he lost in fact he's losing out around this lap and again just wind the clock back to yesterday. What were we talking about with Falcon Motorsports? When do their tyres seem to really have uh, their biggest advantage? Well, where's their sweet spot? It's towards the end of a stint, and Falcon Motorsport precisely are approaching that ground. At the end of this lap, it'll be an eight-lap uh, run from the previous pit stop, and expect our race leader, Tim Heinemann, to come in in the number four car. But then Kevin Estra from Anti-EMA will go on for another two laps. Yeah. And so his tyres are, you know, got a bit more life in them right now. But I say Tim Heinemann's doing a really, really good job. Gains a little bit, lose a little bit. But actually on this lap, again, I think he's going to extend. But then again, he's going to call at the pits. So he'll be True. at a standstill when the Frenchman comes flying past. And that's exactly what he's just done, in fact, into pit road for the race leader. Falcon Motorsports portion number four. Estra, who's on the Dottinger Hoa, so will burst out from the Hohenrein chicane very shortly indeed. And, as you say, will not need to stop for a couple more laps. So he puts six on the stint now, going over the line and to the lead of the race. And the Lamborghini of Kelvin van der Linde pitted on the same lap as Estra as well. So van der Linde, a double stint. His first stint came to an end at uh, lap seven. So we're expecting him to be able to go on to lap 15, or the end of lap 15, before he needs a bit more fuel. And presumably they'll switch drivers at that point as well to Jordan Pepper. Now we've got a slow, or in fact stopped car, just ahead of Kelvin van der Linde's Lamborghini. It's going to get going again. It's a BMW that stopped between the Mercedes Arena and the Horseshoe on the Grand Prix track. New race leader, though, is Kevin Estra in the number 911 Manti Grello livery Porsche. And in behind, Kelvin van der Linde, unaffected by that stranded BMW. They will have to be wary of it, and I'm sure there were white flags being shown. They weren't in a position to need to be overtaking anyway, other than the stricken car, which you're allowed to do, of course. And in third position now, up to third, comes Martin Raginger because of his teammate pitting at the end of lap uh, 13. Yeah, Martin just losing a little bit of ground on that lap to, to Kelvin van der Linde. He's only 2.6 seconds back, so still very close indeed. The reason one can say that is because you never know which way the seesaw is going to tip in this in this event on this circuit. As we've just seen on the previous lap, Kevin Estra suddenly lost five seconds. His chase was uh, spiked. The five seconds he'd worked so hard to gain 
don't forget he was chasing after Hubert Howard. Hubert's Mercedes made it back to the pits, a lap ahead of when it naturally would have come in to make its pit stop, but it's still there. So it's still listed as sixth, but it's going to go running down the order. Now it happens because Frank Meyer's uh, Glickenhaus has now moved ahead. Because of course, if the, the Houghton car is going nowhere, everybody else will pick it off as it sits in the pit lane in the pit garage. But uh, at least for the Houghton Racing Team, they've got two cars in the race. Danny Junkadea, multiple champion in the uh, GT cars, is uh, running in fifth place in the sister car. That's the yellow and blue one today. That means it's uh, running different car, different tyres. No longer is it running Yokohama. So today they're out to play on Michelin's at the moment. And those are the tyres, of course, same make of tyres on the Porsche of Manti EMA. That's the car that's giving chase around the course this lap. Losing ground to Tim Heidemann. Oh, sorry, that's a, Tim Heidemann sitting in the pit, so forget that, of course. Uh, in Cup 3, the 962 Avia car that uh, made the slight error yesterday is still out front, number 962. So Dowgard leading Cruiser in the 930 car for Adrenaline Motorsport Team. And it's Smerlis Racing, number 952, running as the third placed of the one make uh, Porsche 718 Cayman category. So, yeah, coming back from adversity yesterday, Lucas Dowgard uh, beginning, I think, in that car. Did they put him in for a double, or was it Bednarski who started 962? I forget now, but I, I would imagine Moritz Oberheim will be being kept back for the closing stint, or closer to the chequered flag, as the 680 BMW goes through the cut through there. Fifth place in the 240Is. So the class is still led by number 650, which is the Sven Market driven car. But we, for the moment, are concentrating on Daniel Dorschuk in 680, running fifth, as I say, in 240i. Again, a very well subscribed category. Today we started with eight of those BMWs. Yeah, I make it eight at the moment with uh, 674. Interestingly, being driven by, at the moment, David Schumacher, Ralph Schumacher's son, sharing with Pierre Lemaitre. And uh, it was David Schumacher who struggled yesterday in quality. They didn't get the car out for qualifying, I don't think. No, what happened, the problem there was uh, that the car he was entered in yesterday uh, it was too high a performance car for his... Uh his license, his permit for the ring, so he had to change over and drive, drive a different car entirely. So, uh, on your toes, as you were, Schumacher, so mm. you could uh, get on and get out there and learn. But uh, again, now I'm just looking at some timing splits. So, by the way, um, Joel Erickson has taken over again in the number four Porsche. He started that car, handed over to Tim Heinemann, and handed back to him in, in very good form. But of course, he will no longer be leading the race. He's had that second pit stop while all his rivals will come in to serve theirs. But their pit stops are be necessarily a tiny bit shorter than this. So you really, you know, do pay the price for an early pit stop. You get the advantage, you get the lead of the race, the track space. But then with every subsequent pit stop, you get, you get it taken out from under your feet. But most notably, the final pit stop. The closer to the end of the final hour, the fourth hour that you pit, the shorter your pit stop will come. By about what we say yesterday is between it's about two and a half seconds per minute difference across two minutes difference it's five seconds so yeah the closer you can squeak at the end just think conrad motorsport when you go into that particular equation but maybe they don't have to push so hard and take the risk because they came here to try and win the sp9 pro-am class they're leading it and because the the lead rival in that oh has now just exited the pits just as i wrote retired on my notes the number six mercedes gets going again and dennis fetzer is the driver who, who gets to be the third driver in that car. Started by Ralph Aron, it was right in the mix, was uh, in fourth place when it made uh, that early first pit stop. Then the Hubert Howe, whatever the problem is, hopefully fully fixed, but uh, Dennis Fetzer out in the number six car and it's fallen outside the top 10. Listed as 13, in fact, maybe slightly further down the order than that, just waiting for a few more cars to come through. That's been about 11 and a half minutes in the pits, though, uh, because the sector, the third sector time of the lap that's theoretically just been completed by Hubert Haupt slash Dennis Fetzer has taken 12 minutes and 20 seconds. It should normally take you 50 seconds, so that's where I get my 11 and a half minutes from. Um, so clearly that wasn't, it wasn't a tyre issue. Uh, they wanted to get the car out again, ideally, but I'm sure they were... The, the first bit of the pit stop was just assessing exactly what had gone wrong there and uh, how easy it was going to be to fix it. 
the BMW 318Ti Cup car has come into pit lane. This is the 275 car, and it was one of the Mullers that brought that in, which is Mark David Muller, sharing with Christopher Groth and Anthony Becker, uh, Alexander Becker, I should say, 275. It's an SP3 runner, so that car currently being serviced. As we concentrate back again on the sharp end of the field with Joel Erickson rejoining. So the new race leader, as we've mentioned, is Kevin Estra from Kelvin van der Linde. They were separated by only four seconds towards the start of the lap, and it's maybe opened up slightly more than that. But uh, van der Linde still has visuals on the bright yellow and green or Grello, if you prefer, Manti livery Porsche. And also on the dotting of Hoor at the same time is Martin Ragginger in the teal door mirrored Falcon Motorsports uh, uh, Porsche 911. Yeah, if anything, I actually sense that maybe Kelvin van der Linde has uh, just uh, gained a half a second or so, but he's got a, the whole way of the Nottingham herd. They've got other cars that aren't traveling at their speed. They can get close, get a bit of a slipstream, then slip on past, but I um, don't know who, who actually gained and lost on that, but Kevin Estra, you know what? Oh, quite fancy a cooling drink. Oh, I'll dive into the pit. So there we are. We've got uh, 14 laps going on the board. That's the 911 car doing a seven lap opening stint followed by a seven lap second stint i still reckon the rivals could go on further but uh, yesterday your theory was that the, the the manti team like a seven lap average but i think that at the time was adjusted simply because who was around them and yeah. the number six mercedes back into the sorry what am i talking about the number 14 mercedes into the pits that's danny Uncadea, not too far behind so they too have gone with a seven lap opening stint plus of course the formation lap by a seven lap racing stint to complete the first half of the race in fact we've got a few more seconds we'll be at the two hour mark in this four hour opener so the the, the race is now led again by lamborghini huracan uh, for the second time but not for the second time for car 27 remember we had a lap led by the number seven lambo from conrad motorsport but i think this is definitely deserved for Kelvin van der Linde's opening couple of stints. He's done plenty of overtaking along the way. Didn't need to overtake Kevin, uh, Kevin Estra because he came in to pit lane. But that's fascinating for me that Manti are choosing not to run the full eight laps. Instead, they'd like a slightly shorter pit stop because of the shorter stint coming into it. And will they remain at seven lap stints all the way to the finish? Or will there be an eight thrown in there for good measure as well at some point? There's no doubt about Red Bull Team Act's approach, though. They want to run as long into the stint as the fuel, fuel tank will allow, and Martin Ragging is doing exactly the same thing. So the, the new top two, Van der Linde and Ragginger, with in third position, Joel Eriksson should be in the number four car because Danny Junkader came in at the end of lap 14 as well. So the pattern of play for the Ravenol livery, the yellow and blue, Mercedes has been seven laps, followed by seven laps for Danny Junkadea. And I'm expecting a driver change there as well to hand over to Frank Bird. That's exactly two hours done now as well. So we are at the hour of two o'clock with still 120 minutes of this race still to run. It feels slightly more open than yesterday with uh, one or two adjustments maybe done overnight. I, the Mercedes, again, seems to be able to qualify well, locking out the front row earlier this morning and it hasn't taken long for the six car to hit problems. But the number 14 going, maybe it's slightly its own way on strategy or at least echoing the Manti thoughts that seven plus seven, perhaps all the way to the finish is the way to win this race. But what I'm really impressed with is the improvement on speed of the Lamborghini Huracan. I still don't think it's quite quick enough to win this race on pure pace, but there's no doubt that van der Linde is enjoying himself out on the racetrack at the moment. And there's no doubt there'll be no drop in performance when he hands over to fellow South African Jordan Pepper, who, who I think if I remember right, he did the first end of the start end of the race yesterday. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you, you just got to be there or thereabouts and hope a yellow zone comes you, your way and uh, hampers arrival or whatever, whatever. And let's face it, if there's any circuit in the world that will throw up possible curveballs, it's got to be this magnificent 25 kilometers here on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. But you just got to put yourself in the mix. But I think what was so encouraging, the opening stage of this, the second.
second round of the NLS for 2024 was the fact the first stint of the race, it was six cars, no tail at the front of the field. Very, very competitive. And certainly in that, the Mercedes were much more in the race than they were yesterday. Could have been coincidental, of course, the number six Mercedes quite rightly say, led the race yesterday, yes, but you jumped the start, and that, with that came a drive-through penalty, so that removed them. Number 14 car lost a bit of ground early on, that was the car that started from pole. Now Frank Bird is on board that, he's just taking it over as the number 14 comes out of the pit, so he's getting his run, the young British driver, but uh, really yesterday ended up being all about three Porsches and one Audi, and uh, today it's nice to have a different mix, and certainly good to see that uh, Red Bull Team Ab car right there, leading at the moment, that should be in next time around and it's marginally quicker than Martin Raginger certainly through well the last sector although Raginger was able to eat a, a bit of time back again by a second and a half through sector two so it's fluctuating nicely between the Lamborghini Huracan and the Porsche 911 one is quicker in certain areas of the track than the other at times and then it flips around through the very next sector and Martin Ragging, and the nice thing for him is that he can keep tabs on the Lamborghini in its dark blue Red Bull colours all the way through this full open throttle section of Klostertal and Kessel Shen. Just a slight breathe there through the tight left, the tighter left hander though at uh, Klostertal itself. And then you have to get the car over to the left hand side for that run into Style Strecker and the significant incline to the Caracciola Carousel. Be a bit of time yet before we welcome the race leader back onto the Dottinger Hoare. So a chance to catch up with what's going on in Cup 2. And, well, 124, Moritz Krantz is already in pit lane as the Cup 2 race leader. So that'll be its second stop. And the next car to look out for will be 148, the Noah Nagelsteek-driven Black Falcon Team 48 car. And Alex Brundle running in third. So Mulner Motorsport, they only need to find one position for that number 122 car, and it would be a 1-2 formation. As now through Hohenreit. And a late call to the pits. Now that was just darting out to do an overtake, in fact, for 122. So over the line will go the Porsche in the gold colours. Moritz Krantz, as I say, already in pit road. And Mehmet Kaya over the line in the 103 car to complete lap 14. So Noah's, Noah Nagelsdijk will lead Cup 2, in fact, now, having chose, choosing not to pit at the end of lap 14. And Alex Brundle, likewise, stayed out as well. So should now be up to second position in the second of the Mulner Motorsport cars. In at the end of lap 13 is Kiki Saknana in the 786 Renatso Motorsport Lamborghini Huracan. That's an SB9 AM car, remember? Not leading its class, though. That privilege in the at the moment going in the way of Jutta Racing and driver simply known as Selv, S-E-L-V, I should say, in their Audi R8, car number eight, running in eighth position, all the eights. Neat and tidy, still waiting to see what the gap is going to be between Kelvin van der Linden leading the race in the Abdel Lamborghini and uh, certainly uh, the number three Porsche was getting closer and closer. It was only just uh, almost precisely three seconds down at the start of that. They will be coming in to pit at the end of this one. They will be the next two pit visitors. The team Abt Lamborghini leading the race for now. That's car number 27. And uh, a car that's been very close to it all races, a car that could have won yesterday's race, did not. Martin Ragging will be bringing that in, presumably for Alessio Picariello to have a second stint. He did the opening stint yesterday. In fact, Alessio did three of the four race stints and Ragging are just the one. Maybe today they'll flip it round and leave uh, Martin to do stint two and stint three. But we'll see. But those cars will be coming in very soon indeed. And then we'll know exactly where the placement is on the track between the top the front running cars this field with two of their three pit stops done but just remember this curveball the later you can serve your final pit stop which is almost always dictated how by how late you made your first pit stop oh and the two cars do come in no, almost nose to tail uh, dictates how long not this pit stop but the next one will be and then those that pitted late early on will have a smile on their faces and that's certainly how you can describe uh, Manti EMA they've uh, did a seven lap following by a seven lap and they've been very quick out on the track I would reckon they'll be in the lead of the race when these two cars the 27 Lamborghini and the number three uh, 
Porsche come back out after the pit stops, but let's see. Those involved with Renato's initiative, very pleased that Martin Ragging has stopped on his marks there, because if he'd slightly overrun, he would have completely T-boned that highlighter yellow Lamborghini Huracan. The reason why they're at very obscure angles compared to one another is that cars go up on the dolly jacks through virtually 90 degrees. They sort of sit in the end at 45 degrees uh, in order then to make the exit from the apron into the fast lane as easy as possible. You are allowed to do that and the minimum pit stop reference time gives you the scope to do it as well. So often we see cars going up on the dolly jacks and being turned through as if they're about to be backed into the garage. But in actual fact, it's just uh, to reposition them for the the most uh, efficient exit back into the race as possible. Concentrating for a moment on this uh, Cupra, which I was adamant was a Hyundai earlier on in the piece. I've learned my Cupra lines a little more efficiently though now. And Michael Eichhorn drives the 469 Cupra Leon for Auto Thomas by Young Motorsports. Tobias Young was driving this car a little earlier on. Eichhorn still in second place in VT2, the front wheel drive class. VT2 separated, remember, into two subcategories. One for front wheel drive cars, the other for rear wheel drive and four-wheel drive cars, so that's a sort of combined subcategory and all sorts of different machinery within that. In fact, VT2 rear and four-wheel drive. We've got the, the Toyo tyres with ring racing Toyota Supra leading it, but second is a BMW 330i, third is a BMW F30, and in fourth position, it's a BMW 3 litre, so principally BMWs, but a various different design scopes and uh, vintages as well. The top three cars all coming in at the end of lap 15. So they've all done eight lap stints, the third of which we, we've touched on Kelvin van der Linde and Martin Ragginger bringing their Porsche and Lamborghinis in. But the Glickenhaus also pits at the end of lap 15, Franck Mayer. And let's just confirm that that was also an eight lap stint for the Frenchman. It was. So they began with Thomas Much in the Glickenhaus. He stayed in the car for seven laps. There was then a pit stop, and there's been an eight-lap stint for Franck Bayer. Now there's a problem, though, for the 604 BMW M3 E46. This is the Kroll car. And 604, which started from the front of Start Group 3 yesterday, being driven by Thomas Mullens, and it's maybe been trying to get back to the pits and let's hope that they haven't run it very very close on fuel because it looks suspiciously like maybe it's run short of that crucial petroleum and it can't get down pit lane as a result michael kroll chantal prins alexander prins and as i say current driver thomas mullens but so frustratingly for hoffer racing they can see the pit lane entry road they just can't get there because they're parked on the link road between hohenrein and the grand prix lap and it might be that that car now has to receive a tow to get it back to pit lane for essential service. Jordan Pepper takes over the Lamborghini for Red Bull Team Apt and is back into the race. And it is Alessio Picariello who takes charge of the number three Porsche. So a single stint for Martin Ragginger. Will Martin get in to that car again or will it just be a single stint on day one and day two for the Austrian? with much more of the heavy lifting taking place for Alessio Picardiello. So they came in first and second. They have dropped now behind the Sufi-driven Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. Now, how many laps have they managed to do on this stint? Remember, they did eight to kick things off. This is going to be another eight-lap stint for the Lamborghini of Conrad Motorsport. And I reckon they're back to the lead of the race again. <laughs> Eight and eight is 16, plus the formation lap. They have got some phenomenal uh, race mileage out of that car, fuel mileage. Just fastest lap for Kamui Kobayashi. Not overall, but the uh, the boss of Toyota Kazoo Racing, normally seen competing in the World Endurance Championship, is having a, a bit of a crack this weekend uh, with one of a pair of uh, GT4 class uh, Toyota Supras. Not actually as well placed as the sister car with the Hibiki Taira. Uh, but again, it's just great how many drivers come from around the world to come and compete here and uh, for the love of it, but also with the name, you're fairly convinced we might see uh, Kazuki or maybe just getting an eye in on the GT3 class that is obviously the top class in this race, known as SP9. 
uh, here on the Nordschleife. But uh, having a crack, getting experience, who knows what's going to follow. He could be looking at it from a team point of view, could be looking at it from a Kamui Kobayashi point of view. That's but, yeah. You know, up and down this list, you just have to, have to go looking for that. Now, what the gap between Pepper and Bicari Yellow, four seconds when they came into the pits, and probably about the same when they went back out. But uh, for Conrad Motorsport, Danny Sufi, yeah, he should be in next time around. I'm looking at his sector times. His last lap was an 8 minute 12 second lap, which is sort of at the moment pretty much on the money. But as soon as he goes green the whole way round, then, you know, you, you should be looking at a lap around low eight minutes. Yes. Yes, it had the qualifying times this morning, uh, and this wasn't um, with a clear track, of course. Everybody thrown out into qualifying together, so. Uh, 99 cars were due to start today's race. In fact, it was 97 that managed to qualify. And the fastest time was set by the number 14 Ravenol uh, liveried Mercedes with a 7.56. So it was possible this morning to get beneath the eight minute marker. More difficult to do that in the race because of fuel load and because of the amount of traffic here and there. But also we've had, of course, quite a lot of caution um, localised yellows, which have sometimes turned into code 60, certainly code 120s, and uh, we had the code 60, the lengthy one down at Arenberg, which I think has presented this big opportunity for Conrad Motorsport. Big question mark as to whether they can pull off the, the impossible, seemingly, and win this race outright. That's still a big, big ask, but they might get a top six finish out of it, let's say, because of the extended fuel mileage, particularly in that opening stint. Yeah, it was it was bold. They haven't got the race pace when they're they're running in these stints. But if you're trying to, you know, the difference between a seven and a half lap stint and an eight lap, we know that any any number that's followed by a fraction is not good. That means you haven't made it back to the pits. But they've certainly had a go, made that first long stint work. Will be coming in, but uh, just looking at the sector times, it's sort of there or thereabouts. But you know, you you add the extra increments they're taking in each of the timing sectors, and it, it is telling its own story. But of course, that final pit stop will be very short, but they'd fallen effectively two and a bit minutes down on the ultimate uh, effective race lead, and you're never going to claw that back, even with a late, late final pit stop, a short, short final pit stop. Concentrating for the moment on the BMW from Team Bilstein by Black Falcon, and uh, the driver who's in the entry by his social media handle, at MG Charudin, Mike, we think is this is uh oh, michel yes you're right michel michel, michel. uh in the sp8t car now interestingly at the start of this lap they'd slip back to second place but only by 1.2 seconds so sp8t for leading honors is very tight between two near identical cars the m4 gt4 it's the gt motorsport machine that is now uh, out front number one four six and being driven by Pippa Mann. I did wonder whether that might be Pippa, uh, seeing the surname M-A-N-N. So Pippa driving the GT Motorsport WS racing car and sharing with Fabian, uh, Fabienne Volvent and Beitzke Visser in their GT uh, M4 GT4. And it's a, clearly an all-female driving crew. Is it also an all-female uh, engineering crew as well in the garage. I know they've done that in the past. They have done it in the past. I can't confirm for this weekend. Just want to confirm one, one little thing because he's just set that car's fastest lap. Mark Wilkins was competing yesterday in the all Canadian lineup uh, with Rob Wickens. Rob, if you're aware, had an accident about two and a half hours into the race where his Hyundai Elentro uh, hit, the, hit the tire wall at uh, Hohenrein, the, the final right left flick on the lap and uh, cleared the fence went down on the other side and um, was in hospital overnight and his teammate Mark Wilkins has uh, crossed over to another Hyundai running in the uh, VT2 front wheel drive category he's sharing car number 487 and all his experience can the Canadian racer competing in the IMSA Michelin pilot challenge in recent years clearly coming to play because he's making that car move very well so uh, the, the lion's share of the driving was with Rob Wickens, so quite clearly it's not an entirely wasted weekend for Mark Wilkins, a 40-year-old Canadian, doing a very good job in car 487. So he's not going home empty-handed. And uh, there was a message this morning on um, on Twitter from uh, Rob Wickens saying, you know, <laughs> effectively saying, a little shaken, battered, I'm paraphrasing here, but, uh, you know, I'm fine. Mm. 
but then again, he'll probably say he's fine even if you know, he's not quite fine. But we're determined to get back out there with Brian Herter Auto Sports. So that was a, a cheerier report this morning uh, from the very popular Canadian racer. Yeah, so what it means for Mark Wilkins is he's now sharing with uh, Gumin Kim and Hongwei Kao in the i30M Fastback number 487. And I'm not sure whether they had a third driver yesterday, whether they ran as a, as a twosome and they've welcomed Mark Wilkins into the fold, therefore. Well, I, I give you a possible reason for that is that uh, Gumin Kim from South Korea is actually in the 486 and 487. In fact, at the moment he's in 486, so maybe he's decided he'll run that car only and Mark will take his place. So there are two two driver lineups. That's me guessing. They're running fifth and sixth in VT2 front wheel drive, um, separated by not really very much at all, under two seconds. Yes, yes, I hadn't spotted actually that uh, the South Korean was in both cars. Like you say, there may well be the fact that, uh, that they're going to focus on one in particular and then if there is a problem for one of the cars there's always the scope then to switch to the other uh, in the race we've seen that happen before in the sp9 category in fact you know that bit in the commentary where you go and meanwhile at the front of the race it's very very close indeed 0.65 of a second between Lawrence Van Tour leading for Manti EMA from the number four Porsche from Falcon Motorsports with Joel Eriksson. So Belgium ahead of Swede at the moment. And as predicted, Johnny, after 16 laps into the pit came the uh, Conrad Motorsport uh, Lamborghini from, it was in the lead, but by the time it got into the pit lane, it had been passed by Manti and by Falcon. Now it's serving its time in the pits. We'll come out, I think, still ahead of, mm, should just be ahead, I think, of the Glickenhaus but it'll go back down to sixth position for, for Conrad Motorsport. So it'll be halfway point in the race, was passed 18 minutes ago, but so we're heading towards the third round of pit stops, but as many as 40 minutes or so away for those. And the longer you can run in this stint, the closer to the end of the race, your final pit stop will be commensurately shorter. But Conrad Motorsport doing things differently, but really now the picture is starting to emerge and it's Manti EMA from it's 9-11 ahead of four. Yesterday we had four ahead of 9-11 at the end of the race. So yes. There we are, and separated by not a whole host of seconds. Uh, by the end of the race yesterday, 3.65 seconds was all the ones between first and second. And the other fascinating battle that we have right now is for what is fourth and fifth on the road with Danny Sufi's pit stop. So it means that Picariello and Pepper have both moved up a spot and they are separated by less than half a second. You can hear the flat six of Alessia Picariello's Porsche in the background. And Bruce and I are being treated, hopefully you are as well, because we're in sound and vision this weekend, to the onboard briefly there of Picariello. But what the onboard doesn't reveal is quite how close Jordan Pepper is to that rear wing of the Belgian's car. So South African Jordan Pepper looking just about as quick, if not maybe quicker than Kelvin van der Linde was. It's been a tremendous couple of opening stints for van der Linde. And now the Red Bull team at Huracan, driven by Jordan Pepper. Fifth place could be could be fourth by the end of this race. It also means that Frank Bird moves up a position from fourth to third, as Danny Sufi is still in the pit lane. The longest pit stop just about in SP9 after an eight-lap stint for the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. We talk constantly with the long-distance races around the Nürburgring. Maybe I could end the sentence there, but we talk constantly about how you have an incident up ahead of you, a slow zone is thrown or waved yellow flags and you have to necessarily lose a bit of momentum. Just remember there was one lap in which uh, Kevin Estra was chasing down in second place, chasing after what was going to be the effective race leader. Then he lost five seconds. But he'd spent a couple of laps gaining five seconds, lost it somehow. So I haven't found out what the incident was that caused him to slow. Without that, he'd be sitting on a bigger lead. As it is, he's leading by three quarters of a second from uh, Joel Eriksson. But it seems absolutely all square between those two cars in terms of their pace. In fact, last time around, if anything, yeah, in fact, last time around, not if anything, factually so, uh, Joel Eriksson took nearly two seconds out of him. But actually, looking at the timing sectors, there's, there's nothing. There's absolutely mm. nothing. So you've just got to maximise every moment. And as we saw from as early as uh, lap two in this race, when they started the slowest of the cars in the third starting group, the traffic sometimes helps, sometimes it hinders. But early in this race, suddenly the leading sextet of cars had to pass about a dozen cars from the tail end of the field 
pretty much in the course of three corners and it really opened out of the lead, closed the first two back in, opened it out again like someone playing an accordion, closing it in, moving it out. But uh, Cream does rise to the top and Manti EMA, certainly it's a good weekend for Porsche and Falcon Motorsports just keep creeping towards the top all over again. In Cup 3, briefly concentrating on Lucas Daugard there in the Avia WNS Motorsport Cayman 962. It's an all 718 Cayman class, of course. And those doing the chasing, a little helpless at the moment, second, third and fourth. They are relatively close to one another, but nobody's catching Lucas Daugard. One car that didn't qualify this morning is that of... Uh, Murlig, who is running in second position, that's Timo Murlig. So clearly they were given dispensation, even though they didn't qualify in 952 to take the start of that race. And they've done incredibly well, all things considered, to get up to second position in the Smurlis racing car. And then it's Stefan Kruser for Adrenaline Motorsport in third position in Cup 3. It does appear that the Cup 3 and the SP8T pace is very similar. For instance, the two class leaders in those separate categories separated only by 20 odd seconds. They're 19th and 20th in the overall positions. As we focus again on the front of the field, because we've talked about there being absolutely no real estate at all between Lawrence Van Tor and Joel Eriksson. Well, that's condensing even further now because Van Tor looking to slash his way through the traffic as quickly as possible. He was definitely delayed, though, on the approach to Brunchen. Yeah, there was a schnitzel arm BMW, schnitzel arm motorsport BMW, just in his path. He lost his momentum, but uh, Lawrence kicked the tail of the car out, so he tried to readjust the, the line of that racing Porsche, but he's being pushed very hard indeed uh, by Joel Eriksson. Uh, just a little message come, has come up on screen uh, from fourth in Cup 2, number 103 is coming to the pit lane and it has to do uh, a drive-through penalty for pushing another car. So whether that was at the time of the driver who's at the wheel, I suggest it may well be, uh, or it was it one of his predecessors, but the driver at the wheel is Mustafa Mehmet uh, Kaya. So that will spike their gun and that should accelerate uh, the Michael and uh, Michel Halder car up one position, that's 117. But Cup 2 at the moment being led by uh, Noel Nagel Disc for Nagel's Disc for Black Falcon team. Second place is uh, Moritz Krantz, Mulder Motorsport. Third place, Peter Turting in the second of the Mulder Motorsport cars. That's 122 two ahead of 124. But bragging rights right now in Cup 2, it's 148 leading the way. So smiles all round, no doubt, for the Black Falcon team. Past Daniel Mertens, will the, the two race leaders will go. Mertens driving the, the 491 Hyundai i30N, which is still the VT2 leader for the front wheel drive cars. Remember Mertens and Eichhorn were nose to tail not too long ago in a, a car that I thought was a, another Hyundai and turned out to be the Cooper Leon for Auto Thomas by Jung Motorsport. And that car is still in second position in the VT2s WDs, but how about the lead battle? We are well over half distance now, nearly two and a half hours into this four hour 63rd edition of the ADAC Ryan Aldous, Lang, Streck, and Renard. And this is a great opportunity for Joel Eriksson to maybe catch the draft of Lawrence Van Tool's car. I don't think he's going to be quite close enough as they head into the braking area for the first corner, the Yokohama S, although we're only using one element of the S this weekend, instead turning fully right and into the Mercedes arena. There's not a Mercedes in sight, though, for the top two positions in this race. It's Porsche 911 GT3Rs going hammer and tongs with each other. Separate entities remain member Manti versus Falcon and there's bound to be a bit of needle between these two uh, big uh, preparers of Porsche race cars there's also the tyre battle to think about as well the Manti car on Michelin's the Falcon tyre car clearly on the Falcon rubber yeah one thing we have to throw into that particular mix though is they're running different different pit stop strategies because the number four gained an advantage early in the race by being one of the first two cars to pit from the top class. That was after only five laps. The Manti car came in two laps later. Its second pit stop was one lap later. It does mean the Manti car, which is within a second of the race leader, in fact, within half a second, within 0.35 of a second, will have a shorter final pit stop. So if he feels like it, 
Lawrence Van Tor can just sit there and not have to push on too hard. Certainly the disadvantage is with Joel Eriksson. Right now, Joel's got to try and work his way past, and that's precisely what he's trying to do around the Grand Prix loop. And uh, likewise, his teammate uh, in fifth place, Alessio Picariello, is trying to get his way, not quite close enough to do so, past Jordan Pepper, who's taken over for the second half of the race in the Red Bull team at Lamborghini. So we get some good little tussles here. But certainly with the Manti Porsche out front, plus with the advantage of its final pit stop, he knows, it, the team knows it's going to be short on the final pit stop for the car that's right on his tail. Doesn't have to take too many risks right here and right now. Just keeps focus on what's up ahead, look out for any incidents, and more to that point, Johnny, look out for any gaggles of cars that could just slow his progress. We saw it about a lap and a half ago. He got behind a schnitzel arm BMW and just had to bide his time, adjust his line, and thank you very much, Joel Erickson, right onto his tail. But the advantage is with Manti EMA. I just looked down to sixth position and thought, oh, I wonder how Danny Sufi's doing. Well, I'm afraid after the second pit stop, he hasn't yet come back into the race. Been there for nearly 10 minutes now. So Conrad Motorsport definitely grabbed our attention in the early stages, being able to go eight laps in to an opening stint, which normally doesn't get any further than seven. But uh, um, unfortunately, that Conrad Motorsport car now could be on the very edge of retirement. You know, it's such a shame when you've got, we knew that final pit stop for the Conrad Motorsport car was going to be the shortest of any of the front runners. It wasn't going to take it to the front of the field. Let's be wholly honest about that, but it would have just been intriguing to see where it would come back in. I, I think probably in sixth place is a simple answer to that, but right now it's now moving back down the order. You know, a short while ago, I mentioned the 103 Porsche from the Cup 2 class car. Uh, Mustafa Mehmet uh, Kaya was uh, given a drive-through penalty. The reason was contact with a car from the same class, 121 uh, K Kramer Racing. That's shared by uh, Fidel Live Jr., Carsten Krieger, and Michele De Martino. A little bit of a tie up there. Of course, he was a driver for several years, was racing that Con Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini uh, with such good effect, particularly once he had uh, Axel Jeffries as, a, as a, a driver who popped up alongside him at the majority of the NLS races. Oscar Sandberg's just done the best GT4 time, well, SP10 lap time. Can't really say GT4 because we've got that uh, category of car in several categories, but the true GT4 division is SP10 and has been for a number of years in both NLS racing and the Nürburgring 24 hours. And Oscar Sandberg leads the SP10 category in the Dua Motorsport Aston Martin Vantage GT4. Uh, but not by a, well, it's about a minute difference between the 169 car and the Porsche Cayman, which is number 184, which currently has uh, Achim Wauer doing the driving there, a car that Achim shares with Claudius Kach, uh, Ivan Giacoma and Kai Rima. So a, a rare thing for four different drivers being allocated to that particular car. It means, I suppose, they get a stint each if everything stays on schedule. You know, and I think we, we often see a four, four driver lineup before the 24 hours. They just wanted to cycle drivers through in preparation for those that want to do the, the big race of the year on the German endurance calendar. No, sorry, scrap that one, not the German, the global yeah. endurance calendar. It's coming up soon. Once the season gets underway, suddenly things move very, very quickly indeed. But I really do think for the teams here this weekend, two days of dry running has been just probably what they need. A little bit of wet running can help, but this has just settled the team, particularly if they've moved up to another class, a new car, or changed their tyre supplier. They're getting a lot of mileage here, and we have, yes, had a few little slow zones and things, but it hasn't been a crash fest. It has been a chance for them to get not just the cars, but the drivers through, get that early season mileage under their belts. And think how many years, Johnny, we've come here for the early rounds of the championship and been looking at cars waiting to go out. Is the snow too heavy or is it too light? You know, we've had to fight the weather. This year, it's been very, very kind indeed. Well, obviously to make up the fact that winter was just rain, 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 rain. Just caught sight of the V5 uh, race leader, which is the treble four numbered Adrenaline Cayman. Corn, uh, corn, corn are its drivers, Ulrich, Tobias, and Daniel. And again, we don't have any initials for the driver that is at the wheel at the moment. So uh, it's a bit of a guessing game, but again, a combined effort to try and get that car to the finish and to a decent position within category. It's not the only V5 car 
in the entry. There's a, at least a couple more Caymans further down the order as well, but they've not had a happy time of it to this point. Unfortunately, the 455 looks like a retirement now. 88th overall for that car. At the start of the lap, the top two were separated by less than half a second and it, somewhere in sector four, not too far away from well, it's after Flanscott now. We're heading for towards the Stefan Belov S, in fact, in the second concreted section at Schwabenschwanz. Still Manti and Lawrence Fantel with the lead, but shadowing is every move and every credit to Joel Eriksson for this is the Falcon Motorsport Porsche number four. You know, when you're running on d different strategies, they will be what they will be. If your team is pitted for that first pit stop early, you know it's going to cost you at the end of the race. It would boost your position on the track. But right now, I think I think Joel Eriksson, the young Swedish racer, just has to think, OK, I could be racing on the same strategy in the 24 hours with uh, the race leading Manti EMA Porsche. Let's just see how he handles it. Where are his strengths? Where is his weaknesses? Not that you expect Lawrence Van Short to or to throw show any of those so these cars very very close on the track and in fact not gaining a slipstream but not enough surely to make a passing maneuver to try and take the lead of the race is joel erickson but he knows his final pit stop is going to be longer he's got to put that out of his mind he's just got to race see what's in front of him well it's very easy to see what's in front of him it's only about two meters in front of him but it's the mante ema porsche but right now he's just got to think about there could be a moment i'm racing absolutely fair and square with him but uh, now we've got to move from as uh, one Falker Motorsport Porsche was pushing another car, that was uh, Ericsson pushing for the lead to Lawrence Van Tour. The sister car has pushed and passed. Alessio Picariello goes past the Jordan Peppers Lamborghini. So it's been a harder race today for the number three Porsche crew from Falker Motorsport. But Alessio Picariello has, uh, did the first in, Martin Radinger did the second, and Picariello has hopped back on board and he's made that pass on the Lamborghini number 27 from Team Abt. The nice thing, the clever thing that Falcon are doing though here, of course, is again taking different routes with each of their cars through the race. So yes, Ericsson's going to have to pit a lap before Vantor does for the final time, but going a lap beyond where the Manti car can be will be the sister Falcon car. Now this might be a chance actually, before I finish that point, for Ericsson to get through because Vantor didn't quite get through the traffic there at the cut through quite as readily as Joel Ericsson. The beauty of being the chasing car is that you can react accordingly to the odd mistake that the lead car may make. And Vantor probably coming away from that uh, tricky section on the Grand Prix track, which is the heavily cambered right-hander. But the problem is when there's traffic right down the base of that right-hander, you're thrown up to the higher lines of it, and it means you can't necessarily get out with as much speed as uh, the more traditional racing line. Over the bridge they will go, the, the kind of link road between the Grand Prix Strecker and the hats and back through Sabina Schmidt's curve, the left-hander. Quite a bit of curve taken on the exit there by Belgian racer Laurence Vantor, chased by Swede Joel Eriksson. Frank Bird would love to be involved with this battle, but he's about 20 seconds further back down the road. Picariello and Pepper, though, are catching the Mercedes, and it's definitely a three-way dice for third position. Yeah. Bear this in mind, the gap between Picariello and the race leader, which is the Manti EMA Porsche, is 21 seconds. Picariello's car, number three, Falcon Motorsport Porsche, can come in a lap later, and the timing difference for the pit stop is 21 seconds in the favour of the driver who stops later, which is going to be the number three crew. Oh, even Stevens going into the final stint. We'll take that, yes, please. But the other thing is because Jordan Pepper's right with Picariello and he's going to do the same. He will come in on the same lap, or should do, as the number three Porsche, so it can take a shorter stop than those than the four than the three cars ahead of them. So we imagine Picariello and Pepper coming in, staying the same amount of time in pit road as the time ticks by, and then being released. But the net effect will be that they'll gain about 21 seconds on those three cars in front. Yeah, the way we have to judge them is we're not pitching them against uh, Joel Eriksson in the other Falcon Motorsport Indeed. car. Indeed. Remove him from the mix. He might be far away, but he, he, he has to pit up earlier. But it's the car that's going to pit the lap ahead of them, the Manti car. And that being the case, after that pit stop, we should have the first three cars covered by a second. Yes, please. Yeah. Let's take it. Put track conditions for... 
Bird, car number 14. That will owe us a pit stop after lap 22, so we're not there yet for another three and a bit laps. But uh, unfortunately for them, again, a bit like yesterday, the Mercedes, some pace, but not throughout. But for drivers like Frank Bird, learning all the time, the driver from the northwest of England, and, um, you know, has got a lot of mileage now with Mercedes. And uh, again, how did the teams look at... Whenever you come to the Nürburgring, what is the first thing you look at? The weather forecast. What can that offer you? Oh, dear me, we've got a little BMW stop at the side of the track. Number 488, it's a 128Ti. And I like the brake lights are on, but uh, it's not going anywhere at all. But is that in a position of any particular danger? Well, race control won't like it positioned just to the right of the Grand Prix Link Road, effectively. It's the, the bridging section between Hohenrein and the Grand Prix Strait itself. Johannes Duschik, the Austrian, at the wheel of the 128 Ti from SRS Team Zorgren Sport. And that 488 car, which qualified in 77th position, had gained a couple of places overall and was running in eighth place of the front-wheel drive VT2 cars. So in the same class as the Mertens uh, Hyundai uh, Fastback, the bright orange car. Cracking run again from Joel Eriksson through Kesselschen, Klostertal. And surely he's not going to attempt an overtake around the outside there, but uh, it, the slipstream, very similar to what you get down the Dottinger Hoare. He just had to get out of the throttle because he didn't have enough track around the outside of the Manti car. Both, by the way, now on the grass crete as they leave that tighter left-hander at, at Klostertal itself. Yeah, you can certainly say Porsche 911 started small. They've grown in stature and width over the years, and Lawrence Rantel was making it even wider than possible. And again, trying to make the widest run across the circuit, both of as you say, driver's right-hand wheels on the right of the circuit, on the grass creek, but they uh, get through carousel and go past the back markers. Lawrence Van Torre is starting to take some fairly major risks. He hasn't listened to what I said about three minutes ago. Doesn't need to too much because uh, Joel Erickson is going to be due in the pits some distance, some, is it one or is it two? That one lap before him. So therefore he's sitting really on a 20 plus second advantage over the car that's pushing him. But we're not complaining. He's providing absolutely brilliant footage around this circuit. Spring sunshine yesterday. Tick spring sunshine today. We'll have that as well. Any onboard footage around this circuit, you just have to understand the speeds they're achieving, but it's the fact the way they clatter the curves, trying to make the shortest line around this corner, this circuit of 25 kilometers, 170 odd corners, odd being operative in many ways, odd in terms of the very few circuits have any corners like this, but the fact they have multiple corners up over brows into drops, it's just amazing. A factor in another reason we like it so much, Johnny, is the simple fact that. Uh, there's this enormous range of performance of machinery and type of machinery from production vehicles to older vehicles and then the very front running cars, the SP9s, they are just magical. I reckon that was the Pro Sport Aston Martin of Jasmine Preissig who's at the wheel of that car at the moment. Jasmine, you may know her name from 24-8 series racing in the TCR category and uh, run to great success in the past within that. Still, absolutely nothing between these Porsches that are first and second on the road. Joel Eriksson always looking very, very chilled, though, behind the wheel of the second-place car. Well, what a fantastic battle. Brilliant advertisement. We don't mind the fact they're running different strategies. What we love is the fact that... Uh, absolute tiptoes, pushing all the time, trying to get the flow as they come out of Galvenkopf and start running along the Dottinghoe. Uh, race leader, Lawrence Van Tor, the Manti EMA Porsche in the Greno, the green and yellow race livery, but tucked in behind, getting the slipstream. It's such a long run. You think they're not really gaining? Yes, they are, bit by bit by bit. It's Joel Erickson. He's going to have to see if he can pass. He's going to be the one that has to blink first, has to make the third pit stop. Uh, not just yet. He can make it probably the end of lap 20, possibly lap 21. This is the end of lap 19. There's a slower car up ahead, but Lawrence Van Tor, Wiley Bird, covers the line. You're not coming past me. Unfortunately, if that back marker hadn't been there in a Porsche Cayman, there would have been the width that maybe Joel Erickson could make a move, but you know what? Discretion was the better part of Ballard there. And they slow right down through uh, Hohen Ryan because, of course, we mentioned there was a BMW 128 Ti just off in the cut-through before the 
but it's still sitting there just being hooked up to be toned away just before pit in so big frustration there and for Joel Erickson thought maybe I won't get him into the final corner but I might make a move down into the first corner and now the fact they're running along at a baited pace in a coat 60 and then it's released just before they get to the control tower at pit entrance and accelerate away and who reacted first the driver in front Lawrence Van Tor so he stretched that margin just enough to go you're not coming past into turn one. So that took a major overtaking opportunity away from Joel Eriksson, no doubt about it, but the better scope was probably into Tiergarten just before they hit the Code 60. They're at the Mercedes Arena now, 20th time. Vantor Eriksson, Picariello crosses the line, still with 19 seconds separating him from this leading battle, the duo of the yellow and the two-tone blue Porsches. Well, that's important because once the figure was sitting at 21 seconds last time around, he's taken one and a bit seconds out of that. His advantage over Lawrence Van Tour by pitting a lap later is 21 seconds. That puts him potentially in a, front com uh, a, a lead coming up. But I actually thought he could have had an even bigger gift. I wondered if that code 60 coming out of the final corner would still be in place when the car's in third and fourth positions. Picariello now ahead of uh, Frank Bird, and they'd suddenly get the gift, but it was still there. So they all had to slow right down just when they wanted to be accelerating along the start finish straight. They had to slow right down, wait, wait, wait until they were released. So uh, it wasn't a gift wrap present there. Picariello's just going to have to keep on doing what he's doing. But it's Manti EMA first, second, just half a second down behind Lawrence Van Torres, uh, Joel Eriksson, and uh, 19 seconds further back, nearly 20 seconds further back is Alessio Picariello. So those top three really closing up but for me it's coming down if jo uh, Jordan Pepper can move ahead of uh, Frank Bird and he has done has he yes he so he has uh, as I look up at my screen um, then he may yet get back in the mix he's lost a bit of ground going past the yellow and blue Mercedes but if he can have another few good laps and get on the tail of Picariello it will be a three-way back to the finish as far as I understand with uh, Lawrence Van Tor from anti EMA and the two cars the number three Porsche and the number 27 Lamborghini after their final pit stops and they the latter two will pit uh, one lap behind the Manti car Peter Turting now the, the lead of the Cup 2 division by the way for Mulner Motorsport the all 911 GT3 Cup part of the race Turting leading Tobias Muller and Moritz Krantz so Mulner Motorsport again looking at a good finishing position at this stage still with one more pit stop to go within cup two but they're running first and third mike sturzberg in the 103 black falcon car is fourth and then in fifth place it's still the halder prepared and driven car uh, we have seen the Code 60 return at Arenberg. This is nothing to do with the earlier difficulties for Tim Shearbart, by the way. There's obviously something else that's happened on the exit of Arenberg because the gravel trap itself at that right-hander is clear, but the Code 60 boards being displayed just before the foxhole. And there, oh, there's a car in the barrier late on, actually. It looks like it's made most of the Arenberg right-hander and then slithered off into the gravel and clanged the metal barrier. This could be a great opportunity for Joel Eriksson, who's deliberately swings left so he can see clear road in front of him. But he also needed visuals on the marshal posts as well, where the green flags are being displayed. We're back to full speed again, down into the foxhole itself, where overtaking is once again permitted. Still no let up, though, in the lead battle in the second race of the year in NLS. It's the ADAC, Reinaldus, Lang, Streck and Renan, live here on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. And as they slice their way by more traffic on the approach to Metzgersfeld, the double left-hander. And let's just see whether we can catch the end of uh, the interview with Kamui Kobayashi. Whilst also keeping an eye on the lead battle to our right as well. Kobayashi racing with Toyota. Yeah, so uh, apologies, completely missed that interview. But uh, Kobayashi smiling, very, very happy to be here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. It's a question of where to look next, of course, uh, with this lead battle, which is now heading for Breitscheid for the 20th time. It's Manti up ahead of Falcon Motorsports as they swing left now and over the road bridge, separated by probably about two car lengths. 
with every swoop of this circuit. Alessio Picariello, 20 odd seconds further back, and Frank Bird is 1.4 seconds away uh, from, uh, in fact, uh, no, no longer. Bird now slipping to fifth place, as we touched on, who is has just been overtaken by Jordan Pepper in the Red Bull team at Lamborghini Huracan. More code 60 later on in this lap, I'm afraid, and that's because of what looked like a Hyundai in the barrier on the exit of Bergwerk there. And again, key part of the lap, because normally you'd be accelerating out of this right-hander and up now through Kesselschen. And Joel Eriksson is denied that opportunity needing though to be alert as we go back to green flag running a lap ago Joel Eriksson tried an overtake here I'm sure he's going to think different as we continue on in this four-hour race Shop für Simracing Hardware und Zubehör. www.simraceshop.de Liebe Fans, besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. to the Dottinger Hoor for the 20th time. Manti versus Falcon. You cannot separate these two high-class Porsche 911 GT3R teams. And particularly credit to Joel Eriksson, who has stuck with the Manti car, maybe more so than Manti were quite expecting. And they, he's in the wheel draft here, actually so casual, pulling the belts tighter as the Falcon car's getting uh, closer and closer. They're heading towards Antonius Bucher, which is the left-hand kink underneath the bridge lights flashing from Lawrence Vantor it won't be an overlap that the Port Falcon car can force but he does jump ahead of a Cayman in the braking area for Tiergarten which could well have been crucial and the tail end snaps on both Porsches as both cars as expected stay out for another lap there was a car creeping into the pit lane further back though not from the SP9 category we're going to be able to enjoy yet another circuit nearly 25 kilometers of these cars probably nose to tail throughout you'd have to think so barring traffic interrupting their flow but at the end of this lap which will be is lap 21 trying to go around the outside through the second corner it's a long way around the outside and there's a bmw production class car it's tough like there for joel erickson he was trying to go around the outside uh, through turn two of the mercedes arena of the lawrence van Tor and the matt type ema porsche but the falcon motorsport car but well, the driver 
had, had nailed his colours to the mast, went around the outside, and unfortunately there was a, a bateau in front of him, and it was a much more slow-moving BMW, so he had to back it off. But this lap, he'll have to come in. This will make it an eight-lap run, whereas the race leader, sitting right across the, the prow of the number four, Falker Motorsport Porsche, is the Manti EMA car that can do this lap and the next one. But unfortunately for him, two other rivals, which is the number 27, Lamborghini in fourth place, and the number three, Falker Motorsport Porsche, can do not just they could do one lap further than him. So we'll gain about 21 seconds in their final pit stop, which is going to close it up very, very nicely indeed. The one who's effectively out of kilter with this is the driver number four, the driver who's pushing so hard to take the lead, and that's Joel Eriks. He knows the die is cast. He's going to have to come in at the end of this one, and his rivals are going to continue and then have that shorter final pit stop. Now, what of the problems down at Arenberg. I can't see that all of the Code 60s have cleared there. No, they haven't. So Hatson back is fine at this stage. That's where the race leaders are at this stage. At, at uh, the 21st lap, they're going to head past the tyre wall that has claimed a few cars over the years. But bearing in mind that at the end of this next long straight, which is Hochheichen, Kittelbacher Hall, the double right-hander at Flugplatz, but then as they head for Schwedenkreuz, and the run into Arenberg, there will be yellow flags followed by Code 60 boards that they will have to obviously be very aware of going into. And then f in the case of Joel Eriksson, right on his toes coming out of that as they pass a flatbed and intervention vehicle just at the wrong point because that was through the second right-hander at Flugplatz itself. And that's normally flat through there, but I'm sure they had to just feather the throttle because the line of attack was much narrower, narrower than normal. And how much ground could Joel Eriksson gain into the yellow flag area? Well, an awful lot. We're not at the speed limited part, of course, yet. It's just no overtaking. And Eriksson slamming on the anchors a tad later than Lawrence Vantor to buy a bit of time back again. Beguiling. It really is two drivers at the top of their craft, but for Ericsson all along, he just wants to get past. He wants to find a second or two, but he knows by pitting a lap before the car that's in front of him, you know, he's not going to be in the mix when he comes out. However, I like a bit of the however, because uh, Alessio Picariello is only 18 seconds down on the race leader. Now, bear in mind, he can go a lap longer than that. So I know I keep on saying you gain 21 seconds if you pit a lap after your rivals, but my reckoning is that 18 is smaller than 21. Therefore, he ought to come out ahead and now just almost precisely 21 seconds out in fourth place of Vantor is the Jordan Pepper driven Lamborghinis. They're going to be super close. I would think after the final pit stops with Picariello just with his nose in front. So we'll have the final five laps or so of this race, maybe six laps with those three cars right together. Right now, of course, we're seeing Joel Erickson right together with the Bantai uh, Porsche, but he's going to have to come in from second place and his stop will be long. That will drop him away from the mix. So interesting, these, uh, I can say short races, they are four hours, but they're the shortest NLS races we get through the course of the year. And because there have been so many of them in the past, I think as many as nine in previous years, you, if you're turning up for every single one of them, then the experience gained is huge. And you realize that there are actually several different ways of potentially winning this race, especially as you're paying attention to your rivals and what they may be doing how much traffic you're ensconced in at any particular moment. And often there, there is an option to get you out of those busier areas and released from the time pit stop in a, a clearer area of the racetrack. And that's where things can be won and lost. But Vantor and Ericsson still separated by nothing at all. And Picariello definitely not out of this because he, due to be pitting two laps later compared to Ericsson, one lap later compared to Vantor, and that could be so crucial in the final 70 minutes of the race. We're into the final 65 minutes of the race now, in fact. So any pit stops from this point on, timed according to how much time there is to the chequered flag. I think Vantor caught a bit too much curb that time through Bergwerk, which has uh, or not quite at Bergwerk, are we? Exmuller. Bergwerk next, which is where the Code 60 is in place. Um, so we're slowing again. And Joel Eriksson, although the door was left wide open, not able to overtake. And that is because of this recovery work still taking place for one of the hatchback cars, maybe from VT2 or from TCR, which is at least on a flatbed now. So not very far away from 
clearing that incident, I would suggest. Yeah, the hard work is getting it loaded onto the truck, onto the flatbed. The next hard work is um, obviously not every sector of the track has a short run to the next gap in the fencing. Of course, there are gaps in, in, in the barriers. I couldn't quite spot as we were going past to see where the closest one was. But the good news is up on the deck, there'll be a safety car coming around uh, behind that, a course vehicle to protect drivers, to alert them to the fact there's a, a slow moving course vehicle. Over the years, uh, the crews here uh, put up by the various organising clubs have just refined their act. I mean, it's got to be the hardest circuit in the world to marshal, but they do it very, very well indeed. And you know what? Like many things in life, communication such an enormously important uh, role to play in that. If you're not clear, no clear lines of communication, you're going to have confusion. But uh, I must say, they do an exemplary job on the Nord Schleifer. And uh, again, just loading it up. Having, I've never actually counted exactly how many course vehicles they have. I'm sure it's somewhere you can find something you can find somewhere, but it's uh, more than you need on a normal sort of four or five kilometer track. Surprise, surprise. And we were talking yesterday, Johnny, in fact, even just before the start of the race today, about how this is such an incredible circuit. It doesn't just go from here to there, it goes from village to village into the next valley, back, back up over the hill into another valley, etc., etc. And it's very very hard indeed. Even if you had the highest of helicopter shots, almost need a satellite shot to see one side mm. of the circuit from the other. It really is. It's beyond old school. And uh, the, the success of the place, not just in terms of being, if I say an anachronistic circuit, that's said with great affection. It's an old style circuit built in the 1920s. We were talking again yesterday about how it was built to give employment in an area that was really poor, very rural area. And when you get a high shot looking down along the dotting hoa, all the factories and team entities on the other side of the road, just behind where we go and buy our models and get our passes and our books uh, for each of the seasons. It's a phenomenal bringer of industry and a lot of manufacturers, not just of cars, but tyres have a base here. This circuit is used almost seven days a week for manufacturers to test their cars. It's living proof that a great circuit has a huge role to play. And of course, with all the different mixes of weather we get here, the manufacturers of tyres, of, of their rubber and the manufacturers of the cars have so much to learn and they've worked that one out and that's why they use it all year to develop their very greatest tools. Just caught a sight of Arno Klassen in his Equipe Vitesse Audi R8. We might not have an Audi right at the sharp end of the field as yesterday, but there is one, there are a couple in fact in SP9 AM and the AM category is led by Verimenko's Utah racing car, Klassen running third in that division right now, but uh, they're all trying to catch Alexei Verimenko with his, or prior to this season, experience with K Kramer Racing. But that uh, Audi run by Jutta, the team from Lithuania, who were also in action at the Mugello 12 hours a couple of weekends ago as well, again with an Audi R8 LMS. Partway round, in fact, nearing the end of lap 21 now, both of the leading cars virtually together, head on to the Dottinger Hoor. And Manti EMA versus Falcon Motorsports, still first and second, with about 18 seconds back. It is uh, the number three car of Alessio Picariello. And the sister car is the one in second place. The sister car is Picariello. That's the one that's catching. It's surely not worth making a pass up into the tier garden because Joel Eriksson, the Swedish driver, knows that his car will be coming in for a pit stop this time around. It will complete 21 laps and will make its third and hopefully final pit stop. So as he accelerates away, he's going to be kinking to the right. He does that now. Goes between the white lines to enter the pit lane and break as late as possible. Get it down to the speed limit before he gets to the control tower. Job done. Now it's going to be a pit stop, but he knows for well this is going to be about 20 seconds longer than it will be next time around for uh, Lawrence Van Tor. And then Picariello and Pepper, currently third and fourth, will come in two laps after now, and they'll gain another 20 plus seconds on that. So he's going to fall from the reckoning. Uh, Joel Eriksson had a really good run yesterday, took victory yesterday but today not to be the day. But for Falcon Motorsport, having two cars at the front end, they can run those different race strategies. They got it up front right at the beginning when two cars, the number four, the one that Ericsson's driving now, and the number six, Halp Racing Team, Mercedes, they pitted after only five laps, took the advantage, got to the front of the field with those short early stops. Now, unfortunately, they had to pay it all back that will take them from the mix. But I think we're going to be in for a real treat in two laps time when we should have the Manti Porsche, the number three Falker Motorsport Porsche and the 27 team abbed Lamborghini almost nose to tail after the final pit stop. Yeah. Well, the gap 
timed at the end of lap 21. Vantor to Picariello, the new second place car, is only 17 seconds. And you reckon as much as 21 can be caught back by, In the final a, pit stop. by a pit stop that's done a, a, a lap later, eight minutes later. Yeah. It seems to be that magical 2021 20, second uh, advantage by pitting a lap later towards yeah. the end of the race. So now, that, that should be more enough, than enough. Have we had enough slow zones for Manti Racing to eke a longer stint? I really do always feel that eight laps is, is a maximum. We did see from Conrad Motorsport, they had the formation lap and then eight racing laps. That's a nine lap stint. But they were running at an abated pace, which certainly yeah. Lawrence Van Tor has not been running at. He's been running at uh, absolutely cracking pace at the front of the field. I think they'd be crazy to try and risk that just to just to benefit from a quicker final stop. Um, you know, a car that is a top-notch and current GT3 car will be burning as much fuel as as every GT3 car has generally done over the years. I, I don't know whether Lamp, whether the Comrade car was given a, a fuel break as such, because that is a, a, an older car and technically out of its now global homologation for GT3. That ended, as far as I can read, uh, in 2023, uh, at the December of last year. So the Evo 1 is a different beast entirely these days. And unfortunately, as Danny Sufi came in for that car's second pit stop, it then did not emer emerge. And I still think that car... Oh, no, he's running again with Torsten Kratz at the wheel, but sadly down in 36th position. Amazingly, they are still second in SB9 Pro-Am because that was a really, relatively small entry uh, of which both leaders have hit big dramas this race. The number six car that leads Pro-Am is now Dennis Fetzer for Team Advan in the Mercedes that started on the front row but had that very long pit stop, 10, 11 minutes or so when Hubert Hout was driving it. And speaking of the number six car, it is now due for a pit stop. In comes Dennis Fetzer from 16th position overall, but still, as I say, the lead of SB9 Pro-Am. Yeah, well, you know, you've had the setback, you keep on racing. Great to have the Renazzo racing team competing here, bringing another Lamborghini. It's yellow with uh, black flashes on it, Renazzo. Both sport team, Kiki Taknana, Christoph Breuer and Dieter Schmidtman. Schmidtman on board at the moment. That's uh, down in... Scroll, scroll, scroll. The 15th position overall, 20 laps completed. Of course, 21 laps completed by Lawrence Van Tor by uh, Falcon Motorsport number four. That's just been handed to Tim Heinemann. So talk of Nico Mensel staying on for the Sunday were just talk. Heinemann didn't compete yesterday, but uh, that will come out into a effective fourth, possibly fifth position, but it's had its final pit stop. And then comes Alessio Picariello, Jordan Pepper, separated by just 1.3 seconds. So very, very close. And the two crews are going to be making the last of the pit stops for the front runners. Right now, though, another lap for Lawrence Van Tour. Uh, started at 16.7 seconds clear of Alessio Picariello. We'll be hoping his in-lap is a really quick one. He's going to have to try and squeak every second or fraction of a second he possibly can because the progress of Picariello up into third and Jordan Pepper into fourth with the fact their final pit stops are coming up after the Manti car will put them out first and second. But what can Lawrence do? Can he find a second here, a second there? Well, he's going to have to. Yeah. He's going to try and make it another podium position today or certainly have a chance at the top step. All the code 60s around the racing lap have been lifted now. There's only local yellows at Eschbach. And as I say that, they are clear as well. So a clear racetrack with now less than an hour to go. We've got 55 minutes and change. And it's set to all perhaps switch around at the head of the order because Lawrence Van Tor, who began this lap leading Alessio Picariello by about 16 and a half seconds, has to pit at the end of this, whereas Picariello and the chasing Jordan Pepper can stay out for a further lap. And why wouldn't they? Because they set to benefit from a shorter pit stop, pitting closer to the chequered flag. Concentrating for a moment, though, on the 680 BMW, which runs in the 240i division. Sixth place in class for that car. And the 240i's have always been competitive throughout the, the four hours. It's sort of designed to be that way. Yannick Reinhardt sharing with a certain Timo Glock, by the way, in this car. And Daniel Durschuk is uh, completes the three driver lineup as i say they are outside of the top five in this category at the moment because it is still joshua goodman in the 650 car that leads the way in that car sorry toby goodman rather uh, sharing with ranko mayatovic and sven market and sven 
had a blistering opening stint yesterday. He did exactly the same today, the Berliner, putting the 650 Adrenaline Motorsport Manhattan Wheels car in a great spot for another trophy on Sunday. Yeah, just taking a little look down through the classes. Cup 2 is being led by... Uh car number 124 for Mulner Motorsport. It's been a real battle between them, Johnny, hasn't it, and the Black Falcon team. Mulner are first and third in class, 124 ahead of 122. In between is uh, 148, as you just uh, pointed out. Cup three, scroll back down, that's the class entirely uh, for Porsche Caymans, and it's uh, Moritz Oberheim leading in the number, the yellow number 962. So for Avia w &S Motorsport, we saw one of their cars off the track early on in today's race. That was the one that was knocked out at the final corner of the last lap yesterday, car number 120. So they didn't have the luck today either, but at least the Avia w &S Motorsport crew may come away with a class victory, looking for their uh, margin of advantage over Smurlis Racing, well, it's actually very, very comfortable indeed. And uh, they have both done just two pit stops, one more pit stop to come for those, but at least Avia WNS, you know, when a team has an up and a down, at least it's counterbalanced. So they may well be doing it. But next, this time around, we're looking to see our race leader come in for the final pit stop. It's car number 911, Manti EMA. Around the course this lap, has it gained or lost to those that are chasing? And unfortunately for them, no, in fact, it's balanced out across the sectors, but uh, it, uh, we reckon, Johnny, that car, the, the Lawrence Van Tour driven 911, probably given back to... No, in fact, uh, Kevin Estra did the first two stints, didn't he? he? Did. So Lawrence will do the second two. Uh, will come out just behind incidents providing Alessio Picariello and Jordan Pepper in the number three Falcon Motorsport Porsche and the Red Bull... Team Abs, number 27, a Lamborghini. So Porsche, Porsche, Lamborghini, give the pack a shuffle. Let's see where we end up. But we're getting close to the finish, into the final, uh, almost the final 50 minutes. Oh, oh, the Porsche's slowing. That's the number three car. It had issues yesterday. And all of a sudden, the Lamborghini of Jordan Pepper shot by at top speed because Picariello has got a puncture. It's a rear left, which literally let go halfway down the Dottinger Hoare. And all of a sudden, because it, it was around slower moving traffic initially, I didn't see the drop off in speed, but then a, a dark blue car, which was the, the Red Bull livery Lamborghini, shot by. Vicariello nearly runs the car off the road now because he's trying to get it back in such a hurry. And this is res risking damage to the rear left corner. So he's not gonna be able to make the eight laps. In fact, it's seven. And with that, of course, it's gonna be a longer pit stop as well. Jordan Pepper now with a huge advantage over everybody else. Yeah, Jordan Pepper should be in the lead of the race because uh, the Manti EMA Porsche in for its final pit stops. That's 22 laps on the board. The Lamborghini that was just at the back of the six car pack in the first start, the start of the early stages of the race is going to be coming out shortly after its pit stop in a lap time, providing it doesn't have a puncture. You have to add to the mix, but for number three, this is a car that could and should have won yesterday, and then it had two problems, a drive-through penalty, and then something that caused it to stop. They cannot buy luck, the number three crew, but they know they've got the pace. There we were, a minute ago, looking as it had a small advantage over, over Jordan Pepper and the team lapped Lamborghini. Now, then, possibly not even going to finish in fifth place. Has there been any damage? Because certainly, Johnny, it was being driven back as fast as, if maybe not, maybe even slightly faster than possible uh, to try and reduce the deficit. It, but it's always the potential for counteractivity, I think we could say. A little bit too fast, possible damage. But in fact, it must be said, the left rear wheel arch looks pretty tidy from the outside. So maybe no bodywork, but you never know what it's done to the suspension. What tyres is the Lamborghini Red Bull car actually on? Do, do, do we ever get to the bottom of that? I didn't. It's going too fast no. for me to read them. No, indeed. Around around. Um, it's an apt car, isn't it? I don't, I'm not sure I'll, whatever I can pick out a picture of the car and close in. I think it should be on Michelin's. Yeah, it is in that image. Well, indeed. But that, How old is the image? Uh, it, well, it's a, it's a, a Nürburgring Langstrecken series publicity shot, which was put on X uh, in the middle of March. That lines, app sports line with Lamborghini Huracan Evo 2 at the beginning of the racing season. Surely those images were released by the team though. So let's tentatively say it's on Michelin's rather than Falcon tires. I mean, that's not necessarily 
down to the construction of the tyre. It might be down to the amount of kerb that Picariello has been hitting. I would doubt it's down to camber settings because Falcon know far better to compromise those and go, you know, at uh, ludicrous angles with the potential risk. They're not putting that rear left tyre on though at the moment. So even though this is a minimum pit stop reference time, Picariello opening the door of the car. And are they now suggesting that this car can go no further? Just as was the case yesterday from the strongest possible position. This has, two. this has slipped through their fingers again. And of course, Picario's about to get out. I think he's flapped the door open, uh, swung back on him, but as he's just trying to keep the cockpit cool, but the Dolly Jacks are going under that number three Porsche. Yeah. The Belgian driver gets out. He's going to be thinking, you know what, it's really good. I've used up all my bad luck that I was going to take for the 24 hours of the ring. Of course, next weekend is the uh, qualifying weekend here, all covered on radio show limited network of channels, but uh, well, suddenly the sister cars in with the hope of a podium that surely has promoted the number four crew into third place overall. We think the number 27 Lamborghini, bear in mind it was running six in the early stages of the race in the first of the four hours, was trying to get into fifth, didn't quite have the ultimate pace, but it just got better and better as the days warmed up, the track has warmed up, and when you've got a car in the hands of a, cap as cr a crew as capable as the South African duo of Kelvin van der Linde and Jordan Pepper. It's always going to be in the mix, but it's just been getting closer and closer to the spe sweet spot. So the battle for the lead is going to be between the car that's leading at the moment, which is uh, Lawrence Van Tor, but he will be coming in to make his final pit stop. He's only just set heading out onto the Nordschleife now. Done the final pit stop. This is the outlap. Sorry, I what reckon. am I talking about? I, yes, I've written that down already. Yeah. So eight laps completed. So he laps, uh, came in after lap seven, lap, lap 14, lap 22. Lap 23 will be, be the final pit stop uh, for number 27, the Lamborghini that, uh, you know, came here with marginal hopes. But looking at the form of Bantai yesterday and today, the Falcon Motorsport Porsches yesterday and today, the Shira Sport PHX Audi yesterday, all very, very strong indeed. But the Lamborghini, as I said, getting better and better through the course of this two day meeting. But the point is, not only does the Lambo have great road position at this time, but it's also going to be the let's actually cut that off. Let's hear from Picariello with his thoughts after that puncture. So uh, tire uh, alarm, and then all of a sudden they explode. So uh, it, was, it was at full speed, and it was a bit scary to be honest. But yeah, like I said, no warning, so I'm not sure from where they come from. Probably a debris. Uh, but yeah, it's unfortunate that then we decided, of course, to retire the car because it makes no sense to continue now because we lost the podium and everything. So we bring it up. You said you saw the tire alarm. Is that something on your dashboard? How does it work? Yeah, exactly. In the dash, we can see the tire pressures, and uh, if they go below a certain number or if they go down too fast, we have a, a warning or an alarm. So I had the alarm for like one two seconds, and then all of a sudden we explode. So uh, yeah, it was uh, probably a debris, I guess. But, uh, yeah. It's unfortunate. So the time span between the first warning and the actual puncture was about two seconds going to 50 to 60. Yeah, exactly. I had no time to even slow down. So this was the scary part because the tire exploded at really high speed and the car was going sideways a bit. So uh, luckily, uh, no too much damage, but uh, yeah, it's a bit sad. Auf jeden Fall nicht nur traurig, wie er gerade sagt, sondern auch ein bisschen well, phenomenally brave from Alessio Picariello and then to be able to put things across to Lucas Gajewski in such a calm and collected manner. That's the beauty of these racing drivers, I suppose. Had to be able to de decompartmentalize the situation. It could have been a heck of a lot worse than that. We've seen cars spinning and hitting the barriers on the dotting of hole left and right. So lurid is the spin. So it sounds like he did incredibly well to hang on to the car. And uh, Lukas Gajewski wasting no time at all in catching up with the Belgian racer, who is now officially out of the race. The point I was making is that no other SP9 car is going to pit this close to the chequered flag than the Red Bull team at Huracan. Therefore, it can spend less time in the pit lane, and it already should have a road position mar uh, advantage anyway. It's not leading... No, oh, is it leading on the road at well, this it, stage? It, it, it is leading yeah, on the road. Is, because so it's already course, leading. But the Van Tour car came in for Van Tite EMA after 22 laps. This yeah. is lap 23. And still a fair distance to go around this lap. We've got uh, 45 minutes in this race remaining. But certainly the pendulum has swung in the favour of Lamborghini. For so many years we've been looking for a Lamborghini victory here. And hey presto. Mm. Could be here today, could be now. So for... 
the app team, which doesn't have as many years of experience on the Nord Schleifer races. You know, this could be day of days. And if you talk about momentum, you think about last year when uh, the first Ferrari 296 GT3 victory uh, was, was coming up. And uh, they did it in the 25s. Right. If you want your puncture, uh, puncture to happen, you don't want it at enormously high speed, but you do probably prefer to have it in a straight line and uh, just being treated to a, 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 a replay package there and the twitching side side by side. But as we heard from, from Lucas when he was talking and interviewing uh, Alessio Picariello, two seconds from the warning to the, the bang. But debris, you know, I, what I was about to say is that in the real here to the battle, We've had a lot of guys running out, cars running out over the curves, but towards the end of the race, because they were on slightly different tactics to each other, the driving was getting a whole lot smoother. But at any point, you can suddenly have to change your line when you're coming across back markers. So there is a lot of curb hitting, but some curves drivers will learn they can hit without any punishment at all. And others are rather larger, and particularly halfway around the circuit, uh, when you're going ex Muller and Bergwerken around there, there's some real thumpers. And if you get those wrong, they literally spit the car across the track. Yeah. Here we go then, Jordan Pepper is into the pits. We think for the final time, well, surely it is because 44 minutes or so to the finish, depending on where the race leader is as he crosses the line for the final time, we will extend that race distance because of course the checker flag will wait for the leader. But Jordan Pepper's number 27, Red Bull team at Lamborghini being rotated to about 45 degrees to the to the pit garages and the fast lane. That's all part and parcel of a standard pit stop to make sure that the exit is as clean and clinical as possible. And 23 laps completed. The big question now is where is Laurence Vantor? He hasn't yet reached the end of the fourth sector. That should take him just a more than three minutes. And uh, as if by magic, I can now clap eyes on the Manti EMA Porsche that is running in second position, but how close can it get to this Lamborghini? It was a six second deficit for Jordan Pepper. We reckon it'll swing massively in the favor though of the Red Bull livery car, and even more so now because the Manti car getting delayed in traffic, having to get out of the throttle briefly there because there were two slower cars occupying lane one and lane two, and it was just a wall of uh, rear wing that was being faced by Lawrence Vantor. He had to just be patient heading towards the Stefan Beloff S and Schwalben Schwanz. So that tells you how close he is to the start of the Dottinger Hoare, but he's got to do all of that long straight before then heading back onto the main start finish line. And by that point, Jordan Pepper could be back into the race from the pit lane. You really feel you can have a really clear series of laps and the lap that really, really counts where you're just trying to make sure you're as close as possible. The traffic just sits in front of you. It's not their fault. It's just simply how how it happens to be. I was having a little, little look back for non-German race winners in the VLN, followed by the NLS in recent years, and I can't offer you a great deal. 2015, you could uh, there was a victory for a Ford GT. That was Dominic Schwager and Uwe Altsen. And then all others around them are Mercedes wins, Porsche wins. 2016, I, I can uh, throw into the mix a, a victory for a Lexus by Farnbacker Racing, Dominic and uh, Mario Farnbacker. And 2021, unless my notes are slightly incomplete, was another. It was Aston Martin, and that was uh, the inimitable duo of uh, Maxime Martin and Nicky Team. Other than that, it's all been German race cars. Italian race cars, they haven't put their nose in front. Maybe no. today is going to be the day. Well, the Lamborghini Huracan Evo 2 is released from the pit lane, and this might be the time to do a quick bit of hand timing on the sectors to work out precisely the gap between these two cars now, the Lamborghini driven by Jordan Pepper and the chasing Laurence Vantor car, because it's going to be a significant chunk of time. There is a, a timing split, a minute and six seconds from the start finish straight and that's in and around the Vidal chicane area of the Grand Prix lap that they will be heading towards or the, at least the Lamborghini will be heading towards very shortly indeed they're in a very strong position here there it goes so I've started the clock the sector one timing split has been reached by Jordan Pepper let's see how long it takes Lauren Vantor to reach that Right, into the first of the Sabine Schmitz curves goes the Lamborghini, and in that kinked run into the compression up to the Vidal chicane, it's only in the kink at the bottom as it rises up. Uh, that's where the, the 
Porsche from Manti EMA Racing. So it is actually a huge, huge lead that managed to affect there. Slow zones may have helped, may have hindered, but uh, we expected the Lamborghini to come out about two, three seconds in front, but it's more like 30 seconds. 28.6, you're saying, Johnny? There or there. I wouldn't necessarily argue about the point six, but 27, 28 seconds with 40 minutes to try and close that up. Now, with the track virtually clear, that is a tough, tough ask. What Vantor desperately wants now is some sort of incident around the racetrack, causing yellows, causing a code 60, and that might be the chance to catch some of the time back up again. Right, on the last lap, why did the gap go out so much? 9-11, Romante lost around 30 seconds due to a code 60 at Metzgersfeld on the last lap. Otherwise, take that away, 30 minus 28.6 seconds, they'd be almost nose to tail, 1.4 seconds. So. Uh, it was going to be close, it was going to be a chase to the finish. Now we've been denied that, but uh, you never know, there could be a slow zone that would catches out our race leader. But suddenly for Abt, they'll be going, well, this is good, isn't it? We should do this more often. <laughs> yes. But there are now yellows at Callenhard, which have just been announced, and Metzgersfeld affected, as we've mentioned, too. So how much time can be bought back by Lawrence Vantor if he's a little bit later on the brakes than the Lamborghini? The difficulty is that they need to be closer to each other to be able to then catch more time back up, if you understand, so that if the Lamborghini gets caught in some traffic going into a double-waved yellow, it will have to back off, and perhaps the Porsche won't do. But because they're in different sectors of the lap, that's unlikely to happen at this stage. And obviously, the bigger the gap grows, the, the more work that Lawrence Vantor has to do. He's got to be patient on the approach to Schwedenkreutz, and indeed the exit of that quick, or ordinarily quick, left-hander. It's much slower at the moment with a code 60 in place, and they've just upgraded the caution at Callenhard now to a slow zone, well, from a slow zone to a code 60 at a couple of marshal posts at Callenhard, both 105 and 106. You really have to feel for drivers that, you know, a pair of drivers or even three drivers haven't put a, a wheel wrong in the race and just simply getting a, a code 60, a slow zone at the wrong place, at the wrong moment, that your arrival does not get copped, get hit with, and suddenly it's all gone away. All that Lawrence Van Dor Dor can do is just chase, chase, chase. 37 minutes remain in this race, but suddenly for Jordan Pepper, he's going, hallelujah, this is, this is fantastic. But, you know, he expected to come out of his pit stop and see as soon as he was turning down into turn one, coming out of the pit exit, to see the bright yellow and green Manti EMA car coming there and possibly maybe being close enough to even try and outbreak him down into the first corner. But he came out. Manti car was not to be seen. Then he must be on the radio to his pit crew going, what's happening, what's happening? But he's in front, now he can simply concentrate. But what catches out one can catch out a rival. Let's take a look down through the classes. SPX is still in the hands of uh, Glickenhaus Racing. They are the only car in that class. On the timing sheets, they're listed as third overall. That's slightly inaccurate, simply because they were in third position and they came into the pits. It's gone back out with... Um, Lance David Arnold for the, the the run to the flag, but that will fall behind Tim Heineman in the number four Falker Motorsport Porsche, and I would suggest also Frank Bird in the Hout Racing Team Mercedes that's holding down fifth place at the moment. From the lead of Cup 2, Peter Turting has come in, the Mulner Motorsport, uh, obviously a Porsche, a 911 GT3 Cup car. That's from sixth. Seventh place is Black Falcon, number 148. That's second in the tup, Cup 2 class. And uh, again, being very competitive, Tobias Muller at the wheel of that. But really, Peter Turting and the gang of the 124 crew have got this one surely in the bag for Mulder Motorsport. So that's uh, Moritz Kranz and Peter Turting. I just noticed the name Jack Aitken appear on my timing screen. Now, do we reckon he wasn't meant to be racing today? He's not in the Hyundai, but he is in a Smurlis Racing BMW 240i, I've noticed. So, bagged himself a late drive in the 660. Well, maybe because I think they, they hit mechanical problems yesterday. He probably wanted to get a few more laps under his belt, or maybe he just had simply so much fun and, you know, hey, the next week can swing. But running third in class, yeah. uh, in fact, just a short distance ahead of the sister car. So 660 and 662. So, actually, it's not just time on the track, it's time driving different cars. These aren't the cars he'll answer want to be racing because of course somebody races at the top level of a uh, hypercar around the world but uh, I think there was only one driver yeah there was one driver originally in, on the entry list and for then that. that was the one with Justin Bruce 
Witchman joining and Jack Aitken. You keep there finding you these things out. Here we are, just about the final half hour of the race, and up pops a sort of global racing superstar. But uh, certainly for Jack Aitken, that's good. A bit more mileage, why not? Well, he's here, he's on site, and uh, presumably nothing else planned for Sunday. He's already stated to Lucas Gajewski that sadly he won't be able to put uh, or tick off the Nürburgring 24 hours this year because it clashes with the IMSA race at Detroit sure, yeah. at the end of May, start of June. And that, of course, is a, 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 I'm not sure whether it's all the classes for the IMSA, whether Tech Sports Car Challenge involved in Detroit, but it will involve GTP, which is what uh, Jack Aitken races in otherwise known as or in the World Endurance Championship, same cars, but they are called hypercar. Instead, a combination of LMH and LMDH machinery in the World Endurance Championship. Jordan Pepper, along with Kelvin van der Linde, effectively both leading this race. Kelvin van der Linde did stints one and two, and fellow South African taking over for stints three and now four with the Toyo Tyres car just up ahead, and he can draw level with that, and in fact, put a lap on it as they squeeze, as that car squeezes through. And in fact, they, he now reaches the Dottinger Hoor. So that was at Galgenkopf, and he needed to be cautious through a, that blind right-hander, which is full commitment. You cannot afford to blend out of the throttle there if you can avoid it, because that will then determine your top speed on the fastest part of the circuit. Waiting for Laurence Vantor to appear at the start of the Dottinger Hoor. I reckon the gap was about 28 seconds before we got going. Well, that's a big gain for Laurence Vantor to the tune of nearly three seconds, but he needs it to be going a lot more in his favour in the closing 33 minutes. There are one or two code 60s out on the track, including now at Adenauer Forest and Metzgersfeld, still affected by a code 60 zone at Marshall Post 100. So will we get three more laps? Will we get four? 24 laps on the board. I'm just doing some very simple mental arithmetic there, and four would be a bit of an ask. All we need is one slow zone. So let's call it three. We'll get to 27 laps on the board, which is what we ended up with yesterday. Gap between first and second, but we've got to wait. Jordan Pepper sets off on another lap. He's gone through the second part, or turn two on the four-turn Mercedes Arena. We wait, we wait, we wait. 23 seconds, so five seconds gained there by Lawrence Van Tor on that lap, but even if he does, five seconds a lap for each of the next three laps. That's not going to be enough to take him up to victory, but that's not the case that he's going to stop trying. He's certainly no. going to be pushing on and see where that's going to take him. Well, that fits, actually, because around two seconds quicker Van Tor was through sector three than Jordan Pepper, and as I say, it was very nearly a three-second gain through sector four. So... Well, if he can keep going at that sort of pace, then we could have a very close finish indeed. And that's the catching done. The problem is then he may only have one stab at an overtake. The final time they go down the dotting a whore. And is there an element of Jordan Pepper just reining the pace back a little bit here to avoid any errors and to bide his time through the traffic? So if he needs to up the pace, I'm sure the team will be straight on the radio to say, just give us a little bit more, Jordan, if you don't mind. He may also be looking after the tyres in the first half of this stint to make sure that there's plenty of meat on them in the closing stages. Yes, they're running with a different tyre manufacturer with the Lamborghini compared to the Falcon machine, but they will know a great deal about how quickly a race can go south if you pick up some debris unknown to you and unknown indeed to the tyre sensors that are on the dashboard as Alessio Picariello was so accurately describing. He had about two seconds warning that the pressure was dropping in the tyre and then it fully exploded and the car control at uh, 250 kph, something like that, uh, was phenomenal. And don't forget, that's the point when the drivers are running along the dotting herb where they get a real chance to check all the gauges and stuff. So he yes. would have been looking in the right vicinity to see a warning light suddenly come on, but suddenly was followed by suddenly. And uh, that was where the, where, where the puncture occurred, but at least it was in a straight line. But the onboard footage shows that that's where you're starting to, to wrestle something that's uh, really moving around in a way it shouldn't, but it was in a straight line and just to compound yesterday's disappointment where there was a very, very late non-finish just as it had worked its way back. Having gone through a drive-through penalty, got that under its belt, lost the ground, went to fourth place, got back to third place, looked so like some good points for the championship would come their way. And then Alessio Picariano had to park it today. It was rather more dramatic, but over and out for them. 
Let's take a little look down to cup three. That's a, in fact, we've got a clear leader, 962. Moritz Oberheim is leading that by actually a country mile, but second and third place is 952, which is uh, Danny Rink, former champion for Smurlis Racing, and uh, the 950 of Schmickler performance, uh, nose to tail behind uh, for second and third. In fact, it's uh, switched around because Schmickler's gone up into, oh, there's a pit stop for one of the runners. Uh, the Rink car came in for a pit stop. That's fallen to fourth, so in fact, Frank Schmickler by the tiniest of margin in 9.50, ahead of 9.30. It's always a packed class, the Porsche Cayman Cup class. Cup three, as we call it here. Started uh, today with 13 cars in class. Always great, great racing, but uh, now, is Schmickler going to be able to pull away? 9.50 at the moment, it's in the hands of, you always have to check which generation of Schmickler, but it's uh, Stefan Schmickler. And that one. Roland Frusa, I reckon, in 9.30, the car mm -hmm. he shares with David Greaser and Stefan Cruiser. I remember mentioning Cruiser's name, not Max Cruiser, but Stefan Cruiser uh, in the 9.30 earlier on. They're about to be caught by the number six Mercedes, trying to force its way around the outside of the Ravenhall left and right sweeper. And driving the number six is a recovering Dennis Fetzer, but still leading the SP9 Pro-Am part of the race after a long pit stop for Hubert Haupt in that Yokohama Advan Mercedes earlier on in the opening hour. We're inside the final 30 minutes though now, folks. So this is really coming to a head between the Lamborghini Huracan and the Porsche 911 for Jordan Pepper of, for Red Bull Team Apt and the Manti Porsche of Laurence Van Tor. Still no way by for Roland Frusa uh, on the car in front, who is well, either Stefan or Marcus Schmickler in 9.50. As we said, because of the pit stop for the rink-driven car that was running second at the time. Also very close in Cup 2, not for the lead. Peter Turting is leading by 24 seconds. But a couple of cars are back to cross the line that are absolutely together. Just trying to identify which ones they are. It's Halber oh, it's, it's, and, and Sturzberg, 117 and 103, is it not? Or is it 121, actually, with that snazzy race livery? Just waiting to look as it goes down into the first corner. It is 121, so we have to go a little bit further down the, the running order. And that was a car that had contact with 103. Remember 103, the driver of that... Uh, Mayor Kasma, uh, uh, Mayor, sorry, Mayor, Mayor had to be um, given a penal, pen, penalised for a little bit of contact there. But, uh, but the other thing I've noticed is that the 148 car of Tobias Muller's just crossed the line as the leading Cup oh, 2 yeah. car. That's not what I said a moment or two ago, so that has changed as well. Yeah, because Peter Turting now has three pit stops to, to his car's are. name. And, yes. Uh, and in fact, this is an outlap for the 124 car, so that's what's delayed it compared to the previous lap completed. We will expect that the Muller car will need to pit again because it's only made two stops so far. So one more stop at some point in the remaining half an hour will definitely even that up. The benefit there, of course, is the 148 should be able to take a very quick stop because it's much closer to the chequered flag. And remember, it's all about the minutes that remain between the time you pit and the end of the race, the hour of four o'clock. Lots of green arriving again on the racetrack. We haven't quite got rid of the Code 60s at Adenau Forest and Metzgersfeld, but at least Exmuller is now clear. There, in fact, is a new Code 60 area at Metzgersfeld, which is Marshall Post 101. Metzgersfeld is actually a, considered to be quite a large area with the two left-handers that then lead on into Callenhard and Versaifen. Now, what we wanted in the in the chase, the flag, we knew that 30-second loss or thereabouts for Lawrence Van Tour, uh, instead of ha having him almost be on the, the, the heels of uh, Jordan Pepper when the Lamborghini driver emerged from the final pit stop for the 27 crew, but with uh, losing about 30 seconds around Metzgersfeld, that has really hit them hard. And unfortunately uh, for Lawrence Van Tour, this lap hasn't been particularly kind to him either. Instead of catching uh, Jordan Pepper bit by bit, He'd have probably run out of time anyhow. Lawrence Van Tour is falling away. Let's wait. They've just gone through the first three timing sectors, waiting for sector four, but that's the longest sector. It's normally about uh, just north of three minutes. But we said, even if he was gaining five seconds a lap, it wasn't going to be enough in good, clean running through to the end of this four-hour race. We've got 25 minutes and small change remaining, but uh, it's going the wrong way instead of the right way at the front of the field. 
well, certainly the wrong way if you, if, if you particularly want Manti EMA to win. In fact, I think in so many ways it'd be fantastic for Hans Jürgen Abs team to win. They've had success in all sorts of places. Oh dear, even it's late stage, just on the exit of the chicane, and uh, possibly now peeling the back way to the pits. The one of the Hyundai is one of the I thirty ends, but that gets going all over again. Might be 492. It is 492. I thought that was roughly in that sort of area and had had a slow first sector. One of another of the Mertens Motorsports entered cars. So 492. Alex Schneider with the issues there. Nicholas Walter and Akshay Gupta are the three drivers assigned to the Mertens Motorsport, although run by MSC Adenau. Uh, so, so many cars are in the lower categories. Mantai back to the start-finish line. This will be to complete the 25th lap for Lawrence Van Tour. And earlier on in the piece, Kevin Estre did the opening couple of stints. What's the gap then? It was 23 seconds a lap ago. Across the line, it's down to 22 seconds. So not the five seconds that were gained on the previous lap around. And this is a tougher ask all of a sudden for Manti Racing to close the gap on the Lamborghini Huracan of Jordan Pepper. Well, remember, we thought with three laps to go that uh, five seconds was what uh, the Manti car had gained the previous lap. If they could do that, if Lawrence Van Tor could do that three times in a row after that, he kept it within seven seconds, maybe six seconds. But then, of course, as you pointed out, Johnny, getting close is one thing and passing is all, absolutely another. And when you're running in SP9, if someone's only marginally slower than you, they are very, very difficult to pass. And your, your advantage is not going to come your way around the Nordschleife unless something untoward happens. A driver pulls in front of the car and ahead of you and they lose momentum and you gain it still would be close enough to make it a very interesting indeed and there may be something that springs up and uh, makes it happen but, but not gaining five seconds a lap has, has really hurt now we've got uh, this lap and did we work out the one one and a half more to go here we've got the final three laps and uh, the gap 22.1 seconds that is a big big ask for Lawrence Van Tour but it ain't over till it's over again uh, Van Tour given the choice would want a bit more uh, incident around the track just because that couldn't potentially close a 10 second gap to absolutely nothing and he want two of those of course so almost needing snookers at this point with 22 seconds left on the clock and only three laps to play with there or thereabout I mean if we stay at the eight and a half minute marker that's 16 17 minutes yeah just going into a third lap if we stay at this kind of pace there are Three Code 60 zones on the racetrack at the moment. Adenau Forest and Metzgersfeld is where you find those, together with a couple of yellow flags into the foxhole that then lead into that Adenau Forest incident. Clear road in front for Tim Heinemann. We haven't had an Nico Menzel, have we? Even though his name was on the entry list and on our graphics as well. You, you rather suggested that Nico wouldn't be racing today, and so it's proven. So Heinemann taking the full place of Nico Menzel and joining Joel Eriksson after his great stints yesterday. So Heinemann plugged in for stints two and four today. Frank Bird taking back over from Daniel Junkadeo in the number 14 Mercedes AMG. GT3 from the HRT team. Yeah, with all the, all the comings and goings, it's only SP9 class cars in the top four positions. Fifth place, the lone car in SPX. It's been a much better run today for Glickenhaus Racing LLC. They got their best lap down to eight minutes, 2.2 seconds. That's within four seconds of the ultimate lap today. So ever more competitive for the, the, the bright blue, the sky blue. Lickenhaus, a big, big fan favourite over the years here on the Nordschleife uh, Cup 2, still in at the moment in the hands of Black Falcon entry car 148. Has only made two pit stops, however, so I think it'll then swing back to 124. Peter Turting did have a, I think you said, Johnny, a 24 second advantage not so long ago. Then that disappeared because the car went into the pits, but uh, it should be going back into the lead. I think it could be third place in class for the second Milner Motorsport car, that's car number 122, driven by Krantz at the moment. So Schmickler, one of either Stefan or Marcus, crosses the line now in the Bauman-sponsored Porsche Cayman. And the order in Cup 3 sees 
the number 962 of Moritz Oberheim continuing to lead, but the Schmickler car for a Schmickler performance running in second place as we've got just a handful, 20 minutes still to go. And a tough, tough ass. Fans besucht unsere Social Media Kanäle auf Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter und TikTok. Willkommen bei der NLS. The second race in two days of the NLS, the ADAC Reinaldus Langstrecken Rennen, following the ADAC ACAS Cup yeah. yesterday. We had four hours of action and thrilling it was throughout. This has been uh, fascinating, but possibly for different reasons. We've had uh, much more drop off in the SP9 Pro Field. Four of them remain at the sharp end. And I'm not sure many people at the start of this race would have predicted that Lamborghini would be in such a strong position to take, well, a first non-German win in, in NLS for quite some time. We obviously had a Ferrari 296 running yes, uh, last year for Fricadelli Racing in the N24, but in the more bread and butter rounds of the NLS, this is a rare treat. A, a rare, it could be the fourth one since 2015, but it's good it's been shared around. A Ford did it in 2015, 2016 was Lexus, 2021 was Aston Martin, but that's mm. three years ago. Just want to interrupt myself because uh, Lawrence Van Tor is uh, ch giving chase in the Manta EMA car, but he just gained eight seconds in one of the three timing sectors we have completed so far. There are five around the lap. His teammate Kevin Estra being interviewed in German, speaks uh, perfect German, the French driver, but if he's keeping an eye on the timing screen, I don't think he had much hope. It, it was a race that could have come their way. It wasn't going to go their way. Brilliant run from the Lamborghini. Certainly a few brakes came their way, but losing 30 seconds in a slow zone that didn't get caught by the number 27 Lamborghini. Instead of them coming out very, very close to each other with this final stint, the Lamborghini should have emerged about one and a half seconds in front. Suddenly, it was 28 seconds on the clock. Start of this lap, that had come down to 22 seconds, but it's going to be this lap and the next one to the end of the race. My golly. Lawrence Van Tours gained 10 seconds so mm -hmm. far on this lap. Maybe he'll gain a few more. Maybe his tyres are sweet. Maybe they're not so sweet on the Lamborghini. Maybe, maybe, if and but. But uh, maybe we're going to have a much, much closer to the finish. We just had to be resigned. And you, we well, could throw out the caveats. Okay, you never know. There could be one car's just lost 30 seconds. The other one could gain it. But at this point, <laughs> the speed is very much... Uh, it's about 12 seconds. It's down to 10 seconds flat. There you go. go. Yeah. What's left on the clock? We've got 15 and a half minutes. That's kind of what I was suggesting with my... my my phrase, my um, analogy, snooker analogy, to say requiring snookers because he needed probably two code 60s on the racetrack, one to clear just as he got to it, which sounds like that's exactly what happened into the foxhole and Adenauer Forest. So that's half of the job done. The
problem, though, now is that there's 15 minutes left. He needs another scenario like that to kick in, I would rather suggest. And we've only got yellow flags at Metzgersfeld. That's not a full code 60. So Jordan Pepper, if he was driving within himself to about 75, 80 percent, will now be getting the warning lights on the dashboard from those at Team App to say, forget that message, up the pace like crazy, Jordan, because your 22 seconds has disappeared to only 10 now. And we have this lap and two more to go before we can call a winner. And uh, it's got a lot, lot more interesting between those two. The other car, of course, to benefit was Tim Heinemann, who went through the run down in the Foxhole and Adenauer Forest at a much greater pace. 157 is really pushing on from Tim Heinemann. In fact, that was the Mercedes, wasn't it? But it was a similar time for Heinemann, who is now heading back onto the... Um, Hats and back section and heading towards Hokaik and, and Kittelbacher So the top three are in the same sector once again. It's Lamborghini from the two chasing Porsches. Look, on that lap, Dries Van Tor, sorry, Dries, you're not here this weekend. Lawrence Van Tor took 11 and a half, 12 seconds out of the race lead. His lead over the chasing Tim Heinemann is down to nine seconds. So maybe something can happen to Van Tor and cost him time. And Tim Heinemann will be back in the mix. But for, for Jordan Pepper, he's got to do this lap, the next one, and maybe a famous win for Team Abt. But are there going to be any other incidents uh, through towards the remainder of this race? But it's ebbed, it's flowed. But in terms of when all was running cleanly, certainly Falcon Motorsport Porsches have been mighty this weekend. The Manta EMA car always there or thereabouts. But it's fantastic to have a Lamborghini properly in the mix. Not in the first stage of the race, it was there or thereabouts. But with each stint, it's had a very, very good average. And this will be a rare, rare treat and the first win for a Lamborghini here on the Nordschleife in the Langstrecken series. So will it get there? The clock is counting down. 13, let's hope it's not oh. unlucky, 13 seconds remain. On the previous lap, now, does that give us an idea of uh, some of a delay as well? Or is this on the current lap for Jordan Pepper? He had to massively slow for a Mulner Motorsport Cup to Porsche, and I think there was contact into the rear. Now, difficult to tell from that distance whether it was Peter Turting or Moritz Krantz who got the shove. Don't think that was a yellow flag area, but it was just a misjudgment from Jordan Pepper to think there was a gap, and then all of a sudden he couldn't get by. And the Mulner car that uh, is working its way through the right hander at Steel Strecker now has. Is that the Halder car behind? Now that's too much of a distance. Peter Turting. If it is Peter Turting, doesn't have a, a fellow Cup 2 car tucked in behind. That is the green and grey. Can't quite read the number on that as to whether that's a Cup 2 car as well. But Tobias Muller has made a pit stop, remember, so that was potentially Peter Turting as the new class leader getting assaulted by Jordan Pepper. Yeah, I'd like to see that replay again to quite work it out, because when you're just suddenly presented with no preamble, one car getting very, very close to another, I thought it was slowing into a, into a slow zone. Mm. But certainly uh, Jordan Pepper got uh, very, very close indeed, just well, waiting for the next timing sector to be completed. They're and reasonable. Staying about 10 seconds, mind. Yeah. So the first sector on the Grand Prix lap favoured Jordan Pepper very slightly. Then some of that was gained back again by Van Tor through sector two. And sector three, three tenths of a second uh, faster for the Belgian versus Jordan Pepper as the race leader. Right, what those uh, Cup 2 cars we're looking at, that is actually the class lead. Remember, it was sorted out on the final corner of the final lap yesterday with a little bit of a contretemps. These are two different cars. It's not 100 versus 120. Today, it's 148 Tobias Muller for Black Falcon. Uh, team, but Peter Turting has moved ahead in the 1 2 4. He ah. wasn't leaving quite comfortably before. By virtue of Muller's pit stop, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's not represented on our screen, of course. I knew Muller had been in for its stop, and of course, Muller's stop so close to the end of the race could be very, very quick indeed. And he's rejoined right behind Peter Turting. Yeah, because before that final round of pit stops, the advantage I seem to recall was uh, 24 seconds for the 1 2 4 car. But uh, as we've talked about, if you're pitting a lap after arrival towards the end of the race, you gain about 21 seconds. Ergo, this battle has come down to next to nothing. But for Mulder Motorsport, first 
in class uh, now Blackpool come back to second and third in class will be the second of the Mourner Motorsport Porsches that's car 122 running ninth overall that's a little bit further back having its own battle with the SP9 class due to racing Audi but along the Dossinger Hoa they go we've got 10 minutes remaining in this race and certainly Muller is getting closer and closer for Black Falcon. Muller just out in front. Peter Turting is a sitting duck, or is he? I think he's got close enough to the, the bridge, just goes over where the dotting her suddenly just kinks to the left. And if you've got that apex, you've got to make your rivals go around the outside. But the Porsche came in up ahead, precisely where the Muller Motorsport one car wants to go. He dives up the inside, but there is no inside. And suddenly he's blocked, loses all momentum into Hock Eichen. And coming out, sorry, not Hock Eichen, sorry. Hohen oh, right. right. And uh, suddenly the momentum is with the chaser going on to what ought to be for them. No, they may squeak one more lap out of this one beyond this. We've got 26 laps on the board. Yeah. Our race leader, Jordan Pepper, his advantage was 10 seconds at the start of the lap. We'll see how much closer Lawrence Van Tor can get. But uh, two days running, a cracking chase to the finish in Cup 2. Just what the doctor ordered. And amazingly, they are still on the lead lap as well. So they've ticked off 26 laps and... I'm not sure they're going to get caught by the race leader, Jordan Pepper. Um, well, it, it would have needed to happen probably before the end of that lap. So nine minutes left on the clock. The next time Pepper crosses the line, there'll be less than a lap time still available. So that should then be the final lap called. He'd need to be on the dotting of her about now in order to make it a 28 lap race. We have had a lot of caution similar to yesterday, so not going to make the 28 lap marker. And indeed, on some occasions, we even get to 29, but it's going to be 27, just as it was yesterday. And uh, this time, the Manti Porsche can just about see the dark blue Red Bull team at Lamborghini Huracan in the distance. More time being taken with every sector, but it is... A little bit of change here and there. Nothing significant has happened a full lap ago when a 22 second advantage became only 10. So it was more than halved by Lawrence Vantel. That wasn't down to the immense talent of the Belgian racer, but more because a code 60 disappeared just as he arrived on the scene, whereas Jordan Pepper, of course, had to abide by it. Yeah, just waiting to see it. 27 laps on the border, eight minute, one second lap for our race leader, Jordan Pepper. That's very competitive right at the end of the race. Seven minutes, 59 for the chasing uh, Porsche. Eight seconds on the nose, on to the final lap of the race. Eight seconds, is that doable? Not quite sure, but he's not going to give up trying. Give up trying. So through the Mercedes arena, through turn one, through turn two, past the line where some quick dry has been put down. Someone's dropped some fluid there, as they did yesterday. So often the very first few corners get covered in fluid when cars come out of the pits with a bit of overspill. But importantly, another corner ticked off from our race leading on Lamborghini. Just remember that figure, eight seconds on the nose between Pepper leading the race and Van Tor, Lawrence Van Tor chasing Lamborghini ahead of Porsche. But did you see how much clock time there was left as the cars crossed the line? I think it was about seven minutes and 50, 59, maybe. And the thing is... Was it seven Van minutes, 59.689 uh, seconds exactly. to match <laughs> Lawrence Van so, so Pepper in a real quandary now because he can't afford to let up the pace, but you kind of what he'll be wanting to do that to ensure that the race is 20, 20, 28 laps. I was talking that it would be a 27 lap race, but of course we've just done lap 27, so it's going to be 28. But running the risk here of it being 29, and the, the job of Vantor now is to make sure that Pepper really cannot afford to slow down at all. There's eight seconds to play with. If Pepper's canny, he might even choose to break a little bit earlier into Tiergarten on this final lap and then accelerate slightly later than normal just to ensure that the clock is at zero as they cross the line. But I tell you, it's nip and tuck about there being a lap time left as they crossed the line for potentially the penultimate time. But we will wait and see. It will be fabulous, of course, to be treated to an extra lap, not least in SP9 Pro, but also in Cup 2, because Peter Turting and Tobias Muller have literally a car length between them. It's Mulner Motorsport and Black Falcon Team 48, inseparable, as they are now in the second sector. In fact, in the third sector now for this Cup 2 battle. And they are on lap 27, whereas the race leaders in SP9 Pro working lap 28 and just heading into the third sector of the lap. Will it be the final lap? 
I yeah, they'll, then they'll have half a lap plus the final lap for them. They'll be finishing some way back. But the fact they're st uh, just going to be get staying on the lead lap, surely just squeaking onto it. But uh, Jordan Pepper is losing ground to the chasing Lawrence Van Tor, but not by enough. It's a it's a fraction of a section sector section in the first sector. Likewise, in the second, the third sector is much much longer. But where's the traffic going to come? It's going to come at some point, but it's whether you find them on the way into the corner, the way out, or worst of all, right in the middle. Are there going to be another slow zones? At the moment, we've got one yellow flag that's extant, but no slow zones, no code 60s. The yellow flag oh. is at Metzgersfeld, and now we've got a slow zone at Exmuller. That changes literally I, as you I were uttering those time. words. It's a bit like me saying we've uh, had lovely weather this weekend, and certain people out there in the, in the Swiss sphere feel I've condemned next weekend to rain, snow, Cats and dogs, the works. Tobias Muller caught the rear of the Peter Turtin car then as they're heading up the hill through Kesselschen and Klostertal. And there was the merest of taps, front bumper to rear. So Muller, I think, knew what he was doing, but he does not obviously want to make any contact, particularly at that high speed, because I've seen through the years some huge accidents at uh, to Klostertal itself, that left-hander running into Style Schrecker. They're now at the carousel, though. You can't overtake there. And it's a question now of waiting pretty much until you get to the Dottinger Hoare and being close enough through that right-hander at Galgenkopf, working their way through. They are past anything that might be going on at Exmuller. In fact, that's now cleared. Metzgersfeld is in their draft as well. They're at Hoare Act. So the next significant sequence of corners, Eschbach and Brunchen. And it is nothing at all between the top two. Much, much closer for this battle in Cup 2 than it is for SP9 Pro. Although, as I say that, a second and a half caught back by Lawrence Vantor as he continues this chase to the Lamborghini Huracan. They're in the three-minute long, long sector now are the two race leaders. A further 13 seconds back from the rear of Lawrence Van Tor is a bit of a helpless Tim Heinemann, although he's in no danger of waving goodbye to a podium finish for Falcon Motorsports. While well, we're absolutely enthralled with this battle, not just for the lead of the race, but the lead in Cup 2, fighting over 6th and 7th positions, Peter Turting, Turting and Tobias Muller. But just to throw, wind the clock back to almost precisely 24 hours ago, in the opening round, the NLS 1 for 2024, the Cup 2 battle was uh, sorted out at the final corner of the last lap. Four hours and a few minutes on the clock. Contact when the lead had changed on the run along the Dossinger Hoa. Then it was reversed all over again as the new race leader was given a spin around into the tie wall. It did rejoin. The assailant, which was uh, Nico Otto, went through to win but then he was hauled back with a 30 second penalty and ended up third overall. But, you know, you could say you got to try but it wasn't, wasn't the smoothest of attacks down there. Talking smooth though, Jordan Pepper leading this race. He is shedding a second here or there, but he's halfway around this final final lap. Four hours will be on the clock very soon indeed, just over two minutes time. But as Johnny was pointing out, he needs to sort of just be a little bit cautious that he doesn't get there with uh, three hours and 59 minutes and a handful of seconds on the clock. His advantage at the start of the lap was eight seconds. Still, as they twist towards the end of the lap, he doesn't have clear line of sight behind him, but I think only now he might start to see the flash, the green and yellow on the nose of uh, the EMA Mantai Porsche. Lawrence Van Tor pushing, pressing, closing. Talk about pushing and pressing. The battle for Cup 2 is getting closer and closer. Peter Tursey going along the Dottinghoa. Just the track kicks the left. He moves across, takes the apex, but he's got a, a course vehicle. Got past that. He's got two slower BMWs from a junior class and they're trying to go around the outside into the, into the final corner. That's where the Cup 2 class battle was sorted out yesterday they get through but they've got this final lap to go on the clock still has uh, one minute and uh, just over a minute to play for them and then we'll turn our attention to whether it's going to be Jordan Pepper surely in the lead in Lamborghini or the chasing Dries, uh, Lawrence Van Toro fallen over that hurdle for the third time <laughs> now I'm looking out for the clock reading something like 49 48 seconds and where are the leaders are going to be at that point will they have entered the Dottinger Hoor sector they're not there yet, 55, 54 seconds, 52, 
They need to be on the Dottinger Hoare around about now. And, and I think and this, they are. Yeah, they are now, but that's 45 seconds left on the clock. So this must be the final lap, therefore. And Lawrence Van Thor is not going to be close enough. We haven't anywhere close to a 40 second, 45 second final sector all weekend. So that, for me, should ensure the victory for Red Bull team at. They'll be coming into Antonius Bucha for the final time. The gap was eight seconds. It's come down to maybe six and a half no, or so. five. Five, you think? Yeah, okay. the pre previous sector, the, ch the chaser, Lawrence Van Tour, took three and a half seconds out, so it might even be down below that. Down it's three seconds. That now. The Lamborghini has almost stopped going into the final couple of corners. Making sure that this is the end of the race. It has to be. It Cam can. Pepper being told, break early, break early. The clock is at zero. The checkered flag is out, and it's going to be a win for Lamborghini and for the Huracan of Jordan Pepper, although no, hold on. Hang on a minute. The timing screen say the positions have swapped by 42 thousandths of a second. And the advantage of the Manti EMA Porsche will wait. But that flip, oh my God, in breaking and losing about four seconds by breaking heavily to make sure they're the right side of four hours has cost the Lamborghini crew. And Jordan Pepper, we won't have a fourth winner that's not of a German factor, manufacturer since 2015. And I bet Lawrence Van Tor does not know he's won this yet. Oh well, my okay. Words. Well, that's what the timing screen says. It's 42 thousand of a second. I was watching them crossing the line and I was pretty convinced the Lamborghini was ahead. So is that going to be checked again? We've got to make sure, of course, that the line and I suppose the transponders are sitting correctly in the car. Do we have another angle of it? We certainly do. So as Jordan Pepper accelerates out of the final corner, he can't get the power down. And you're quite right. It's the Porsche that jump makes the jump. And from that long shot, we've passed the checkered flag already. The finish line before the start line and Porsche win it. And I'm sure down at to Red Bull, they are still trying to work out precisely what's gone on there. Looking at the, the shot taken from the helicam, it was almost as though he, uh, Jordan Pepper lifted again bef before the line, not realizing just how much more acceleration the, the Porsche had as it chased to the finish. We'll keep an eye on that. We'll also keep an eye on the Cup 2 battle because it's still Peter Turting in 1 2 4 in sixth overall from Tobias Muller. But it's still next to nothing. There's half a car length between them. They've got about a third of a lap to go. This one may also be sorted out at the final quarter. I've never seen something as extraordinary in the run to the finish. Yes, around the course of the lap, there was an eight-second deficit between Lawrence Van Toy in second place and Jordan Pepper leading, heading to victory. The big question, would the Lamborghini driver get across to the finish line before four hours were completed and then have to do another lap? Then he'd have been a sitting duck. However, extraordinary, just was so slow. We thought, car problem, but you were quite right. He's trying to make sure he's the right side well, of the four-hour mark. I, and then he just couldn't get the power down after the final But corner. he didn't need to do it, though. No. Uh, 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 as I say, there were 45 seconds left on the clock as they reached a sector, which normally takes 48 seconds. So he could have been as quick as he likes into Tiergarten and still won the race. I wonder whether there was genuinely a problem with that Lamborghini. Uh, and that's the reason why it wasn't as quick into Tiergarten. It was nowhere near it at Hohen Ride, and he couldn't accelerate coming out of the corner either. Otherwise, why on earth? I mean, Red Bull team act are more clued up than that. They should have been straight on the radio to say, Jordan, you have slowed down enough already, so just hit the final sector as quick as you like, because if you go through and stay in front, this will be the end of the race and you will win. That is very, very peculiar. And apologies for calling the wrong winner over the line uh, we, from the from the long shot. It was we, very difficult to tell yeah, the order the, they finished. The head on shot, you and can then see. even when they came through on the timing screen in that order, I wasn't convinced that was right. You know what? Having seen the replay with the aerial shot, looking it was there was another hesitation just before the line. It was as though it was as though Jordan Pepper thought he'd done enough. And you know, sometimes we had a famous moment in Indianapolis years ago, the two Ferraris trying to get a photo finish and uh, two different lines on the track. And it was the nose of Rubens Barrichello's car that uh, was the one in front. But there was this little hiccup. Yeah. Yes, the Latin slower acceleration didn't get the power down quite as soon as the chasing Porsche. But then there was another little hiccup just at the moment the Porsche went past. Can't wait to uh, listen to the interviews, uh, which will be coming out fairly soon because the cars don't go for a, a further entire lap. They cut around the back of the pits. They do the Grand Prix, half the Grand Prix loop, and then they come in. So they'll be uh, arriving under the control tower fairly soon. Meanwhile, as they say, out on the track, still plenty to pay for in sixth and seventh overall, or more to the point in the order uh, to try and work out the victory in the Cup 2 class for Porsche Cup cars. And it's less than a car length. It is super, super close, but it's still team... Well, it's Mulder Motorsport in front, Black Falcon team 
pressing all the way through the carousel, but it's still searching for Muller. Will it be like that at the end? Rello, meanwhile, the Manti car in the pit lane. Kevin Estra goes out to meet uh, Lawrence Van Tour. Can't wait for Lawrence to take his helmet or to see if he's smiling. Well, he surely would have been told, hey, you did it. Yeah. That 30 seconds you lost with three laps to go. Jordan Pepper again. is smiling as he chats to Lawrence Van Tour. So reasons are now being explained perhaps to him. The Lamborghini got home. It did a lap of the Grand Prix track and then in through the back door to the pit lane. So that maybe eliminates any mechanical dramas. I think there are three possible scenarios here. They've genuinely made a mistake at Team Apt. So they were trying to give real-time information to Jordan Pepper. And for whatever reason, 45 seconds on the clock through a 48-second sector just wasn't enough for them. So they were still telling Jordan to slow down. The other option is potentially radio issues, so they couldn't get the message to Jordan, and he has slowed down too much in an effort to make sure that it was the end of the race, or there was a genuine issue with that Lamborghini, whether it was short-filled. But why would you do that? Because the time in the pit lane is dictated by the regulations, not by how long the nozzle is connected. But it, it just seemed that there was intermittent power, maybe, for the Lamborghini, but then he was braking very, very early for Tiergarten as well. So maybe they just couldn't get the message to him. Radio frequencies are all often fought for, like uh, hotcakes around this place. And also when you dip into the valley and the, and the tree line section, you can't always make a clear radio signal to the driver. But a real mystery that, however, by 42 thousandths of a second, Grello seemed the most surprised uh, of anybody. Lawrence Van Tor and Kevin Esther very, very happy to tick off a win this early on in the NLS season. Cup two still not decided, Bruce Jones, though. No, but you know what? It seemed a futile chase, didn't it? When suddenly th a 30-second swing, instead of the Lamborghini coming out just in front with Jordan Pepper at the wheel and uh, Lawrence Van Tor giving chase, 30 seconds were lost. Suddenly, they weren't in the picture at all chipped away eight seconds gained in one lap and then there was one timing sector i'm beginning to wonder if there was an intermittent problem with the lamborghini but maybe we're simply overthinking this they just were focused on not going under the four hours and then just trying to get the car back up to speed but uh, talk about up to speed 148 is trying to make a move that's uh Tobias Muller trying to go around the outside of Peter Turting the outside is the only line being offered this is what happened yesterday remember and then we had contact into Tiergarten they're going to arrive absolutely together but Tobias Muller has got ahead of Peter Turting at the virtually the final corner they've got Hohenrein still to go and Turting looking to try and accelerate more quickly as Lawrence Vantor just did in the SP9 category and I think we can firmly say this time that the Black Falcon car will outpace the Mulner Motorsport machine despite the full shortening illusion of the camera that turn one that looks all the way back down to the main straight. The timing screen does agree with my reading of this this time around but again it's a gap that starts with a zero point something. 0.282 is the gap between the top two cup two Porsches after four hours and a bit more in fact of action pack racing on the Nordschleife. Done it again. Cup two just does that. Sometimes we have many more in the battle, but it just takes two to tango. And that was a brilliant move. Peter Tursing is not going to be too happy. He said, just here's the outside line. But let's hear from uh, the, the drivers of the winning car. They didn't think they'd be hearing that. It's the Grello Manitoy duo. I think Lawrence is going to speak German, unfortunately for us. Let's just have a little listen anyway. Pick out a few comments. Das sieht fast aus wie ein Skript, aber ja, scheinbar war der Labo nicht, hat nicht genug Benzin, um die extra Runde zu fahren, hat Gas rausgenommen und äh, ich würde sagen, ein Tick zu viel. Was war es einfach bei dir, mehr Schwung aus der letzten Kurve raus, der gereicht Talking hat? Talking about the Lamborghini so nicht not picking up the speed coming out of the final sequence of corners. Um, but it went from a 22 second advantage to all of a sudden 10 seconds because that Code 60 cleared at Foxhole and into, I don't know, Forest, wasn't it? And it, it meant that then the the advantage was firmly it, it still with the Lamborghini, but then that 
disappeared completely on that final lap to the to the to the line, and still a peculiar sequence of events as to why Jordan Pepper needed felt like he needed to slow down to quite that extent. Yeah, coming into the final sequence of corners, he was sitting on an advantage, the race leader in the Lamborghini, Jordan Pepper, between around three three and a half seconds, enough to defend. We will find out because that car, of course, came home in second place by yes, I've got to say it again, forty-two thousandths of a second. But it is smiles all around for Lawrence Van Tor, Kevin Estra, smiling, laughing, and uh, you know, sometimes you just keep on pushing when you suddenly get a reward. The fact they got it in the final 400 meters is just quite extraordinary and got that nose in front, well, in the final meter or two. So let's go and find out from the Abt Racing Crew. Ah, yes. Back of their heads, they're going to have a story to tell. Indeed, so let's catch up with uh, their viewpoint. No, I think we just thought the race was going to be a bit shorter than it was, really. Um, just a misjudgment, and unfortunately we couldn't do another lap, so I had to manage it to the line. I think we obviously calculated a little bit too much margin, and Lawrence got ahead, so he had to run out the last corner, there was nothing I could do, and yeah, well done to them, just uh, a big mistake on our behalf. Would you have been out of fuel on an extra lap? I don't know, I haven't spoken to my engineer yet, but uh, considering how urgent it was for us to not do an extra lap, I can imagine so. Also der Hintergrund sehr wahrscheinlich wie vermutet der äh, die Spritmenge, dass es wohl für keine extra Runde gereicht hat. Kelvin, hast du dazu schon eine weitere Info für uns? Uh, it's leider genau die gleiche Aussage. Also unser fällt uh, einfach die die extra Runde. Well, und so either they couldn't get the message Sekunden. to Jordan Pepper at the, uh, the far end of the Dottinger Hoor, but that for me is the easy bit. If you're onto the Dottinger Hoor with less than 48 seconds on the clock, which he was by three seconds, you're home and dry, and all you got to do is attack like you would on a qualifying lap and assuming they've still got enough fuel on but I mean I don't know how marginal it was it sounds like it was almost marginal to get to the end of the 28th lap let alone the 29th yeah but let's just do this uh, that, that the final pit stop for the Lamborghini was after 23 laps we've just completed 28 so only a five five lap run final pit stop was a lap earlier for the Manta EMA car you know uh, yeah but they, you do things that's how they gained all, all the time I think the point was that even though it's a time timed pit stop, they maybe only put six laps worth of fuel in to gain on the weight. Put less fuel in, the car's lighter, it should be quicker on the lap time. Maybe. It's a dangerous game to play uh, because, I mean, we talked about this many times over the years at the 24 hours, you have to anticipate that extra lap, otherwise you really Caught are going to compromise term. you know the result of, of a very very important race uh, tim heineman who was the difference in the number four car compared to yesterday will obviously speak to lucas in german but we will hopefully be able to catch up with joel erickson after this who will speak english to lucas gajewski our pit lane reporter one of two in fact today that is very peculiar indeed jordan pepper although he was smiling to the grello chaps absolutely gutted with that result because we were might have been treated to the first non-German manufacturer winning since 2021 and in fact 42 thousandths of a second says that Lamborghini finished second behind the Manti EMA car which weirdly had stopped a lap earlier of course but seemed to have a bit more fuel I mean we assume that the Manti car could have done an extra lap if necessary. The point was, though, it was it had the road position to pressurise the Lamborghini. Let's grab a word with Joel Eriksson then at the end. Third place for this car and this team. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we always have to win a podium, and obviously we won a bit more in the race. Um, but yeah, we had to go shorter on the first stint, and then we, were, we had to wait a bit longer in the in the pit stop. So yeah, I lost quite some time there. But um, but anyways, we're here to test and uh, to develop the tyre and the car, and this is what we achieved in the end. So have a very strong car. The car feels great, the tyre feels great, and the team executed a clean race, a clean strategy for us today again. So um, yeah, head off to the team and to to the team as well for executing a clean race. Uh, and yeah, the pace was good and the car felt amazing once again. So um, obviously very happy to be in the podium, but would have been yeah one or two standing in the middle of the <laughs> middle of the end of pit lane. So um, but yeah, it's a good day. It's a good day. Next time, thank you very much. Thank you.
Also, das sind Joel Eriksson as part of the Falcon Motorsports crew chatting to Lukas Gajewski. They finish again with one of their cars on the podium. The other one, the number three, which looked again uh, a mean bit of kit this weekend with both Martin Raginger and Alessio Picariello, had bad luck once more for two days in a row now, Bruce. It really did. You know, Falcon Motorsports have the, uh, a great advantage in having two cars, but both of the cars have been competitive on both the days. Today, it was definitely the turn of number three, but it was taken away from them. But you know, this is going to live long in my memory, just the way we had that run to the finish. You know, just as you think, oh, well, we've been denied a two-car run to the finish. In fact, it should have been a three-car run to the finish because the number three Porsche would have been there. It got removed, went down to two cars, and then we had the ultimate surprise, the one that had it in the bag, lost out today. No Lamborghini victory, but uh, for Manti EMA, they've won before their win again. And at the end, it was Lawrence Van Tour in front by next to nothing. All about qualifying next weekend for the Nürburgring 24-hour race at the end of May, start of June. Full coverage, of course, on the Radio Show Limited network of channels. My thanks to Lucas Gajewski in the pits, to Bruce Jones from Johnny Palmer. We'll see you next weekend for the qualification race here from the Nordschleife. Bye for now.